Hawser was aware of Webslin sitting on the seat beside him, his eyes locked onto the view ahead, his legs drawn up as far as possible so that his knees stuck up above the edge of the console and his arms locked in a sort of square over his head, each hand grasping the biceps of the other arm. His face was a mask of fear and incredulity when Hawser turned round to glance at him and grinned. Wubslin pointed frenziedly at the main screen. Watch! He screeched over the racket. The cat was shaking and bouncing, rocked by the stream of superheated matter pouring from under its hull. It would be using the atmosphere around it to produce plasma now that there was air available, and in the relatively confined space of the small bays, the turbulence created was enough to shake the vessel bodily. There was another wall ahead, coming up faster than Hawser would have liked. They were slewing slightly again as well. He narrowed the laser angle again and fired, pulling the ship round at the same time. The wall flashed once around its edges. The roof and floor of the small bay flashed in loops of flame where the laser caught them, and dozens of parked shuttles ahead of them pulsed with light and heat. The wall ahead started to fall slowly back, but the cat was coming up on it faster than it was crumpling. Hawser gasped and tried to pull back. He heard Wubslin howl as the vessel's nose hit the undamaged centre of the wall. The view on the main screen tilted as the ship rammed into the wall material. Then the nose came down, the clear air turbulence quivered like an animal shaking water from its fur, and they were rocking and yawing into yet another small bay. It was totally empty. Hawser gunned the engines a little more, took a couple of bursts with the laser at the next wall, then watched in amazement as this wall, instead of falling back like the last one, crashed down toward them like a vast castle drawbridge slamming in one fiery piece onto the deck of the empty small bay. In a fury of steam and gas, a mountain of water appeared over the top of the collapsing wall and poured out in a huge wave toward the approaching ship. Hawser heard himself shouting. He rammed the motor controls full on and kept the laser fire button hard down. The cat leapt forward. It flashed over the surface of the cascading water, enough of the plasma heat smashing into its liquid surface to instantly fill all the space of small bays its passage had created with a boiling fog of steam. As the tide of water continued to pour from the flooded small bay and the cat screeched above it, the air about the ship filled with superheated steam. The external pressure gauge went up too quickly for the eye to follow. The laser blasted even more vapour off the water in front, and with an explosion like the end of the world, the next wall blew out ahead of the vessel, weakened by the laser and finally blasted away by the sheer pressure of steam. The clear air turbulence shot out from the tunnel of linked small bays like a bullet from a gun. Motors flaming in the middle of a cloud of gas and steam which it quickly outdistanced, it roared into a canyon of air-filled space between towering walls of bay doors and opened accommodation sections, lighting up kilometres of wall and cloud, screaming with its three flamed filled throats and seemingly pulling after it a tidal wave of water and a volcano-like cloud of steam, gas and smoke. The water fell, turning from a solid wave into something like heavy surf, then spray, then just rain and water vapour, following the huge flapping card of the bay door, tumbling through the air. The cat wrenched itself round, twisting and slewing through the air in an attempt to check its headlong rush toward the far wall of small bay doors facing it across that vast internal canyon. Then its motors flickered and went out. The clear air turbulence started to fall. Hawser gunned the controls, but the fusion motors were dead. The screen showed the wall of doors to the other bays on one side, then air and clouds, then the wall of bay doors on the other side. They were in a spin. Hawser looked over at Wubslin as he fought with the controls. The engineer was staring at the main screen with a glazed expression on his face. Wubslin! Hawser screamed. The fusion motors stayed dead. Ah! Wubslin seemed to have woken up to the fact that they were falling out of control. He leapt at the controls in front of him. Just fly it, he shouted. I'll try the primers. Must have overpressured the motors. Hawser wrestled with the controls while Wubslin tried to restart the engines. On the screen, walls spun crazily about them and clouds beneath them were coming up fast. Beneath them, really beneath them, a dead flat layer of clouds. Hawser shook the controls again. The nose motor burst into life, guttering wildly, sending the spinning craft careering off toward one side of the artificial cliff of bay doors and walls. Hawser cut the motor out. He steered into the spin, using the craft's control surfaces rather than the motors. Then he aimed the whole ship straight down and put his fingers on the laser buttons again. The clouds flashed up to meet the vessel. 
he closed his eyes and squeezed the laser controls. The ends of invention was so huge it was built on three almost totally separate levels, each over three kilometres deep. They were pressure levels. There, because otherwise the differential between the very bottom and the very top of the giant ship would have been the difference between standard sea level and a mountain top somewhere in the tropopause. As it was, there existed a three and a half thousand metre difference between the base and roof of each pressure level, making sudden journeys by travel tube from one to the other inadvisable. In the immense open cave that was the hollow centre of the GSV, the pressure levels were marked by force fields, not anything material, so that craft could pass from one level to another without having to go outside the vessel, and it was toward one of those boundaries, marked by cloud, that the clear air turbulence was falling. Firing the laser did no good whatsoever, though Hauser didn't know that at the time. It was a Vavach computer which had taken over the internal monitoring and control from the culture's own mines, which opened a hole in the force field to let the falling vessel through. It did so in the mistaken assumption that less damage would be caused to the ends of invention by letting the rogue vessel fall through than having it impact. In the centre of a sudden maelstrom of air and cloud, in its own small hurricane, the cat burst through from the thick air at the bottom of one pressure level and into the thin atmosphere at the top of the one below. A vortex of rag-cladded air blew out after it like an inverted explosion. Hauser opened his eyes again and saw with relief the distant floor of the GSV's cavernous interior and the climbing figures on the main fusion motor's monitor screens. He hit the engine throttles again, this time leaving the nose motor alone. The two main engines caught, shoving Hauser back in his seat against the cloying hold of the restrainer fields. He pulled the nose of the diving craft up, watching the floor far below gradually disappear from view, as it was replaced by the sight of another wall of opened bay doors. The doors were much larger than those of the small bays in the level they had just left, and the few craft Hauser could see, either nosing into or appearing out of the lit lengths of the huge hangars, were full-size starships. Hauser watched the screen, piloting the clear air turbulence exactly like an aircraft. They were travelling quickly along a vast corridor over a kilometre across, with a layer of clouds about 1,500 metres above them. Starships were moving slowly through the same space, a few on their own AG fields, most towed by light lifter tugs. Everything else was moving slowly and without a fuss. Only the cat disturbed the calm of the giant ship's interior, screaming through the air on twin swords of brilliant flame, pulsing from white-hot plasma chambers. Another cliff face of huge hangar doors faced them. Hauser looked about him at the curve of main screen and pulled the cat over on a long banking left turn, diving a little at the same time to head down an even broader canyon of space. They flashed over a slow-moving clipper being towed toward a distant open main bay, rocking the starship in their wake of superheated air. The wall of doors and opened entrances slanted toward them as Hauser tightened the turn. Ahead, Hauser could see what looked like a cloud of insects, hundreds of tiny black specks floating in the air. Far beyond them, maybe five or six kilometres away, a thousand metres square of blackness, bordered with a slowly flashing strip of subdued white light, was the exit from the ends of invention. It was a straight run. Hauser sighed and felt his whole body relax. Unless they were intercepted, they had done it. With a little luck now, they might even get away from the orbital itself. He gunned the engines, heading for the inky square in the distance. Wopslin suddenly sat forward against the pull of acceleration and punched some buttons. His repeater screen set in the console magnified the centre section of the main screen, showing the view ahead. They're people! he shouted. Hauser frowned over at the man. What? People! Those are people! They must be in AG harnesses! We're going to go straight through them! Hauser looked briefly over at Wobslin's repeater screen. It was true. The black cloud which almost filled the screen was made up of humans flying slowly about in suits or ordinary clothes. There were thousands of them, Hauser saw, less than a kilometre ahead and closing quickly. Wubslin was staring at the screen, waving his hand at the people. Get out of the way! Get out of the way! He was shouting. Hauser couldn't see a way round, over or beneath the mass of flying people. Whether they were playing some curious mass aerial game or were just enjoying themselves, there were too many, too close, too widespread. Shit, Hauser said. He got ready to cut the rear plasma motors before the clear air turbulence went into the cloud of humans. With luck, they might make it through before they had to relight them and so not incinerate too many people. No! Wubslin screamed. 
He threw the restraining straps off, leapt across toward Horza, and dived at the controls. Horza tried to fend the bulky engineer off, but failed. The controls were wrenched from his hands, and the view on the main screen tipped and swirled, pointing the nose of the speeding ship away from the black square of the GSV exit, away from the huge cloud of airborne people, and toward the cliff of brightly lit main bay entrances. Horza clouted Wubslin across the head with his arm, sending the man falling to the floor, stunned. He grabbed the controls back from the relaxing fingers of the engineer, but it was too late to turn away. Horza steadied and aimed. The clear air turbulence darted for an open main bay. It flashed through the open entrance and swept over the skeleton of a starship being rebuilt in the bay, the light from the cat's motors starting fires, singeing hair, smouldering clothes and blinding unprotected eyes. Horza saw Wubslin lying unconscious on the floor out of the corner of his eye, rocking gently as the cat careered through the half-kilometre length of main bay. The doors to the next bay were open, and the next, and the next. They were flying through a two-kilometre tunnel, racing over the repair and docking facilities of one of Evenouth's displaced shipbuilders. Horza didn't know what was at the far end, but he could see that before they got there, they would have to fly over the top of a large spaceship which almost filled the third bay along. Horza vectored the fusion fire ahead so that they started to slow. Twin beams of fire flashed on either side of the main screen as the fusion power kicked forward. Wubslin's unrestrained body slid forward on the floor of the bridge, wedging under the console and his own seat. Horza lifted the cat's nose as the blunt snout of the parked spacecraft sitting in the bay ahead approached. The clear air turbulence zoomed toward the ceiling of the main bay, flashed between it and the top surface of the ship, then fell on the other side, and, although still slowing, shot through the final main bay and into another corridor of free airspace. It was too narrow. Horza dived the craft again, saw the floor coming up and fired the lasers. The cat burst through a rising cloud of glowing wreckage, bumping and shaking. Wubslin's squat frame sliding out from under the console and floating back up toward the rear door of the bridge. At first, Horza thought they were out at last, but they weren't. They were in what the culture called a general bay. The cat fell once more, then levelled out again. It was in a space that seemed even larger than the main interior of the GSV. It was flying through the bay they had stored the megaship in, the same megaship Horza had seen on the screen earlier being lifted out of the water by a hundred or so ancient culture lifter craft. Horza had time to look around. There was plenty of space, lots of room and time. The megaship lay on the floor of the giant bay, looking for all the world like a small city, sitting on a great slab of metal. The clear air turbulence flew past the stern of the megaship, past tunnels full of propeller blades, tens of metres across, round the side of its rearmost outrigger, where beached pleasure craft waited for a return to water, over the towers and spires of its superstructure, then out over its bows. Horza looked forward. The doors, if they were doors, of the general bay faced him two kilometres away. They were that same distance from top to bottom, and twice that across. Horza shrugged and checked the laser again. He was becoming, he realised, almost blasé about the whole thing. What the hell, he thought. The lasers picked a hole in the wall of material ahead, punching a slowly widening gap which Horza aimed straight for. A vortex of swirling air was starting to form around the hole as the cat rushed closer. It was caught in a small horizontal cyclone of air and started to twist. Then it was through and in space. In a quickly dispersing bubble of air and crystals of ice, the craft burst from the body of the General Systems vehicle, swooping into vacuum and star-washed darkness at last. Behind it, a force field slammed across the hole its passage had created in the doors of the General Bay. Horza felt the plasma motors stutter as their supply of outside air disappeared. Then the internal tanks took up the slack. He was about to cut them and slide gently into the start-up procedure of the craft's warp engines when the speakers in his headrest crackled. This is Evenouth Port Police. All right, you son of a bitch. Just keep on that heading and slow right down. Evenouth Port Police to Rogue Craft. Halt on that heading. Uh... Horza pulled on the controls, taking the cat on a huge accelerating arc up over the stern of the GSV, flashing past the outside of the kilometer square exit he'd been heading for earlier. Wubslin, moaning now, bumped around the inside of the bridge as the cat lifted its nose to head straight up toward the maze of abandoned docks and gantries that was Evenouth Port. As it went, 
It turned, still twisting slightly from the spin it had picked up from the vortex of air, bursting from the general bay. Hawser let it twist, steadying it only as they approached the top of the loop, the port facilities coming up fast, then sliding underneath as the craft leveled out. Rogue ship, this is your last warning, the speakers blared. Stop now or we'll blow you out of the sky. God, he's heading for... The transmission cut off. Hawser grinned to himself. He was indeed heading for the gap between the underside of the port and the top of the GSV. The clear air turbulence flashed through spaces between travel tube connections, elevator shafts, graving dock gantries, transit areas, arriving shuttlecraft and crane towers. Hawser guided the ship through the maze with the fusion motors still blazing at maximum boost, throwing the small craft through the few hundred metres of crowded space between the orbital and the general systems vehicle. The rear radar pinged, picking up following echoes. Two towers, hanging under the orbital like upside-down skyscrapers between which Hawser was aiming the cat, suddenly blossomed with light, scattering wreckage. Hawser cringed in his seat as he corkscrewed the ship into the space between the two clouds of debris. Those were across the bows, crackled the speakers again. The next ones will be straight up your ass, boy racer. The cat shot out over the dull grey plane of slanting material that was the start of the end's nose. Hawser turned the cat over and dived down, following the slope of the vast craft's bows. The rear radar signal stopped briefly, then reappeared. He flipped the ship over again. Wubslin, his arms and legs waving weakly, was dumped onto the cat's bridge ceiling and stuck there like a fly, while Hawser did a section of an outside loop. The ship was racing, powering away from the orbital port area and the big GSV heading for space. Hawser remembered about Balveda's gear and quickly reached over to the console, closing the vac tube circuit from there. A screen showed that all the vac tubes had been rotated. The rear screen showed something flame inside the twin plumes of plasma fire. The rear radar pinged insistently. Goodbye, stupid, the voice in the headdress speakers said. Hawser threw the ship to one side. The rear screen went white, then black. The main screen pulsated with colours and broken lines. The speakers in Hawser's helmet, as well as the speakers set into the seat, howled. Every instrument on the console flashed and wavered. Hawser thought for a second they had been hit. But the motors were still blasting. The main screen was starting to clear, and the other instruments were recovering too. The radiation meters were bleeping and flashing. The rear screen stayed blank. A damage monitor indicated that the sensors had been knocked out by a very strong pulse of radiation. Hawser started to realize what had happened when the rear radar didn't start pinging again after it recovered. He threw back his head and laughed. There had indeed been a bomb in Balveda's kit bag. Whether it had gone off because it was caught in the cat's plasma exhaust or because somebody, whoever had been trying to keep the ship on board the GSV in the first place, had detonated it remotely the instant the fleeing craft was far enough away from the ends not to cause too much damage, Hawser didn't know. Whatever, the explosion seemed to have caught the pursuing police vessels. Laughing uproariously, Hawser angled the cat further away from the great circle of brilliantly lit orbital, heading straight out toward the stars and readying the warp engines to take over from the plasma motors. Wubslin, back on the deck, one leg caught on the arm of his own chair, moaned distantly. Mother, he said, mother, say it's only a dream. Hawser laughed louder. You lunatic! breathed Yelson, shaking her head. Her eyes were wide. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen you do. You're mad, Cricklin. I'm leaving. I resign as of now. Shit. I wish I'd gone with Jandrilla Jelly to Galsall. You can just drop me off first place we get to. Hawser sat down wearily in the seat at the head of the mess room table. Yelson was at the far end, under the screen which was switched into the bridge main screen. The cat was proceeding under full warp two hours out on its journey from Vavach. There had been no further pursuit following the destruction of the police craft, and now the cat was gradually coming round to the course Hawser had set, into the war zone, toward the edge of the glitter cliff, toward Shah's world. Dorolo and Avager were sitting, plainly still shaken to one side of Yalsen. The woman and the elderly man were both staring at Hawser as though he was pointing a gun at them. Their mouths were open, their eyes were glazed. On the other side of Yelson, the slack form of Peristek Balveda was leaning forward, head down, 
her body pulling against the restraining straps of the seat. The mess room was chaotic. The cat hadn't been readied for violent manoeuvring, and nothing had been stowed away. Plates and containers, a couple of shoes, a glove, some half-unraveled tapes and spools and various other bits and pieces now lay strewn about the floor of the mess. Yalson had been hit by something, and a small trickle of blood had dried on her forehead. Horza hadn't let anybody move, apart from brief visits to the heads for the last two hours. He told everybody to stay where they were over the ship PA, while the cat headed away from Vavach on a twisting, erratic course. He'd kept the plasma motors and laser warm and ready, but no further pursuit came. Now he reckoned they were safe and far enough away to warp straight. He had left Wubslin on the bridge, nursing the battered and abused systems of the clear air turbulence as best he could. The engineer had apologised for grabbing at the controls and had become very subdued, not meeting Hawser's eyes, but tidying up one or two bits of loose debris on the bridge and stuffing some of the loose wires back under the console. Hawser told Wubslin he had nearly killed them all, but on the other hand so had he, so they would forget it this time. They'd escaped intact. Wubslin nodded and said he didn't know how. He couldn't believe the ship was virtually undamaged. Wubslin wasn't undamaged. He had bruises everywhere. I'm afraid, Horder said to Yalson once he had sat down and put his feet up. Our first port of call is rather bleak and underpopulated. I'm not sure you'll want to be dropped off there. Yalson put the heavy stun pistol down onto the table surface. And just where the hell are we going? What's going on, Cricklin? What was all that craziness back on the GSV? What's she doing here? Why is the culture involved? Yalson nodded at Balveda during this speech, and Horza kept looking at the unconscious culture agent when Yalson stopped, waiting for an answer. Avager and Durolo were looking at him expectantly too. Before Horza could answer, the small drone appeared from the corridor leading from the accommodation section. It floated in, looked round the mess room, then sat itself bodily on the table in the middle. Did I hear something about it being explanation time? It said. It was facing Horza. Horza looked away from Balveda to Avija and Dorolo, then to Yalson and the drone. Well, you might as well all know that we are now heading for a place called Shah's World. It's a planet of the dead. Yalson looked puzzled. Avija said, I've heard of those, but we won't be allowed in. This is getting worse, the drone said. If I were you, Captain Cricklin, I would turn back to the ends of invention and surrender yourself there. I'm sure you'd get a fair trial. Horza ignored the machine. He sighed, looking round at the mess, stretched his legs and yawned. I'm sorry you're all being taken, perhaps against your will, but I've got to go there, and I can't afford to stop anywhere to let you off. You've all got to come. Oh, we do, do we? said the small drone. Yes, Horza said, looking at it. I'm afraid so. But we won't be able to get anywhere near this place, Avager protested. They don't let anybody in. There's some sort of zone around them they don't let people into. We'll see about that when we get there. Horza smiled. You're not answering my questions, Yalson said. She looked at Balveda again, then down at the gun lying on the table. I've been zapping this poor bitch every time she flicks an eyelid, and I want to know why I've been doing it. It'll take a while to explain it all, but what it boils down to is there's something on Shah's world which both the culture and the Adirans want. I have a contract, a commission from the Adirans to get there and find this thing. You really are a paranoid, the drone said incredulously. It rose off the table and turned round to look at the others. He really is a lunatic. The Adirans are hiring us, you, to go after something? Yalson's voice was full of disbelief. Horza looked at her and smiled. You mean this woman, Dorolo said, pointing at Balveda was sent by the culture to join us, infiltrate. Are you serious? I'm serious. Balveda was looking for me. Also for Horza Gobachul. She wanted to get to Shah's world or to stop us from getting there. Horza looked at Avager. There was a bomb in among her gear, by the way. It went off just after I rotated it out of the tubes. It blew the police ships away. We all got a blast of radiation, but nothing lethal. And what about Horza? Yasen said looking grimly at him. Was that just some trick, or did you really meet him? He is alive, Yelson, and as safe as any of us. 
Whoopslin appeared through the door from the bridge, still with an apologetic look on his face. He nodded at Hawser and sat down nearby. All looking fine, Cracklin. Good, Hawser said. I was just explaining to everybody else about our journey to Shah's world. Oh, Whoopslin said. Yeah. He shrugged at the others. Cracklin, Yalson said, leaning forward on the table and looking intently at Hawser. You just about got us all killed fuck knows how many times back there. You probably did kill quite a few people during those indoor aerobatics. You've saddled us with some secret agent from the culture. You're practically kidnapping us to take us toward a planet in the middle of a war zone where nobody's even allowed in to look for something both sides want enough to... <laughs> well, if the Adirans are hiring a decimated bunch of second-rate mercenaries, they must be pretty desperate. And if the culture really was behind the attempt to keep us in that bay, they must be scared stiff to risk violating the neutrality of the ends and breaking some of their precious rules of war. You may think you know what's going on and think the risk is worth it, but I don't. And I don't like this feeling of being kept in the dark at all, either. Your track record recently has been crap. Let's face it, risk your own life if you want to, but you don't have any right to risk ours, too, not any more. Maybe we don't all want to side with the Adirans, but even if we did prefer them to the culture, none of us signed up to start fighting in the middle of the war. Shit, Cricklin. We're neither equipped nor trained well enough to go up against those guys. I know all that, Hosa said. But we shouldn't be encountering any battle forces. The quiet barrier around Shah's world extends far enough out so that it's impossible to watch it all. We go in from a randomly picked direction. By the time we're spotted, there's nothing anybody can do about it no matter what sort of ship they have. A main battle fleet couldn't keep us out. When we leave, it will be the same. What you're trying to say is, Yalson said, sitting back in her seat, easy in, easy out. Maybe I am, laughed Horsa. Hey, Whoopslin said suddenly, looking at his terminal screen, which he had just taken from his pocket. It's nearly time. He got up and disappeared through the doors leading to the bridge. In a few seconds, the screen in the mess changed, the view swivelling round until it showed Vavach. The great orbital hung in space, dark and brilliant, full of night and day, blue and white and black. They all looked up at the screen. Wubslin came back in and sat in his seat again. Hauser felt tired. His body wanted rest and lots of it. His brain was still buzzing from the concentration and the amount of adrenaline it had required to pilot the cat through and out of the ends of invention. But he couldn't rest yet. He couldn't decide what was the best thing to do. Should he tell them who he was? Tell them the truth, that he was a changer, that he had killed Kraiklin? How loyal were any of them to the leader they didn't yet know was dead? Yalson, the most, perhaps. But surely she would be glad to know that he was alive. Yet she was the one who had said that perhaps they weren't all on the Adirans' side. She had never shown any sympathy for the culture before when he had known her, but perhaps she had changed her mind. He could even change back. There was a fairly long journey now, during which it shouldn't be beyond him, perhaps with the help of Wubslin, to change the fidelities in the cat's computer. But should he tell them? Should he let them know? And Balveda? What was he going to do with her? He had had some idea of using her to bargain with the culture, but it looked as though they'd escaped now, and next stop was Shah's world, where she would at best be a liability. He ought to kill her now, but he knew, first of all, that that might not go down well with the others, especially Yalson. He also knew, although he didn't like to admit it, that he would find it personally painful to kill the culture agent. They were enemies, they had both been very close to death, and the other had done little or nothing to intervene, but actually, to kill her would be very difficult. Or maybe he only wanted to pretend that he would find it very difficult. Maybe it would be no bother at all, and the sort of bogus camaraderie of doing the same job, though on different sides, was just that, a fake. He opened his mouth to ask Yalson to stun the culture agent again. Now, Wubslin said. With that, Vavach Orbital started to disintegrate. The view of it, on the messroom screen, was a compensated hyperspace version, so that, although they were already outside the Vavach system, they were watching it virtually in real time. Right at the appointed hour, the unseen, unnamed, 
very much still militarized General Systems vehicle, which was somewhere in the vicinity of the Vavach planetary system, started its bombardment. It was almost certainly an ocean-class GSV, the same one which had sent the message that they'd all watched some days ago on the mess screen, heading in toward Vavach. That would make the Warcraft very much smaller than the behemoth of the Ends of Invention, which was, for war purposes, obsolete. One ocean class could fit inside either of the end's general bays, but while the larger craft, by that time an hour out from the orbital, was full of people, the ocean class would be packed with other warships and weaponry. Gridfire struck the orbital. Horsa paused and watched the screen as it lit up suddenly, flashing once over its whole surface until the sensors coped with a sudden increase in brilliance and compensated. For some reason, Horsa had thought the culture would just splash the grid fire all over the massive orbital and then spatter the remains with cam. But they didn't do that. Instead, a single narrow line of blinding white light appeared right across the breadth of the day side of the orbital. A thin, fiery blade of silent destruction which was instantly surrounded by the duller but still perfectly white cover of clouds. That line of light was part of the grid itself the fabric of pure energy which lay underneath the entire universe, separating this one from the slightly younger, slightly smaller antimatter universe beneath. The culture, like the Adirans, could now partially control that awesome power, at least sufficiently to use it for the purposes of destruction. A line of that energy, plucked from nowhere and sliced across the face of the three-dimensional universe, was down there, on and inside the orbital, boiling the circle sea, melting the two thousand kilometres of transparent wall, annihilating the base material itself, straight across its thirty-five thousand kilometre breadth. Vavach, that fourteen million kilometre hoop, was starting to uncoil. A chain, it had been cut. There was nothing left now to hold it together. Its own spin, the source of both its day-night cycle and its artificial gravity, was now the very force tearing it all apart. At about 130 kilometres per second, Vavach was throwing itself into outer space, unwinding like a released spring. The livid line of fire appeared again, and again and again, working its way methodically round the orbital from where the original burst had struck, neatly parceling the entire orbital into squares, 35,000 kilometres to a side, each containing a sandwich of trillions upon trillions of tonnes of ultra-dense base material, water, land and air. Vavach was turning white. First, the grid fire seared the water into a border of clouds, then the outrushing air, spilling from each immense flat square like heavy fumes off a table, turned its load of water vapour to ice. The ocean itself, no longer held by the spin force, was shifting, spilling with infinite slowness over one edge of every plate of ruptured base material, becoming ice and swirling away into space. The precise, brilliant line of fire marched on, going back in reverse spin direction, neatly dissecting the still-curved, still-spinning sections of the orbital with its sudden, lethal flashes of light, light from outside the normal fabric of reality. Horsa remembered what Jandra Lajelli had called it, back when Lenipobra had been enthusing about the destruction. The weaponry of the end of the universe, the Mondladitian had said. Horsa watched the screen and knew what the man had meant. It was all going. All of it. The wreck of the Olmadrecker, the tabula berg it had collided with, the wreck of the cat's shuttle, Mip's body, Lenny Pobra's, whatever was left of Fuisong's corpse, Mr. First's, the living bodies of the other eaters, if they hadn't been rescued or had still refused, the damage game arena, the docks and Kraiklin's dead body, the hovercraft, animals and fishes, birds, germs, all of it, everything flash-burned or flash-frozen, suddenly weightless, spinning into space, going, dying. The relentless line of fire completed its circuit of the orbital, back almost to where it had started. The orbital was now a rosette of white flat squares, backing slowly away from each other toward the stars. Four hundred separate slabs of quickly freezing water, silt, land and base material, angling out above or underneath the plane of the system's planets like flat square worlds themselves. There was a moment of grace then, as Vavet died in solitary blazing splendour. Then, at its dark centre, another blazing star patch rose, bursting white 
as the hub was struck with the same terrible energy which had smashed the world itself. Like a target, then, Vavach blazed. Just as Horza thought that the culture would be content with that, the screen lit up once more. Every one of those flat cards on the hub of the exploded orbital blazed once, with an icy, sparkling brilliance, as though a million tiny white stars were shining through each shattered piece. The light faded, and those four hundred expanses of flat worlds with their centre hub were gone, replaced by a grid of diced shapes, each exploding away from the others, as well as from the rest of the disintegrating orbital. Those pieces flashed too, bursting slowly with a billion pinpricks of light, which, when they faded, left debris almost too small to make out. Vavach was now a swollen and spiralled disk of flashing, glittering splinters, expanding very slowly against the distant stars like a ring of bright dust. The glinting, sparkling centre made it look like some huge, lidless and unblinking eye. The screen flashed one final time. No single points of light could be made out this time. It was as though the whole now vague but bloated image of the shattered circular world glowed with some internal heat, making a torus-shaped cloud out of it, a halo of white light with a fading iris at its centre. Then the show was over, and only the sun lit up the slowly blooming nimbus of the annihilated world. On other wavelengths there would probably be a lot still to see, but the mess room screen was on normal light. Only the mines, only the starships, would see the whole destruction perfectly. Only they would be able to appreciate it for all that it had to offer. Of the entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum, the unaided human eye could see little more than one percent, a single octave of radiation out of an immense long keyboard of tones. The sensors on a starship would see everything, right across that spectrum, in far greater detail and at a much slower apparent speed. The whole display that was the orbital's destruction was, for all its humanly perceivable grandeur, quite wasted on the animal eye. A spectacle for the machines, thought Horza. That was all it was. A sideshow for the damn machines. Chysel, Dorolo said. Wubslin exhaled loudly and shook his head. Yalson turned and looked at Horza. Avager stayed with his head turned to the screen. Amazing what one can accomplish when one puts one's mind to it, eh, Horza? At first, stupidly, he thought that Yalson had said it. But of course, it was Balveda. She brought her head up slowly. Her deep, dark eyes were open. She looked groggy, and her body still sagged against the webbing of the seat straps. The voice had been clear and steady, though. Horza saw Yalson reaching for the stun gun on the table. She reached out and brought the gun closer to her, but left it lying on the table. She was looking suspiciously at the culture agent. Avager and Dorolo and Wubslin were staring at her too. Are the batteries on that stun gun running down? Wubslin said. Yalson was still looking at Balveda, her eyes narrowed. You're a little confused, Gravant, or whoever you are, Yalson said. That's Kraiklin. Balveda smiled at Horza. He left his face blank. He didn't know what to do. He was exhausted, worn out. It was too much of an effort. Let what was going to happen happen. He'd had enough of deciding. Well, Balveda said to him, are you going to tell them or shall I? He said nothing. He watched Balveda's face. The woman drew a deep breath and said, Oh, all right, I'll tell them. She turned to Yalson. His name is Bora Horza Gobachul, and he's impersonating Kraiklin. Horza's a changer from Haybor, and he works for the Adirans, has done for the last six years. He's changed to become Kraiklin. I imagine your real leader is dead. Horza probably killed him, or at least left him somewhere in or around Evenouth. I'm very sorry. She looked around the others, including the small drone. But unless I'm much mistaken, we're all taking a little trip to a place called Shah's World. Well, you are, anyway. I have a feeling my own journey might be a little shorter, and infinitely longer. Balveda smiled ironically at Horza. Two, the drone on the table said to nobody in particular. I'm stuck in a leaky museum piece with two paranoid lunatics. 
You're not, Yasin was saying, ignoring the machine and gazing at Hosa. You're not, are you? She's lying. Wubslin turned and looked at him. Avager and Dorolo exchanged glances. Hosa sighed and took his feet off the table, sitting a little straighter in his seat. He leaned forward and put his elbows on the table, his chin in his hands. He was watching, feeling, trying to gauge the mood of the various people in the room. He was aware of their distances, the tension in their bodies, and how much time he would need to get to the plasma pistol on his right hip. He raised his head and looked at all of them, settling his gaze on Yalsen. Yes, he said, I am. Silence filled the mess room. Hawser waited for a reaction. Instead, the sound of a door opening came from down the corridor through the accommodation section. They all looked at the doorway. Nysin appeared, wearing only a pair of grubby, stained shorts. His hair was sticking out in every direction, his eyes were slits, his skin was patchy with dry and moist areas, and his face was very pale. A smell of drink gradually worked its way through the mess. He looked round the room, yawned, nodded at them, pointed vaguely at some of the still unclear debris lying around and said, This place is nearly in as big a mess as my cabin. You'd think we'd been manoeuvring or something. Sorry, thought it was time to eat. Think I'll go back to bed. He yawned again and left. The door closed. Balveda was laughing quietly. Horza could see some tears in her eyes. The others just looked confused. The drone said, Well, Mr. Observant there is probably the only person on this mobile asylum with an untroubled mind at the moment. The machine turned on the table, scratching the surface as it faced Horza. Are you really claiming to be one of these fabled human impersonators? it asked with a sneer in its voice. Horza looked down the table, then into Yalson's wary, frowning eyes. That's what I am. They're extinct? Avager said, shaking his head. They're not extinct, Valveda told him, her thin, finely moulded head turning briefly to the old man. But they're part of the Adiran sphere now, absorbed. Some of them always did support the Adirans. The rest either left or decided they might as well throw in their lot with them. Horza's one of the first lot. Can't stand the culture. He's taking you all to Shah's world to kidnap a shipwrecked mind for his Adiran masters. A culture mind, so that the galaxy will be free from human interference and the Adirans can have a free run at... All right, Balveda, Horza said. She shrugged. You're Horza, Yalson said pointing at him. He nodded. She shook her head. I, I don't believe it. I'm starting to come round to the drone's way of thinking. You're both crazy. You took a nasty blow to the head, Craiglin, and you, lady. She looked at Balveda. Have had your brains scrambled by this thing. Yalson picked up the stun gun and then put it down again. I don't know, Wubslin said, scratching his head and looking at Horza as though he was some sort of exhibit. I thought the captain seemed a bit strange. I couldn't imagine him doing what he just did in the GSV. What did you do, Horza? Malveda said. I seem to have missed something. How did you get away? I flew out, Balveda. Used the fusion motors and the laser and blasted out. Really? Balveda laughed again, throwing her head back. She went on laughing, but her laughter was a little too loud, and the tears were coming too quickly to her eyes. Oh, well, I am impressed. I thought we had you. When did you find out? He asked her quietly. She sniffed and tried to wipe her nose on her shoulder. What? That you weren't Cricklin? She played her tongue along her top lip. Oh, just before you came aboard. We had a microdrone pretending to be a fly. It was programmed to land on anybody approaching the ship while it was in the small bay and take a skin cell or hair or something away with it. We identified you from your own chromosomes. There was another agent outside. He must have used his effector on the bay controls when he monitored you starting to get ready to leave. I was supposed to do whatever I could if you appeared. Kill you, capture you, disable the ship, anything. But they didn't tell me until too late. They knew somebody might overhear if they warned me, but they must have started to get worried. That was the noise you heard from her kit bag, Horza told Yossen, just before I zapped her. He looked back at Balveda. I got rid of the gear, by the way, Balveda. 
dumped it all through the vac tubes. Your bomb went off. Balveda seemed to sag a little further in her seat. He guessed that she had been hoping her gear was on board. At the very least, she might have been hoping the bomb had still to be triggered, and that while she would die, she would not die in vain or alone. Oh, yes, she said, looking down at the table. The vac tubes. What about Craiklin? Yalson asked. He's dead, Horsa said. I killed him. Oh, well, Yalson tuttered and wrapped her fingers on the table surface. That's that. I don't know if you two really are mad or if you're telling the truth. Both possibilities are pretty awful. She looked from Balveda to Horsa, raising her eyebrows at the man and saying, By the way, if you really are, Horsa, it's a lot less pleasant to see you back than I thought it was going to be. I'm sorry, he told her. She turned her head away from him. I still think the best thing to do is to head back for the ends of invention and lay the whole thing before the authorities. The drone rose fractionally above the surface of the table and looked round at them all. Horsa leaned forward and tapped its casing. It faced him. Machine, he said. We're going to Shah's world. If you want to go back to the GSV, I'll gladly put you at ends of invention and lay the whole thing before the authorities. The drone rose fractionally above the surface of the table and looked round at them all. Horsa leaned forward and tapped its casing. It faced him. Machine, he said. We're going to Shah's world. If you want to go back to the GSV, I'll gladly put you in a vac tube and let you make your own way back. But you mention returning and getting a fair trial one more time, and I'm going to blast your synthetic fucking brains out. Understand? How dare you speak to me like that? The drone bellowed. I'll have you know, I am an accredited free construct, certified sentient, under the free will acts by the Greater Vavet United Moral Standards Administration, and with full citizenship of the Vavet heterocracy. I am near to paying off my incurred generation debt, when I'll be free to do exactly what I like, and have already been accepted for a degree course in applied paratheology at the University of Will You Shut Your Goddamn Speaker and Listen, Horsa shouted, breaking into the machine's breathless monologue. We're not on, Vavach, and I don't care how goddamn smart you are or how many qualifications you've got. You're on this ship, and you do as I say. You want to get off? Get off now and float back to whatever's left of your precious fucking orbital. Stay, and you obey orders, or get junked. Those are my choices. Yes. Use some of your accredited free will and decide right now. I... The drone rose from the table then sank again. Hmm, it said. Very well. I shall stay. And obey all orders? And obey all orders. Good, at within reason. Machine, Horsa said, reaching for the plasma pistol. Oh, good grief, man, the drone exclaimed. What do you want, a robot? Its voice sneered. I don't have an off button on my reasoning functions. I can't choose not to have free will. I could quite easily swear to obey all orders, regardless of the consequences. I could vow to sacrifice my life for you if you asked me to, but I'd be lying so that I could live. I swear to be as obedient and faithful as any of your human crew, in fact, as the most obedient and faithful of them. For pity's sake, man, in the name of all reason, what more can you ask? Sneaky bastard, Horsa thought. Well, he said, I suppose that will just have to do. Now... Can, but I am obliged to serve immediate notice on you that under the terms of my retrospective construction agreement, my incurred generation debt loan agreement, and my employment contract, your forcible removal of myself from my place of work makes you liable for the servicing of said debt until my return, as well as risking civil and criminal proceedings. Fucking hell, drone! Yasin interrupted. Sure it wasn't law you were going to study? I take full responsibility, machine, Horsa told it. Now shut! Well, I hope you're properly insured, the drone muttered. Up! Horsa, Balveda said. Yes, Perestek. He turned to her with a sense of relief. Her eyes were glittering. She licked her top lip again, then looked back at the surface of the table, her head down. What about me? Well, he said slowly, it did cross my mind to blow you out of tube. He saw her tense. Yalson, too. She turned in her seat to face him, clenching her fists and opening her mouth. Horsa went on. But you may be of some use yet. And... <laughs> call it sentiment, he smiled. 
You'll have to behave, of course. Balveda looked up at him. There was hope in her eyes, but also the piteousness of those who don't want to hope too soon. You mean that, I hope, she said quietly. Horsa nodded. I mean it. I couldn't possibly get rid of you anyway, before I find out how the hell you got off the hand of God. Balveda relaxed, breathing deeply. When she laughed, it was softly. Yolson was looking with a jaundiced expression at Horsa and still wrapping her fingers on the table. Yolson, Horsa said, I'd like you and Dorolo to take Balveda and strip her, take her suit and everything else off. He was aware of them all looking at him. Balveda was arching her eyebrows with faked shock. He went on, I want you to take the surgery equipment and run every sort of test you can on her once she's naked to make sure she hasn't got any skin pouches, implants or prosthetics. Use the ultrasound and the x-ray gear and the NMR and anything else we've got. Once you've done that, you can find something for her to wear. Put a suit in a vac tube and dump it. Also, any jewellery or other personal possessions of any sort or size, regardless of how innocent they may look. You want her washed and anointed? Put in a white robe and placed on a stone altar, too? Yalson said acidly. Horsa shook his head. I want her clean of anything, anything at all, that could be used as a weapon, or that could turn into one. The culture's latest gadgetry for the special circumstances includes things called memory forms. They might look like a badge or a medallion. He smiled at Balveda, who nodded back wryly. Or anything else, but do a certain something to them. Touch them in the right place, make them wet, speak a certain word, and they become a communicator, a gun or a bomb. I don't want to risk there being anything more dangerous than Ms. Balveda herself on board. What about when we get to Shah's world? Balveda said. We'll give you some warm clothes. If you wrap up well, you'll be all right. No suit, no weapons. And the rest of us? asked Avager. What are we supposed to do when we get to this place? Assuming they'll let you in, which I doubt. I'm not sure yet, Horsa said truthfully. Maybe you'll have to come with me. I'll have to see what I can do about the ship's fidelities. Possibly you'll all be able to stay on board. Perhaps you'll all have to hit dirt with me. However, there are some other changes there. People like myself, but not working for the Adherans. They should be able to look after you if I'm to be gone for any amount of time. Of course, he said, looking at Yelson. If any of you want to come along with me, I'm sure that we can treat this as a normal operation in terms of shareouts and so forth. Once I'm finished with the cat, those of you who so desire may want to take it over for yourselves. Run it any way you like. Sell it if you want. It's up to you. At any rate, you'll all be free to do as you wish once I've accomplished my mission on Shah's world. Or done my best to, at least. Yalson had been looking at him, but now she turned away, shaking her head. Wobslin was looking at the deck. Avager and Dorolo stared at each other. The drone was silent. Now, Horsa said, rising stiffly, Yolson and Dorolo, if you wouldn't mind seeing to Ms. Balveda. With a show of some reluctance, Yolson sighed and got up. Dorolo started to undo some of the restraining straps around the culture agent's body, and do be very careful with her, Horsa continued. Keep one person well away from her with a gun pointed in her direction the whole time, while the other does the work. Yolson muttered something under her breath and leaned to pick up the stun gun from the table. Horsa turned to Avager. I think somebody should tell Nysin about all the excitement he's missed, don't you? Avager hesitated, then nodded. Yes, Krieg. He stopped, spluttered, then said no more. He got up from his seat and went quickly down the corridor toward the cabins. I think I'll open up the forward compartments and have a look at the laser, Craiklin, if that's all right with you, Wooslin said. Oh, I mean, Horsa. The engineer stood, frowning and scratching his head. Horsa nodded. Wilbslin found a clean, undamaged beaker and took a cold drink from the dispenser, then went down the corridor through the accommodation section. Dorolo and Yelson had freed Balveda. The tall, pale-skinned culture woman stretched, closing her eyes and arching her neck. She ran a hand through her short red hair. Dorolo watched warily. Yelson held the stun gun. Balveda flexed her shoulders, then indicated she was ready. Right, Yelson said, waving Balveda forward with the gun. We'll do this in my cabin. 
Horsa stood up to let the three women by. As Balveda passed, her long, easy stride unencumbered by the light suit, he said, How did you get off the hand of God, Balveda? She stopped and said, I killed the guard, then sat and waited, Horsa. The GCU managed to take the cruiser intact. Eventually some nice soldier drones came and rescued me. She shrugged. Unarmed? You killed an Adiran in full battle armour and toting a laser, Horsa said sceptically. Malveda shrugged again. Horsa, I didn't say it was easy. What about Zoralundra? Horsa asked through a grin. Your old Adiran friend must have escaped. A few of them did. At any rate, he wasn't among the dead or captured. Horsa nodded and waved her by. Followed by Yelson and Dorolo, Peristek Balveda went down the corridor to Yelson's cabin. Horsa looked at the drone sitting on the table. Think you can make yourself useful, machine? I suppose, as you obviously intend to keep us all here and take us to this unattractive-sounding rock ball on the edge of nowhere, I might as well do what I can to make the journey as safe as possible. I'll help with the vessel's maintenance, if you like. I would prefer, though, if you call me by my name, and not just by that word you managed to make sound like an expletive, machine. I am called Unaha Klosp. Is it asking too much for you to address me as such? Why, certainly not, Unaha Klosp, Horsa said, trying to look and sound sufficiently bogus in his abjection. I shall most assuredly ensure that I call you that in future. It might, the drone said, rising from the table to the level of Horsa's eyes, seem amusing to you. But it matters to me. I am not just a computer. I am a drone. I am conscious, and I have an individual identity. Therefore, I have a name. I told you I'd use it, Horsa said. Thank you. I shall go and see if your engineer needs any help inspecting the laser housing. It floated to the door. Horsa watched it go. He was alone. He sat down and looked at the screen, down at the far end of the mess. The debris that had been Vavach glowed with a barren glare. That vast cloud of matter was still visible. But it was cooling, dead and spinning away, becoming less real, more ghostly, less substantial all the time. He sat back and closed his eyes. He would wait a while before going to sleep. He wanted to give the others time to think about what they had found out. They would be easier to read then. He would know if he was safe for the moment or whether they would have to watch them all. He also wanted to wait until Yelson and Dorolo had finished with Balveda. The culture agent might be biding her time now she thought she had longer to live, but she still might try something. He wanted to be awake in case she did. He still hadn't decided whether to kill her now or not, but at least he too now had time to think. The clear air turbulence completed its last programmed course correction, swinging its nose towards the glitter cliff face not in the precise direction of the Shah's world star, but onto the general bearing. Behind it, still expanding, still radiating, still slowly dissolving in the system to which it had given its name, the unnumbered twinkling fragments of the orbital called Vavach blew out toward the stars, drifting on a stellar wind that rang and swirled with the fury of the world's destruction. Horsa sat alone in the mess room a little longer, watching the remnants dissipate. Light against the darkness, a fat torus of nothing, just debris. An entire world just wiped out. Not merely destroyed, the very first cut of the grid energies would have been enough to do that, but obliterated, taken carefully, precisely, artistically apart. Annihilation made into an aesthetic experience. The arrogant grace of it, the absolute zero coldness of that sophisticated viciousness, it impressed almost as much as it appalled. Even he would admit to a certain reluctant admiration. The culture had not wasted its lesson to the Adirans and the rest of the galactic community. It had turned even that ghastly waste of effort and skill into a thing of beauty. But it was a message it would regret, Orza thought, as the hyperlight sped and the ordinary light crawled through the galaxy. This was what the culture offered. This was its signal its advertisement, its legacy. Chaos from order, destruction from construction, death from life. Vavach would be more than its own monument. It would commemorate, too, the final grisly manifestation of the culture's lethal idealism, 
the overdue acknowledgement that not only was it no better than any other society, it was much, much worse. They sought to take the unfairness out of existence, to remove the mistakes in the transmitted message of life which gave it any point or advancement. A memory of darkness swept through him, and he shivered. But theirs was the ultimate mistake, the final error, and it would be their undoing. Horza considered going to the bridge to switch the view on the screen to real space, and so see the orbital intact again, as it had been a few weeks before when the real light the cat was now travelling through had left the place. But he shook his head slowly, though there was nobody there to see, and watched the quiet screen at the far end of the disordered and deserted room instead. State of Play 2 The yacht dropped anchor within a wooded bay. The water was clear and ten metres beneath the sparkling waves the sandy floor of the anchorage was visible. Tall everblues were spread in a rough crescent around the small inlet, their dusty-looking roots sometimes visible on the ochre sandstone they clung to. There were some small cliffs of the same rock, sprinkled with bright flowers and overlooking golden beaches. The white yacht, its long reflection flickering on the water like a silent flame, feathered its tall sails and swung slowly into the faint breeze coming through one arm of the woods and over the cupped bay. People took small canoes or dinghies to the shore or jumped into the warm water and swam. Some of the Cirevels, which had escorted the yacht in its voyage from its home port, stayed to play in the bay. Their long red bodies slipped through the water under and around the vessel's hull and their snorting breath echoed from the low cliffs facing the water. Sometimes they nudged the boats heading for the shore and a few of the swimmers played with the sleek animals, diving to swim with them, touch them, hold on to them. The shouts of the people in the boats drew gradually further away. They beached the small craft and disappeared into the woods, going to explore the uninhabited island. The small waves of the inland sea lapped at the disturbed sand. Fal and Gistra sighed, and after walking once around the yacht, sat down near the stern on a padded seat. She played absently with one of the ropes tied between the stanchions, rubbing it with her hand. The boy, who had been talking to her during the morning, when the yacht was sailing slowly out from the mainland toward the islands, saw her sitting there and came to talk to her. Aren't you going to look at the island? he said. He was very thin and light-looking. His skin was a deep, almost golden yellow. There was a sheen about it which made Fal think of a hologram because it looked somehow deeper than his skinny arms and legs were thick. I don't feel like it, Fal said. She hadn't wanted the boy to talk to her earlier, and she didn't want to talk to him now. She was sorry she'd agreed to come on the cruise. Why not? the boy said. She couldn't remember his name. She hadn't been paying attention when he started talking to her, and she wasn't even sure he had told her his name, though she assumed he had. I just don't. She shrugged. She wasn't looking at him. Oh, he said. He was silent for a while. She was aware of the sunlight reflecting from his body but she still didn't turn to look at him. She watched the distant trees, the waves, the ruddy bodies of the Cirevels humpbacking on the surface of the water as they rose to vent and then dive again. The boy said, I know how you feel. Do you? she said, and turned to look at him. He looked a little surprised. He nodded. You're fed up, aren't you? Maybe, she said, looking away again. A little bit. Why does that old drone follow you about everywhere? She darted a glance at the boy. Jace was below decks just then, getting a drink for her. It had come aboard at the port with her and had stayed not too far away all the time, the hovering, protective way it usually did. She shrugged again and watched a flock of birds rise from the interior of the island. They called and dipped and wheeled in the air. It looks after me, she said. She stared at her hands, watching the sunlight reflect from her nails. Do you need looking after? No. Then why does it look after you? I don't know. You're very mysterious, you know, he said. She wasn't looking, but she thought she heard a smile in his voice. She shrugged soundlessly. You're like that island, he said. You're strange and mysterious like it is. Fal snorted and tried to look scathing. Then she saw Jace appearing from a doorway carrying a glass. She got up quickly, followed by the boy, walked down the deck and met the old drone, taking the glass from it and smiling at it gratefully. She buried her face in the container and sipped at the drink, looking out through the glass at the boy. Well, hello, young man, Jace said. Aren't you going to have a look at the island? 
Fowl wanted to kick the machine because of its hearty voice, and the waiter said almost what the boy had said to her. I might, the boy said, looking at her. You should, Jay said, starting to float toward the stern. The old machine extended a curved field, like a shadow without something to cast it, out from its casing and round the boy's shoulders. By the way, I couldn't help overhearing you when you were talking earlier, it said, gently guiding the boy down the deck. His golden head turned over his shoulder to look at Fowl, who was still drinking her drink very slowly, and just starting to follow Jace and the boy, a couple of paces behind. The boy looked away from her and toward the drone at his side, which was saying, You were talking about not getting into contact. That's right. The boy's voice was suddenly defensive. I was talking about that, so? Fowl continued to walk behind the drone and the boy. She smacked her lips. Ice in the glass clinked. You sounded bitter, Jay said. I'm not bitter, the boy said quickly. I just think it isn't fair, that's all. That you weren't picked, Jace asked. They were approaching the seats round the stern where Fowl had sat a few minutes earlier. Well, yes, it's all I've ever wanted, and I think they made a mistake. I know I'd be good. I thought with the war and all that, they would need more people. Well, yes, but contact has far more applicants than it can use. But I thought one of the things that they considered was how much you wanted to get in, and I know nobody could have wanted to get in as much as I do. Ever since I can remember, I've wanted... The boy's voice trailed off as they came to the seats. Fowl sat down. So did the boy. Fowl was looking at him now, but not listening. She was thinking. Perhaps they don't think you're mature enough yet. I am mature. Hmm. They very rarely take people so young, you know. For all I know, they're looking for a special sort of immaturity when they do take people your age. Well, that's silly. I mean, how do you know what to do if they don't tell you what they want? How can you prepare? I think it's all really unfair. In a way, I think it's meant to be, Jace replied. They get so many people applying. They can't take them all, or even just take the best, because there are so many of them. So they choose at random from them. You can always reapply. I don't know, the boy said, sitting forward and putting his elbows on his knees and his head into his hands, staring at the polished wood of the deck. Sometimes I think they just tell you that so that you won't feel bad when they reject you. I think they do maybe take the very best, but I think they've made a mistake. But because they won't tell you why you've failed, what can you do about it? She was thinking about failure too. Jace had congratulated her on her idea about finding the changer. Only that morning, when they were on the ancient steam funicular down from the lodge, they had heard about the events at Vavach, when the changer, called Bora Horsa Gobachul, had appeared and escaped on the pirate ship, taking their agent, Perestak Belveda, with him. Her hunch had been right, and Jace was effusive in its praise, making the point that it wasn't her fault the man had got away. But she was depressed. Sometimes being right thinking the correct thing, predicting accurately, depressed her. It had all seemed so obvious to her. It hadn't been a supernatural omen or anything silly like that when Peristak Belveda suddenly turned up, on the battle-damaged but victorious GCU nervous energy, which was towing most of a captured Irian cruiser. But it had seemed so... so natural that Belveda ought to be the one to go in search of the missing changer. By that time, they'd had more information about what had been going on in that volume of space when that particular duel had been going on, and the reported possible and probable movements of various ships had pointed, again, she thought fairly obviously, to the private aircraft called the Clear Air Turbulence. There were other possibilities, and they were followed up too, as far as the already stretched resources of Contact Special Circumstances section would allow. But she was always certain that if any of the branching possibilities was going to bear fruit, it would be the Vavach connection. The captain of the clear air turbulence was called Kraklin. He played damage. Vavach was the most obvious site for a full damage game in years. Therefore, the most likely place to intercept the vessel, apart from Shah's world if the changer already had control, was Vavach. She had stuck her neck out by insisting that Vavach was the most likely place, and that the woman agent Balveda should be one of those to go there. And now it had all come true, and she realised it wasn't really her neck she had stuck out at all. It was Balveda's. But what else could be done? The war was accelerating throughout an immense volume. There were many other urgent missions for the few special circumstances agents, and anyway, Balveda was the only really good one within range. There was one young man they'd sent in with her, but he was only promising, not experienced. Fowl had known all along that if it came to it, Balveda would risk her own life, not the man's, 
if infiltrating the mercenaries was the only chance of getting to the changer and through him to the mind. It was brave, but Fal suspected it was mistaken. The changer knew Balveda. He might well recognise her, no matter how much she'd altered her own appearance, and there hadn't been time for Balveda to undergo radical physical change. If the changer realised who she was, and Fal suspected he had, Balveda had far less chance of completing her mission than even the most callow and nervous but unsuspected rookie agent. Forgive me, lady, Fal thought to herself. I'd have done better by you if I could. She had tried to hate the changer all that day, tried to imagine him and hate him because he had probably killed Balveda, but apart from the fact that she found it hard to imagine somebody when she had no idea what he might look like, the ship's captain, Kraiklin, for some reason, the hatred would not materialise. The changer did not seem real. She liked the sound of Balveda. She was brave and daring, and Fal hoped against hope that Balveda would live, that somehow she would survive it all, and that one day, maybe, they would meet, perhaps after the war. But that didn't seem real either. She couldn't believe in it. She couldn't imagine it the way she had imagined, say, Balveda finding the changer. She had seen that in her mind, and had willed it to happen. In her version, of course, it was Balveda who won, not the changer. But she couldn't imagine meeting Balveda, and somehow that was frightening, as though she had started to believe in her own prescience so much that the inability to imagine something clearly enough meant that it would never happen. Either way, it was depressing. What chance had the agent of living through the war? Not a good one at the moment, Fowl knew that. But even supposing Balveda did somehow save herself this time, what were the chances she'd wind up dead anyway later on? The longer the war went on, the more likely it was. Fowl felt, and the general consensus of opinion among the more clued-up minds was, that the war would last decades rather than years. Plus or minus a few months, of course. Fowl frowned and bit her lip. She couldn't see them getting the mind. The changer was winning, and she had all but run out of ideas. All she'd thought of recently was a way, perhaps, just maybe, of putting Gobachul off. Probably not a way of stopping him completely, but possibly a way of making his job harder. But she wasn't optimistic, even if Contact's war command agreed to such a dangerous, equivocal and potentially expensive plan. Fal, Jace said. She realised she was looking at the island without seeing it. The glass was growing warm in her hand, and Jace and the boy were both looking at her. What? she said, and drank. I was asking what you thought about the war, the boy said. He was frowning, looking at her with narrowed eyes, the sunlight sharp on his face. She looked at his broad, open face and wondered how old he was. Older than her? Younger? Did he feel like she did, wanting to be older, yearning to be treated as responsible? I, I don't understand. What do you mean? Think about it in what way? Well, the boy said, Who's going to win? He looked annoyed. She suspected it had been very obvious that she hadn't been listening. She looked at Jace, but the old machine didn't say anything, and with no aura field, there was no way of telling what it was thinking, or how it was feeling. Was it amused? Worried? She drank, gulping down the last of the cool drink. We are, of course, she said quickly, glancing from the boy to Jace. The boy shook his head. I'm not so sure he said, rubbing his chin. I'm not so sure we have the will. The will, Fal said. Yes, the desire to fight. I think the Adirans are natural fighters. We aren't. I mean, look at us. He smiled as though he was much older and thought himself much wiser than she, and he turned his head and waved his hand lazily toward the island, where the boats lay tilted against the sand. Fifty or sixty metres away, Fal saw what looked like a man and woman coupling in the shallows under a small cliff. They were bobbing up and down, the woman's dark hands clasped round the man's lighter neck. Was that what the boy was being so urbane about? Good grief, the fascination of sex. No doubt it was great fun, but then how could people take it so seriously? Sometimes she felt a sneaking envy for the adherents. They got over it. After a while it no longer mattered. They were dual hermaphrodites, each half of the couple impregnating the other, and each usually bearing twins. After one or occasionally two pregnancies, and weanings, they changed from their fertile breeder stage to become warriors. Opinion was divided on whether they increased in intelligence or just underwent a personality alteration. 
Certainly, they became more cunning but less open-minded, more logical but less imaginative, more ruthless, less compassionate. They grew by another metre. Their weight almost doubled. Their keratinous covering became thicker and harder. Their muscles increased in bulk and density, and their internal organs altered to accommodate these power-increasing changes. At the same time, their bodies absorbed their reproductive organs, and they became sexless, all very linear, symmetrical, and tidy, compared to the culture's pick-your-own approach. Yes, she could see why this gangly idiot sitting in front of her, with his nervously superior smile, would find the Adirans impressive. Young fool, this is. Fal was annoyed, enough to be a little stuck for words. This is just us now. We haven't evolved. We've changed a lot, changed ourselves a lot, but we haven't evolved at all since we were running around killing ourselves. I mean each other. She sucked her breath in, annoyed with herself now. The boy was smiling tolerantly at her. She felt herself blushing. We are still animals, she insisted. We're natural fighters, just as much as the Adirans. Then how come they're winning? The boy smirked. They had a head start. We didn't begin properly preparing for war until the last moment. Warfare has become a way of life for them. We're not all that good at it yet because it's been hundreds of generations since we had to do it. Don't worry, she told him, looking down at her empty glass and lowering her voice slightly. We're learning quite fast enough. Well, you wait and see, the boy said, nodding at her. I think we'll pull out of the war and let the Adirans get on with their expansion or whatever you want to call it. The war's been sort of exciting and it's made a change, but it's been nearly four years now. And... He waved one hand again. We haven't even won anything much yet. He laughed. All we keep doing is running away. Fal stood up quickly, turning away in case she started to cry. Oh shit! The boy was saying to Jace. I suppose I've gone and said something now. Did she have a friend or a relation? She walked down the deck, limping a little as the newly healed leg started to hurt again with a distant nagging ache. Don't worry, Jace was saying to the boy. Leave her alone, and she'll be all right. She put her glass inside one of the dark, empty cabins of the yacht, then kept going, heading for the forward superstructure. She climbed up a ladder to the wheelhouse, then up another ladder to its roof, and sat there with her legs crossed. The recently broken leg hurt, but she ignored it, and looked out to sea. Far away, almost on the haze limit, a ridge of whiteness shimmered in the near still air. Fal and Gistra let out a long, sad breath and wondered if the white shapes, probably only visible because they were high up in clearer air, were snowy mountain tops. Maybe they were just clouds. She couldn't remember the geography of the place well enough to work it out. She sat there thinking of those peaks. She remembered when once, high in the foothills, where a small mountain stream leveled out onto a marshy plateau for a kilometer or so. Arcing and swerving and bowing over the sodden reed-covered land, like an athlete stretching and flexing between games, she had found something which had made that winter day's walk memorable. Ice had been forming in clear, brittle sheets at the side of the flowing stream. She had spent some time happily marching through the shallows of the water, crunching the thin ice with her boots and watching it drift downstream. She wasn't climbing that day, just walking. She had waterproofs on and carried little gear. Somehow. The fact she wasn't doing anything dangerous or physically demanding had made her feel like a young child again. She came to a place where the stream flowed over a terrace of rock from one level of moor down to another, and there a small pool had carved itself into the rock just beneath the rapids. The water fell less than a meter, and the stream was narrow enough to jump. But she remembered that stream and that pool because there, in the circling water, caught beneath the splashing rapids, floated a frozen circle of foam. The water was naturally soft and peaty, and a yellow-white foam sometimes formed in the mountain streams of that area, blown by the winds and caught in the reeds. But she had never seen it collected into a circle like that and frozen. She laughed when she saw it. She waded in and carefully picked it up. It was only a little greater in diameter than the distance between her outstretched thumb and little finger, and a few centimeters thick, not as fragile as she had at first feared. The frothy bubbles had frozen in the cold air and almost freezing water, making what looked like a tiny model of a galaxy, a fairly common spiral galaxy like this one, like hers. She held the light confection of air and water and suspended chemicals and turned it over in her hands, sniffing it, sticking her tongue out and licking it. 
looking at the dim winter sun through it, flicking her finger to see if it would ring. She watched her little rhyme galaxy start to melt very slowly and saw her own breath blow across it, a brief image of her warmth in the air. Finally, she put it back where she had found it, slowly revolving in the pool of water at the base of the small rapids. The galaxy image had occurred to her then, and she thought at the time about the similarity of the forces which shaped both the little and the vast. She had thought, and which is really the most important, but then felt embarrassed to have thought such a thing. Every now and again, though, she went back to that thought and knew that each was exactly as important as the other. Then, later, she would go back to her second thoughts on the matter and feel embarrassed again. Fal and Gistra took a deep breath and felt a little better. She smiled and raised her head, closing her eyes for a moment and watching the red sun haze behind her eyelids. Then she ran a hand through her curly blonde hair and wondered again if the distant wavering, unsure shapes over the shimmering water were clouds or mountains. Chapter 9. Shah's World Imagine a vast and glittering ocean seen from a great height. It stretches to the clear curved limit of every angle of horizon, the sun burning on a billion tiny wavelets. Now imagine a smooth blanket of cloud above the ocean, a shell of black velvet suspended high above the water and also extending to the horizon. But keep the sparkle of the sea despite the lack of sun. Add to the cloud many sharp and tiny lights scattered on the base of the inky overcast like glinting eyes, singly, in pairs or in larger groups, each positioned far, far away from any other set. That is the view a ship has in hyperspace as it flies like a microscopic insect, free between the energy grid and real space. The small, sharp lights on the undersurface of the cloud cover are stars, the waves on the sea are the irregularities of the grid on which a ship, travelling in hyperspace, finds traction with its engine fields, while that sparkle is its source of energy. The grid and the plane of real space are curved, rather like the ocean and the cloud would be round a planet, but less so. Black holes show as thin and twisting water spouts from clouds to sea, supernovae as long lightning flashes in the overcast. Rocks... Moons, planets, orbitals, even rings and spheres hardly show at all. The two killer-class rapid offensive units, trade surplus and revisionist, raced through the hyperspace, flashing underneath the web of real space like slim and glittering fish in a deep, still pond. They wove past systems and stars, keeping deep beneath the empty spaces where they were least likely to be traced. Their engines were each a focus of energy almost beyond imagining packing sufficient power within their 200 metres to equal perhaps 1% of the energy produced by a small sun, flinging the two vessels across the four-dimensional void at an equivalent speed in real space of rather less than 10 light-years per hour. At the time, this was considered particularly fast. They sensed the glitter cliff and sullen gulf ahead. They twisted their headlong rush to angle them deep inside the war zone, aiming themselves at the system which contained Shah's world. Far in the distance, they could see the group of black holes which had created the gulf. Those flutes of plunging energy had passed through the area millennia before, clearing a space of consumed stars behind them, creating an artificial galactic arm as they headed in a long spiral, closer toward the centre of the slowly spinning island of stars and nebulae that was the galaxy. The group of black holes was commonly known as the forest, so closely were they grouped, and the two speeding culture craft had instructions to try to force their way between those twisted, lethal trunks, if they were seen and pursued. The culture's field management was considered superior to the Adirans, so it was thought they would have a better chance of getting through, and any chasing craft might even break off rather than risk tangling with the forest. It was a terrible risk even to contemplate, but the two ROUs were precious. The culture had not yet built many, and everything possible had to be done to make sure that the craft got back safely, or, if the worst came to the worst, were destroyed utterly. They encountered no hostile ships. They flashed across the inward face of the quiet barrier in seconds, and delivered their prescribed loads in two short bursts, then twisted once and tore away at maximum speed, out through the thinning stars and past the glitter cliff, into the empty skies of the sullen gulf. They registered the hostile craft stationed near the Shah's world system, starting off in pursuit, 
but they had been seen too late, and they quickly outdistanced the probing beams of track lasers. They set course for the far side of the gulf, their strange mission completed. The mines on board, and the small crew of humans each vessel carried, who were there more because they wanted to be than for their utility, hadn't been told why they were blasting empty space with expensive warheads, shooting off crews at each other's target drones, dumping clouds of cam and ordinary gas and releasing odd little unpowered signalling ships which were little more than unmanned shuttles packed with broadcasting equipment. The entire effect of this operation would be to produce a few spectacular flashes and flares and a scattering of radiation shells and wide-band signals before the Adirans cleared up the debris and blasted or captured the signal craft. They had been asked to risk their lives on some damn-fool panic mission which seemed designed to convince nobody in particular that there had been a space battle in the middle of nowhere when there hadn't, and they had done it. What was the culture coming to? The Adirans seemed to relish suicide missions. You could easily form the impression that they considered being asked to carry out any other sort something of an insult. But the culture, where even in the war forces, discipline was regarded as a taboo word, where people always wanted to know why this and why that. Things had come to a pretty pass indeed. The two ships raced across the gulf, arguing. On board, heated discussions were taking place between members of their crews. It took twenty-one days for the clear air turbulence to make the journey from Vavach to Shah's world. Wobslin had spent the time carrying out what repairs he could to the craft, but what the ship needed was another thorough overhaul. While structurally it was still sound and life support functioned nearly normally, it had suffered a general degradation of its systems, though no catastrophic failures. The warp units run a little more raggedly than before. The fusion motors were not up to sustained use in an atmosphere. They would get them down to and up from Shah's world, but not provide much more in air-flying time. And the vessel's sensors had been reduced in numbers and efficiency to a level not far above operational minimum. They had still escaped lightly, Horsa thought. With the cat under his control, Horsa was able to switch off the computer's identity circuits. He didn't have to fool the free company either, so as the days passed, he changed slowly to resemble his old self a little more. That was for Yalson and the other members of the free company. He was really striking two-thirds of a compromise between Kraiklin and the self he had been on the cat before it had reached Vavach. There was another third in there which he let grow and show itself on his face for nobody on board, but for a red-haired changer girl called Kirachel. He hoped she would recognise that part of his appearance when they met again, on Shah's world. Why did you think we'd be angry? Yalson asked him, in the cat's hangar one day. They had set up a target screen at one end and put their lasers onto practice. The screen's built-in projector flashed images for them to shoot at. Horsa looked at the woman. He was your leader. Yalson laughed. He was a manager. How many of them are liked by their staff? This is a business, Horza, and not even a successful one. Kraiklin managed to get most of us retired prematurely. Shit, the only person you needed to fool was the ship. There was that, Horza said, aiming at a human figure darting across the distant screen. The laser spot was invisible, but the screen sensed it and flashed white where it hit. The human figure hit in the leg, stumbled, but did not fall. Half marks. I did need to fool the ship, but I didn't want to risk somebody being loyal to Kraiklin. It was Yarson's turn, but she was looking at Horsa, not the screen. The ship's fidelities had been bypassed, and now all that was needed to command it was a numeric code, which only Horsa knew, and the small ring he wore, which had been Kraiklin's. He had promised that when they got to Shah's world, if there was no other way off the planet, he would set the cat's computer to free itself of all fidelity limitations after a given time, so that if he didn't come back out of the tunnels of the command system, the free company would not be stranded. You would have told us, Yalson said. Wouldn't you, Horza? I mean, you would have let us know eventually. Horza knew what she meant. Would he have told her? He put his gun down and looked into her eyes. Once I was sure, he said. Sure about the people, sure about the ship. It was the honest answer, but he wasn't certain it was the best one. He wanted Yalson wanted not just her warmth in the ship's red night, but her trust, her care. But she was still distant. Balveda lived. Perhaps she wouldn't still be alive if Horsa hadn't wanted Yalson's regard. He knew that, 
and it was a bitter thought, making him feel cheap and cruel. Even knowing that it was a definite thing would have been better than being uncertain. He couldn't say for sure whether the cold logic of this game dictated that the culture woman should die or be left alive, or even if, the former being comfortably obvious, he could have killed her in cold blood. He had thought it through, and still he didn't know. He only hoped that neither woman had guessed that any of this had gone through his mind. Kira Hell was another worry. It was absurd he knew to be concerned about his own affairs at such a time, but he couldn't stop thinking about the change of woman. The closer they came to Shah's world, the more he remembered of her, the more real his memories became. He tried not to build it up too much, tried to recall the boredom of the change's lonely outpost on the planet, and the restlessness he had felt there, even with Kirichel's company. But he dreamed about her slow smile, and recalled her low voice in all its fluid grace, with some of the heartache of a youth's first love. Occasionally, he thought Yalson might sense that too, and something inside him seemed to shrink with shame. Yalson shrugged, hoisted her gun to her shoulder, and fired at a four-legged shadow on the practice screen. It stopped in its tracks and dropped, seeming to dissolve into the line of shady ground at the bottom of the screen. Hawser gave talks. It made him feel like some visiting lecturer at a college, but that's what he did. He felt he had to explain to the others why he was doing what he was, why the changes supported the Adirans, why he believed in what they were fighting for. He called them briefings, and, ostensibly, they were about Shah's world and the command system, its history, geography, and so on, but he always, quite intentionally, ended up talking about the war in general, or about totally different aspects of it unrelated to the planet they were approaching. The briefing cover gave him a good excuse to keep Alveda confined to her cabin while he paced up and down on the deck of the mess, talking to the members of the free company. He didn't want his talks turning into a debate. Perestek Balveda had been no trouble. Her suit and a few items of harmless-looking jewellery and other bits and pieces had been jettisoned from a vac tube. She had been scanned with every item the cat's limited sickbay equipment could provide, and had come up clean. And she seemed quite happy to be a well-behaved prisoner, confined to the ship as they all were, and, apart from at night, locked in her cabin only occasionally. Horza didn't let her near the bridge just in case, but Balveda showed no signs of trying to get to know the ship especially well, the way he had done when he came on board. She didn't even try to argue any of the mercenaries around to her way of thinking about the war and the culture. Horza wondered how secure she felt. Balveda was pleasant and seemed unworried, but he looked at her sometimes and thought he saw briefly a glimpse of inattention, even despair. It relieved him in one way, but in another it gave him that same bad, cruel feeling he experienced when he thought about exactly why the culture agent was still alive. Sometimes he was simply afraid of getting to Shah's world, but increasingly, as the voyage dragged on, he came to relish the prospect of some action and an end to thought. He called Balveda to his cabin one day, after they had all eaten in the mess. The woman came in and sat down on the same small seat he had sat in when Craiklin had summoned him just after he had joined the ship. Balveda's face was calm. She sat elegantly in the small seat, her long frame at once relaxed and poised. Her deep, dark eyes gazed out at Horsa from the thin, smoothly shaped head, and her red hair, now turning black, shone in the lights of the cabin. Captain Horsa? She smiled crossing her long-fingered hands on her lap. She wore a long blue gown, the plainest thing she had been able to find on the ship, something that had once belonged to the woman Gao. Hello, Balveda, Horsa said. He sat back on the bed. He wore a loose gown. For the first couple of days he had stayed in his suit, but while it stayed commendably comfortable, it was bulky and awkward in the confines of the clear air turbulence, so he discarded it for the voyage. He was about to offer Balveda something to drink, but somehow, because that was what Craiklin had done with him, it didn't seem the right thing to do. What was it, Horsa? Balveda said. I just wanted to... see how you wear, he said. He had tried to rehearse what he would say, assure her she was in no danger, that he liked her, and that he was sure that this time the worst that would happen to her really would be internment somewhere, and maybe a swap. But the words would not come. I'm fine, she said, smoothing her hand over her hair, her eyes glancing around the cabin briefly. I'm trying to be a model captive, 
so you won't have an excuse for ditching me. She smiled, but again he thought he sensed an edge to the gesture, yet he was relieved. No, <laughs> he laughed, letting his head rock back on his shoulders with a laugh. I've no intention of doing that. You're safe. Until we get to Shah's world, she said calmly. After that, too, he said. Valveda blinked slowly, looking down. Hmm, good. She looked into his eyes. He shrugged. I'm sure you'd do the same for me. I think I probably would, she said, and he couldn't tell whether she was lying or not. I just think it's a pity we're on different sides. It's a pity we're all on different sides, Valveda. Well, she said, clasping her hands on her lap again, there is a theory that the side we each think we're on is the one that will triumph eventually anyway. What's that, he grinned. Truth and justice? And not either, really. She smiled, not looking at him. Just, she shrugged, just life. The evolution you talked about. You said the culture was in a backwater, a dead end. If we are, maybe we'll lose after all. Damn, I'll get you on the good guy's side yet, Peristek, he said, with just a little too much heartiness. She smiled thinly. She opened her mouth to say something, then thought the better of it and closed it again. She looked at her hands. Horsa wondered what to say next. One night, six days out from their destination, the system star was fairly bright in the sky ahead of the ship, even on normal sight. Yalson came to his cabin. He hadn't expected it, and the tap at the door brought him from a state between waking and sleep with a jarring coldness which left him disoriented for a few moments. He saw her on the door screen and let her in. She came in quickly, closing the door after her and hugging him, holding him tight, soundless. He stood there, trying to wake up and work out how this had happened. There seemed to be no reason for it, no build-up of tension of any sort between them, no signs, no hints, nothing. Yalson had spent that day in the hangar, wired up with small sensors and exercising. He had seen her there, working away, sweating, exhausting herself peering at readouts and screens with her critical eyes, as though her body was a machine like the ship and she was testing it almost to destruction. They slept together, but as though to confirm the exertions she had put herself through during the day, Yalson fell asleep almost as soon as they lay down in his arms, while he was kissing and nuzzling her, breathing in the scent of her body again after what seemed like months. He lay awake and listened to her breathe, felt her move very slightly in his arms, and sensed her blood beat slower and slower, as she fell into a deep sleep. In the morning they made love, and afterward he asked her, while he held her and their sweat dried, Why? As their heart slowed. What changed your mind? The ship hummed distantly around them. She gripped him, hugging tighter still, and shook her head. Nothing, she said. Nothing in particular. Nothing important. He felt her shrug, and she turned her head away from his face, into his arm, toward the humming bulkhead. In a small voice, she said, Everything. Shar's world. Three days out, in the hangar, he watched the members of the Free Company work out and practice firing their guns at the screen. Nysin couldn't practice because he still refused to use lasers after what had happened in the Temple of Light. He had stocked up on magazines of micro-projectiles during his few sober moments and even half. After firing practice, Horza had each of the mercenaries test their AG harnesses. Kraiklin had purchased a cheap batch of them and insisted that the Free Company members who didn't already have an anti-gravity unit in their suit buy a harness from him, at what he claimed was cost price. Horza had been dubious at first, but the AG unit seemed serviceable enough and certainly might be useful for searching the command system's deeper shafts. Horza was satisfied that the mercenaries would follow him in, if they had to, down into the command system. The long delay since the excitement of Vavach and the boring routine of the life on the clear air turbulence had made them hanker after something more interesting. As Horza had honestly described it, Shah's world didn't sound too bad. At least it was unlikely they would find themselves in a firefight, and nobody, including the mind they might end up helping Horza search for, was going to start blowing things up not with a Draezen to reckon with. The sun of the Shah's world system shone brightly ahead of them now, 
the brightest thing in the sky. The glitter cliff was not a visible feature of the sky ahead, because they were still inside the spiral limb and looking out, but it was noticeable that all the stars ahead were either quite close or very far away, with none in the gap between. Horsa had changed the cat's course several times, but kept it on a general heading which, unless they turned, wouldn't take it closer than two light years from the planet. He would turn the craft and head in the following day. So far the journey had been uneventful. They had flown through the scattered stars without encountering anything out of the ordinary. No messages or signals, no distant flashes from battles, no warp wakes. The area around them seemed calm and undisturbed, as though all that was happening was what always happened. Just the stars being born and dying, the galaxy revolving, the holes twisting, the gases swirling. The war, in that hurried silence, in their false rhythm of day and night, seemed like something they had all imagined an inexplicable nightmare they had somehow shared, even escaped. Horsa had the ship watching, though, ready to alarm at the first hint of trouble. They were unlikely to find out anything before they got to the quiet barrier, but if everything was as peaceful and serene as that name implied, he thought he might not go arrowing straight in. Ideally, he would like to rendezvous with the Adiran fleet units, which were supposed to be waiting nearby. That would solve most of his problems. He would hand Balveda over, make sure Yalson and the rest of the mercenaries were safe, let them have the cat, and pick up the specialised equipment Zoralundra had promised him. That scenario would also let him meet Kirachel alone, without the distraction of the others being there. He would be able to be his old self without making any concessions to the self the free company and Yalson knew. Two days out, the ship's alarm went off. Horsa was dozing in his bed. He raced out of the cabin and forward to the bridge. In the volume of space before them, all hell seemed to have let loose. Annihilation light washed over them. It was the radiation from weapon explosions, registering pure and mixed on the vessel's sensors, indicating where warheads had gone off totally by themselves or in contact with something else. The fabric of three-dimensional space bucked and judded with a blast from warp charges, forcing the cat's automatics to disengage its engines every few seconds to prevent them being damaged on the shock waves. Horsa strapped in and brought all the subsidiary systems up. Wubslin came through the door from the mess. What is it? Battle of some sort, Horsa said, watching the screens. The volume of affected space was more or less directly on the inward side of Shah's world. The direct route from Vavach passed that way. The cat was one and a half light years away from the disturbance, too far away to be spotted on anything except the narrow beam of a track scanner, and therefore almost certainly safe. But Horsa watched the distant blasts of radiation and felt the cat ride the ripples of disturbed space with a sensation of nausea, even defeat. Message shell, Wolfson said, nodding at a screen. There, sorting itself out from the noise of radiation, a signal gradually appeared. The words forming a few letters at a time, like a field of plants growing and flowering. After a few repetitions of the signal, and it was being jammed, not simply interfered with by the battle's background noise, it was complete enough to read. Vessel, clear air turbulence, meet units 93rd Fleet, destination S.591134.45, mid, all safe. Damn, breathed Horsa. What's that mean? Wubslin said. He punched the figures on the screen into the cat's navigational computer. Oh, the engineer said, sitting back. It's one of the stars nearby. I guess they mean to rendezvous halfway between it and... He looked at the main screen. Yes, Horsa said, looking unhappily at the signal. It had to be a fake. There was nothing to prove it was from the Adirans. No message number, code class, ship originator, signatory, nothing genuine at all. That from the guys with the three legs, Wubslin said. He brought a hollow display onto another screen, showing stars surrounded by spherical grids of thin green lines. Hey, we're not all that far away from there. Is that right, Horsa said. He watched the continuing blasts of battle light. He entered some figures into the cat's control systems. The vessel brought its nose round, angling it further over toward the Shah's world system. Wubslin looked at Horsa. You don't think it is from them? I don't, Horsa said. The radiation was fading. The engagement appeared to be over, or the action broken off. I think we might turn up there and find a GCU waiting for us, or a cloud of cam. Cam? What? That stuff they dusted Vavach with, Wubslin said and whistled. 
No thanks. Hawser switched the screen with the message off. Less than an hour later, it all happened again. Shells of radiation, warp disturbance, and this time two messages, one telling the cat to ignore the first message, the other giving a new rendezvous point. Both seemed genuine. Both were affixed with the word Zoralandra. Hawser, still chewing the mouthful of food he'd been eating when the alarm went off for the second time, swore. A third message appeared, telling him personally to ignore those two signals and directing the cat to yet another rendezvous area. Hawser shouted with anger, sending bits of soggy food arcing out to hit the message screen. He turned the wideband communicator off completely, then went back to the mess. When do we reach the quiet barrier? A few more hours, half a day perhaps. Are you nervous? I'm not nervous. I've been here before. How about you? If you say it'll be all right, I believe you. It should be. Will you know any of the people there? I don't know. It's been a few years. They don't rotate personnel often, but people do leave. I don't know. I'll just have to wait and see. You haven't seen any of your own people for a long time, have you? No, not since I left there. Aren't you looking forward to it? Maybe. Horza, look, I know I told you we didn't ask each other about... about everything before we came aboard the cat, but that was... Before a lot of things changed. But it's the way we've been, isn't it? You mean you don't want to talk about it now? Maybe. I don't know. You want to ask me about... No. She put her hands to his lips. He felt them there in the darkness. No. It's okay. It's all right. Never mind. He sat in the centre seat. Wubslin was in the engineer's chair to Horse's right. Yalson to his left. The rest had crowded in behind them. He had let Balveda watch. There was little that could happen which she could affect now. The drone floated near the ceiling. The quiet barrier was coming up. It showed as a mirror field directly in front of them, about a light day in diameter. It had suddenly appeared on the screen when they were an hour out from the barrier. Wubslin had worried it was giving their position away, but Hawser knew that the mirror field existed only in the cat's senses. There was nothing there for anybody else to see. Five minutes out, every screen went black. Hawser had warned the rest about it, but even he felt anxious and blind when it happened. You sure this is meant to happen? Avager said. I'd be worried if it didn't, Hawser told him. The old man moved somewhere behind him. I think this is incredible, Dorolo said. This creature is virtually a god. I am sure it can sense our moods and thoughts. I can feel it already. Actually, it's just a collection of self-referencing Balveda, Hawser said, looking round at the culture woman. She stopped talking and clapped a hand over her mouth, flashing her eyes. He turned back to the blank screen. When's this thing? Yasin began. Approaching craft, the screen said in a variety of languages. Here we go, Nysen said. He was shushed by Dorolo. I respond, Horsa said in Moraine into the tight beam communicator. The other languages disappeared from the screen. You are approaching the planet called Shah's world, Draazen planet of the dead. Progress beyond this point is restricted. I know. My name is Borohorza Gorbachul. I wish to return to Shah's world for a short while. I ask this with all respect. Smooth talker, Balveda said. Horza glared briefly at her. The communicator would only transmit what he said, but he didn't want the woman to forget she was a prisoner. You have been here before. Horza couldn't tell if this was a question or not. I have been to Shah's world before, he confirmed. I was one of the Changer Sentinels. There seemed little point in telling the creature when. The Draazen called every time now, even though the language used tenses. The screen went blank, then repeated, You have been here before. Horza frowned and wondered what to say. Balveda muttered, obviously hopelessly senile. I have been here before, Horza said. Did the Draazen mean that because he had already been there he could not return? I can feel it. I can feel its presence. Dorolo whispered. There are other humans with you. Thanks a lot, said the drone Unaha Klosp from somewhere near the ceiling. You see? Dorolo said, her voice almost whimpering. 
Horsa heard Balveda snort. Dorolo staggered slightly. Avager and Nysin had to hold on to her to stop her from falling. I have not been able to set them down elsewhere, Horsa said. I ask your indulgence. If need be, they will stay on board this vessel. They are not sentinels. They are other humanoid species. I alone need to alight on Shah's world. Entry is restricted. Horsa sighed. I alone request permission to land. Why have you come here? Horsa hesitated. He heard Balveda snort quietly. He said, I seek one who is here. What do the others seek? They seek nothing. They are with me. They are here. They... Horsa licked his lips. All his rehearsing, all his thoughts about what to say at this moment seemed to be useless. They are not all here by choice, but I had no alternative. I had to bring them. If you wish, they will stay on board this craft in orbit around Shah's world, or further away inside the quiet barrier. I have a suit I can. They are here against their will. Horsa hadn't known Draesen to interrupt before. He couldn't imagine it was a good sign. The circumstances are complicated. Certain species in the galaxy are at war. Choices become limited. One does things one would not normally do. There is death here. Horsa looked at the words written on the screen. He felt transfixed by them. There was silence on the bridge for a moment. Then he heard a couple of people moving awkwardly. What does that mean? The drone Unaha Klosp said. There... There is? Horsa said. The words stayed on the screen, written in Moraine. Wobslin tapped at a few buttons on his side of the console, buttons which would normally control the display on the screens in front of him, all of which now repeated the words on the main screen. The engineer was sitting in his seat, looking cramped and tense. Horsa cleared his throat, then said, There was a battle, a conflict nearby, just before we got here. It might still be going on. There may be death. There is death here. Oh, Dorolo said, and slumped into Nysen and Avager's arms. We better get her to the mess, Avager said, looking at Nysen. Let her lie down. Oh, all right, Nysen said, glancing quickly at the woman's face. Dorolo appeared to be unconscious. I may be able to, Hors began, then gave a deep breath. If there is death here, I may be able to stop it. I may be able to prevent more death. Bora Horza Gobachul. Yes, Horza said, gulping. Avager and Nysin manhandled Dorolo's limp body out through the doorway into the corridor leading into the mess. The screen changed. You are looking for the refugee machine. Ho ho, said Balveda, turning away with a smile on her face and putting one hand to her mouth. Shit, said Yelson. Looks like our guard isn't so stupid. Unaha Klost observed. Yes, Horsa said sharply. There seemed little point in trying to pretend now. Yes, I am, but I think you may enter. What? the drone said. Well, yahoo, Yalson said, crossing her arms and leaning back against the bulkhead. Nysin came back through the door. He stopped when he saw the screen. That was quick, he said to Yalson. What did he say? Yalson just shook her head. Horsa felt a wave of relief sweep through him. He looked at each word on the screen in turn, as though frightened that the short message could somehow conceal a hidden negation. He smiled and said, Thank you. Shall I go down alone to the planet? You may enter. There is death here. Be warned. What death? Horsa said. The relief waned. The Draesen's words about death chilled him. Where is their death? Whose? The screen changed again, the first two lines disappearing. Now it simply said, Be warned. I do not, Unaha Klosp said slowly, like the sound of that at all. Then the screens were clear. Wobslin sighed and relaxed. The sun of the Shah's world system shone brightly ahead of them, less than a standard light year away. Horsa checked the figures on the navigation computer as its screen flickered back to normality along with the rest, displaying numbers and graphs and holographics. Then the changer sat back in his seat. 
We're through, all right, he said. We're through the quiet barrier. So nothing can touch us now, huh? Nysin said. Horza gazed at the screen. The single yellow dwarf star showing as a bright, unwavering spot of light in the centre, planets still invisible. He nodded. Nothing. Nothing outside, anyway. Great. Think I'll have a drink to celebrate. Nysin nodded at Yalsen, then swung his thin body out through the doorway. Do you think it meant only you can go down, or all of us? Yalsin asked, still staring at the screen. Horza shook his head. I don't know. We'll go into orbit, then broadcast to the changer base shortly before we try taking the cat in. If Mr. Adequate doesn't like it, he'll let us know. You've decided it's mail, then, said Balveda, just as Yalsen said. Why not contact them now? I didn't like that bit about there being death here. Horza turned towards Yalsen. Balveda was at her side. The drone had floated down a little to eye level. Horza looked at Yalsen. Just as a precaution, I don't want to give anything away too soon. He turned his gaze to the culture woman. Last I heard, the regular transmission was due from the base on Shah's world a few days ago. I don't suppose you heard whether it had been received. Horza grinned at Balveda in a way that was meant to show he didn't expect an answer, or at least not a truthful one. The tall culture agent looked at the floor, seemed to shrug, then met Horza's eyes. I heard, she said. It was overdue. Horza stayed looking at her. Balveda didn't take her eyes away. Yalsen glanced from one to another. Eventually, the drone Unaha Klosp said, Frankly, none of this inspires confidence. My advice would be to... It stopped as Horza glared at it. Hmm, it said. Well, never mind that for now. It floated sideways to the door and went out. Seems to be okay. Wolfslin said, not apparently addressing anybody in particular. He sat back from the console, nodding to himself. Yes, ship's back to normal now. He turned round and smiled at the other three. They came for him. He was in a game hall playing floatball. He thought he was safe there, surrounded by friends in every direction. They seemed to float like a cloud of flies in front of him for a second. But he laughed that off, caught the ball, threw it and scored a point. But they came for him there. He saw them coming, two of them, from a door set in a narrow chimney of the spherical ribbed game hall. They wore cloaks of no colour and came straight toward him. He tried to float away, but his power harness was dead. He was stuck in mid-air, unable to make progress in any direction. He was trying to swim through the air and struggle out of his harness so that he could throw it at them, perhaps to hit, certainly to send himself off in the other direction, when they caught him. None of the people around him seemed to notice, and he realised suddenly they were not his friends, that in fact he didn't know any of them. They took his arms, and in an instant, without travelling past or through anything yet somehow making him feel they had turned an invisible corner to a place that was always there but out of sight, they were in an area of darkness. Their no-colour cloaks showed up in the darkness when he looked away. He was powerless, locked in stone, but he could see and breathe. Help me. That is not what we are here for. Who are you? You know. I don't. Then we can't tell you. What do you want? We want you. Why? Why not? But why me? You have no one. What? You have no one. What do you mean? No family, no friends, no religion, no belief. That's not true. How would you know? I believe in what? Me? That is not enough. Anyway, you'll never find it. What? Find what? Enough. Let's do it now. Do what? Take your name. I... And they reached together into his skull and took his name. So he screamed. Horza? Yalsen shook his head, bouncing it off the bulkhead at the top of the small bed. He spluttered awake, the whimper dying on his lips, his body tense for an instant, then soft. He put his hands out and touched the woman's furred skin. She put her hands behind his head and hugged him to her breast. He said nothing, but his heart slowed to the pace of hers. She rocked his body gently with her own, then pushed his head away, bent and kissed his lips. I'm all right now he told her. Just a nightmare. What was it? Nothing, he said. 
He put his head back to her chest, nestling it between her breasts like a huge, delicate egg. Horza had his suit on. Wobslin was in his usual seat. Yalsin occupied the co-pilot's chair. They were all suited up. Shah's world filled the screen in front of them. The belly sensors of the cat staring straight down at the sphere of white and grey beneath and magnifying it. One more time, Horza said. Wubslin transmitted the recorded message for the third time. Maybe they don't use that code anymore, Yalsen said. She watched the screen with her sharp browed eyes. She had cropped her hair back to about a centimetre over her skull, hardly thicker than the down which covered her body. The menacing effect jarred with the smallness of her head sticking out from the large neck of the suit. It's traditional, more of a ceremonial language than a code, Horsa said. They'll know it if they hear it. You're sure we're beaming it at the right place? Yes, Horsa said, trying to remain calm. They had been in orbit for less than half an hour, stationary above the continent which held the buried tunnels of the command system. Almost the whole of the planet was covered in snow. Ice locked the thousand-kilometre peninsula where the tunnel system lay fast in the sea itself. Shah's world had entered another of its periodic ice ages 7,000 years previously, and only in a relatively thin band around the equator, between the slightly wobbling planet's tropics, was their open ocean. It showed as a steely grey belt around the world, occasionally visible through walls of storm clouds. They were 25,000 kilometres out from the planet's snow-crusted surface, their communicator beaming down onto a circular area a few tens of kilometres in diameter, at a point midway between the two frozen arms of sea which gave the peninsula a slight waist. That was where the entrance to the tunnels lay. That was where the changes lived. Horsa knew he hadn't made a mistake, but there was no answer. There is death here, he kept thinking. A little of the planet's chill seemed to creep along his bones. Nothing, Wobslin said. Right, Horsa said, taking the manual controls into his gloved hands. We're going in. The clear air turbulence teased its warp fields out along the slight curve of the planet's gravity well, carefully edging itself down the slope. Horsa cut the motors and let them return to their emergency ready-only mode. They shouldn't need them now, and would soon be unable to use them as the gravity gradient increased. The cat fell with gradually increasing speed toward the planet, fusion motors at the ready. Horsa watched displays on the screens until he was satisfied they were on course. Then, with the planet seeming to turn a little beneath the craft, he unstrapped and went back to the mess. Avager, Nysin and Dorolo sat in their suits, strapped into the mess room seats. Peristek Balveda was also strapped in. She wore a thick jacket and matching trousers. Her head was exposed above the soft ruff of a white shirt. The bulky fabric jacket was fastened up to her throat. She had warm boots on, and a pair of hide gloves lay on the table in front of her. The jacket even had a little hood, which hung down her back. Horsa wasn't sure whether Balveda had chosen this soft, useless image of a spacesuit to make a point to him, or unconsciously, out of fear and a need for security. Unaha Klosp sat in a chair, strapped against its back, pointing straight up at the ceiling. I trust, it said. We're not going to have the same sort of flying circus job we had to endure the last time you flew this heap of debris. Horsa ignored it. We haven't had any word from Mr. Adequate, so it looks like we're all going down, he said. When we get there, I'll go in by myself to check things out. When I come back, we'll decide what we're going to do. That is, you'll decide, began the drone. What if you don't come back? Avager said. The drone made a hissing noise but went quiet. Horsa looked at the toy-like figure of the old man in his suit. I'll come back, Avager, he said. I'm sure everybody at the base will be fine. I'll get them to heat up some food for us. He smiled, but knew it wasn't especially convincing. Anyway, he went on, in the unlikely event there is anything wrong, I'll come straight back. Well, this ship's our only way off the planet, remember that, Hosa, Avager said. His eyes looked frightened. Dorolo touched him on the arm of his suit. Trust in God, Dorolo said. We'll be all right. She looked at Hosa. Won't we, Hosa? Hosa nodded. Yes, we'll be all right. We'll all be just fine. He turned and went back to the bridge. They stood in the high mountain snows, watching the midsummer sun sink in its own red seas of air and cloud. 
A cold wind blew her hair across her face, auburn over white, and he raised a hand without thinking to sweep it away again. She turned to him, her head nestling into his cupped hand and a smile on her face. So much for Midsummer's Day, she said. The day had been fair, still well below freezing, but mild enough for them to take their gloves off and push their hoods back. The nape of her neck was warm against his palm, and the lustrous, heavy hair brushed over the back of his hand as she looked up at him, skin white as snow, white as bone. That look again, she said softly. What look, he said defensively, knowing. The faraway one, she said, taking his hand and bringing it to her mouth, kissing it, stroking it as though it was a small, defenceless animal. Well, that's just what you call it. She looked away from him, toward the livid red ball of the sun, lowering behind the distant range. That's what I see, she told him. I know your looks by now. I know them all and what they mean. He felt a twinge of anger at being thought so obvious, but knew that she was right, at least partly. What she did not know about him was only what he did not know about himself. But that, he told himself, was quite a lot still. Perhaps she even knew him better than he did himself. I'm not responsible for my looks, he said after a moment, to make a joke of it. They surprise me too, sometimes. And what you do? she said, the sunset's glow rubbing false colour into her pale, thin face. Will you surprise your he told himself, was quite a lot still. Perhaps she even knew him better than he did himself. I'm not responsible for my looks, he said after a moment, to make a joke of it. They surprise me too, sometimes. And what you do? she said the sunset's glow rubbing false colour into her pale, thin face. Will you surprise yourself when you leave here? Why do you always assume I'm going to leave, he said, annoyed, stuffing his hands into the thick jacket's pockets and staring at the hemisphere of disappearing star. I keep telling you I'm happy here. Yes, she said, you keep telling me. Why should I want to leave? She shrugged, slipped one arm through his, put her head to his shoulder. Bright lights, big crowds, interesting times, other people. I'm happy here with you, he told her, and put his arm round her shoulders. Even in the bulky quilting of the jacket, she seemed slim, almost fragile. She said nothing for a moment. Then, in quite a different tone, and so you should be. She turned to face him, smiling. Now, kiss me. He kissed her, hugged her. Looking down over her shoulder, he saw something small and red move on the trampled snow near her feet. Look, he said, breaking away, stooping. She squatted beside him, and together they watched the tiny, stick-like insect crawl slowly, laboriously over the surface of the snow. One more living, moving thing on the blank face of the world. That's the first one I've seen, he told her. She shook her head, smiling. You just don't look, she chided. He put out one hand and scooped the insect into his palm before she could stop him. Oh, Horza, she said, her breath catching on a tiny hook of despair. He looked, uncomprehending, at her stricken expression, while the snow creature died from the warmth of his hand. The clear air turbulence dropped toward the planet, circling its ice-bright layers of atmosphere from day to night and back again, tipping over the equator and tropics as it spiralled in. Gradually. It encountered that atmosphere, ions and gases, ozone and air. It swooped through the world's thin wrapping with a voice of fire, flashing like a large, steady meteorite across the night sky, then across the dawn terminator, over steel-grey seas, tabular bergs, ice tables, flows and shelves, frozen coasts, glaciers, mountain ranges, permafrost tundra, more crushed pack ice, and, finally, as it bellied down on its pillars of flame, land again land on a thousand-kilometre peninsula, sticking out into a frozen sea like some monstrous fractured limb set in plaster. There it is, Wobslin said, watching the mass sensor screen. A bright, winking light tracked slowly across the display. Horza looked over. The mind, he asked. Wobslin nodded. Right density, five kilometres deep. He punched some buttons and squinted at figures scrolling across the screen on the far side of the system from the entrance, and moving. The pinpoint of light on the screen disappeared. Wobslin adjusted the controls, then sat back, shaking his head. Sensor needs an overhaul. Its range is right down. 
The engineer scratched his chest and sighed. Sorry about the engines too, Horza. The changer shrugged. Had the motors been working properly, or had the mass sensor's range been adequate, somebody could have remained on the cat, flying it if necessary, and relaying the mine's position to the others in the tunnels. Wibslin seemed to feel guilty that none of the repairs he'd tried to effect had significantly improved the performance of either motors or sensor. Never mind, Horza said, watching the waste of ice and snow passing beneath them. At least now we know the things in there. The ship guided them to the right area, though Horza recognised it anyway from the times he'd flown the single small flyer the base was allowed. He looked for the flyer as they made their final approach, in case somebody happened to be using it. The snow-covered plain was ringed by mountains. The clear air turbulence swept over a pass between two peaks, shattering the silence, tearing dusty snow from the jagged ridges and crags of the barren rocks on either side. It slowed further, coming in nose up on its tripod of fusion fire. The snow on the plain beneath picked itself up and stirred as though uneasy at first. Then, as the craft dropped lower and lower, the snow was blown, then ripped from the frozen ground beneath and thrown away in vast swirling rolls of heated air, mixing snow and water, steam and plasma particles, in a howling blizzard, which swept across the plain, gathering strength as the vessel dropped. Horza had the cat on manual. He watched the screen ahead, saw the false created wind of stormy snow and steam in front, and beyond it, the entrance to the command system. It was a black hole, set in a rugged promontory of rock, which fluted down from the higher cliffs behind, like a piece of solidified scree. The snowstorm broiled round the dark entrance like mist. The storm was turning brown as the fusion flame heated the frozen ground of the plain itself, melting it and plucking it out in an earthy spray. With hardly a bump, and only a little settling as the legs sank into the now soggy surface of the swept plain, the cat touched the surface of Shah's world. Horza looked straight ahead at the tunnel entrance. It was like a deep, dark eye staring back. The motors died, the steam drifted, disturbed snow fell back, and some new flakes formed as the suspended water in the air froze once more. The cat clicked and creaked as it cooled from the heat produced by both the friction of re-entry and its own plasma jets. Water gurgled, turning to slush over the scoured surface of the plain. Horza switched the cat's bow laser to standby. There was no movement or sign from the tunnel. The view was clear now, the snow and steam gone. It was a bright, sunny, windless day. Well, here we are, Horza said, and immediately felt foolish. Yalson nodded, still staring at the screen. Yep, Wobslin said, checking screens, nodding. Feet have sunk in half a metre or so. We'll have to remember to run the motors for a while before we try to lift off when we leave. They'll freeze solid in half an hour. Hmm, Horza said. He watched the screen. Nothing moved. There were no clouds in the light blue sky, no wind to move the snows. The sun wasn't warm enough to melt the ice and snow, so there was no running water, not even any avalanches in the distant mountains. With the exception of the seas, which still contained fish, but no longer any mammals, the only things which moved on Shah's world were a few hundred species of small insects, slow-spreading lichen on rocks near the equator, and the glaciers. The humanoids' war, or the Ice Age, had wiped everything else out. Horza tried the coded message once more. There was no reply. Right, he said, getting up from his seat. I'll step out and take a look. Wobslin nodded. Horza turned to Yalson. You're very quiet, he said. Yalson didn't look at him. She was staring at the screen and the unblinking eye of the tunnel entrance. Be careful, she said. She looked at him. Just be careful, all right? Horza smiled at her, picked up Craiglin's laser rifle from the floor, then went through to the mess. We're down, he said as he went through. See? Dorolo said to Avija. Nysin drank from his hip flask. Valveda gave the changer a thin smile as he went from one door to the other. Unahar Klosp resisted the temptation to say anything and wriggled out of the seat straps. Horza descended to the hangar. He felt light as he walked. They had switched to ambient gravity on the way over the mountains, and Shah's world produced less pull than their standard G used on the cat. 
Hauser rode the hangar's descending floor to the now refreezing marsh, where the breeze was fresh and sharp and clean. Hope everything's all right, Wibslin said, as he and Yelson watched the small figure wade through the snow toward the rocky promontory ahead. Yelson said nothing, but watched the screen with unblinking eyes. The figure stopped, touched its wrist, then rose in the air and floated slowly across the snows. Ha, <laughs> Wibslin said, laughing a little. I'd forgotten we could use A.G. here. Too long on that damn hole. Won't be much use in those fucking tunnels, Yelson muttered. Hauser landed just to the side of the tunnel entrance. From the readings he had already taken while flying over the snow, he knew the tunnel door field was off. Normally, it kept the tunnel within shielded from the snow and the cold air outside, but there was no field there, and he could see that a little snow had blown into the tunnel and now lay in a fan shape on its floor. The tunnel was cold inside, not warm as it should be, and its black, deep eye seemed more like a huge mouth now that he was close to it. He looked back at the cat, facing him from two hundred metres away, a shining metal interruption on the white expanse, squatting in a blast mark of brown. I'm going inside, he told the ship, aiming a tight beam at it rather than broadcasting the signal. OK, Wibslin said in his ear. You don't want somebody there to cover you? Yelson said. No, Hawes replied. He walked down the tunnel, keeping close to the wall. In the first equipment bay were some ice sleds and rescue gear, tracking apparatus and signal beacons. It was all much as he recalled it. In the second bay, where the flyer should have been, there was nothing. He went on to the next one, more equipment. He was about forty metres inside the tunnel now, ten metres shy of the right-angle turn which led into the larger, segmented gallery where the living accommodation of the base lay. The mouth of the tunnel was a white hole when he turned back to face it. He set the tight beam on wide aperture. Nothing yet. I'm about to look into the accommodation section. Bleep, but don't reply otherwise. The helmet speakers bleeped. Before going round the corner, he detached the suit's remote sensor from the side of the helmet and edged its small lens round the corner of sculpted rock. On an internal screen, he saw the short length of tunnel, the flyer lying on the ground, and a few metres beyond it, the wall of plastic planking, which filled the tunnel and showed where the human accommodation section of the changer base began. By the side of the small flyer lay four bodies. There was no movement. Hauser felt his throat closing up. He swallowed hard, then put the remote sensor back on the side of the helmet. He walked along the floor of fused rock to the bodies. Two were dressed in light, unarmoured suits. They were both men, and he didn't recognise them. One of them had been lasered. The suit flash-burned open, so that the melted metals and plastics had mingled with the guts and flesh inside. The hole was half a metre in diameter. The other suited man had no head. His arms were stuck out stiffly in front of him, as though to embrace something. There was another man, dressed in light, loose clothes. His skull had been smashed in from behind, and at least one arm was broken. He lay on his side, as frozen and dead as the other two. Hawser was aware that he knew the man's name, but he couldn't think of it just then. Kirachel must have been asleep. Her slim body was lying straight inside a blue nightgown. Her eyes were closed, her face peaceful. Her neck had been broken. Hauser looked down at her for a while, then took one of his gloves off and bent down. There was frost on her eyelashes. He was aware of the wrist seal inside the suit gripping his forearm tightly and of the thin cold air his hand was exposed to. Her skin was hard. Her hair was still soft and he let it run through his fingers. It was more red than he remembered, but that might just have been the effect of the helmet visor as it intensified the poor light of the darkened tunnel. Perhaps he should take his helmet off too to see her better and use the helmet lights. He shook his head, turning away. He opened the door to the accommodation section, carefully, after listening for any noise coming through the wall. In the open vaulted area, where the changers had kept their outdoor clothes and suits and some smaller pieces of equipment, there was little to show that the place had been taken over. Further through the accommodation unit, he found traces of a fight, dried blood, laser burns in the control room, where the base's systems were monitored. There had been an explosion. It looked like a small grenade had gone off under the control panel. That accounted for the lack of heating and the emergency light. 
It looked as though somebody had been trying to repair the damage, judging by some tools, spare pieces of equipment and wiring lying around. In a couple of the cabins, he found traces of Adiran occupation. The rooms had been stripped bare. Religious symbols were burned onto the walls. In another room, the floor had been covered with some sort of soft, deep covering like dry gelatin. There were six long indentations in the material, and the room smelled of medgel. In Kirachel's room, only the bed was untidy. It had changed little otherwise. He left it and went to the far end of the accommodation unit, where another wall of plastic boards marked the beginning of the tunnels. He opened the door cautiously. A dead medgel lay just outside, its long body seemingly pointing the way down the tunnel to the waiting shafts. Horza looked at it for a while, monitored its body for a moment, dead, still, frozen, then prodded it and finally shot it once through the head, just to be sure. It was in Standard Fleet Ground Force uniform and had been wounded some time ago, badly. It looked like it had suffered from frostbite earlier too, before it had died of its wounds and frozen. It was a male, grizzled, its green-brown skin leathery with age, its long muzzle face and small, delicate-looking hands deeply lined. He looked down the dark tunnel. Smooth, fused floor, smooth, arched walls, the tunnel went on into the mountainside. Blast doors made ribs along the tunnel sides, their tracks and slots carved across the floor and roof. He could see the elevator shaft doors and the boarding point for the service tube capsules. He walked along, past the sets of ancient blast doors, until he came to the access shafts. The elevators were all at the bottom. The transit tube was locked shut. No power seemed to be running through any of the systems. He turned and walked back to the accommodation section, through it, and past the bodies and the flyer without giving them a glance, and eventually out into the open air. He sat down at the side of the tunnel entrance in the snow, his back to the rock. They saw him from the cat, and Yalson said, Horza, are you all right? No, he said, turning the laser rifle off. No, I'm not. What's wrong? Yalson said quickly. Horza took the suit helmet off, putting it down on the snow beside him. The cold air sucked heat from his face, and he had to breathe hard in the thin atmosphere. There is death here, he said to the cloudless sky. Chapter 10 The Command System Batholith It's called a batholith, a granitic intrusion which rose up like a molten bubble into the sedimentary and metamorphic rocks already here a hundred million years ago. Eleven thousand years ago, the locals built the command system in it, hoping to use the rock cover as a protection from fusion warheads. They built nine stations and eight trains. The idea was that the politicos and military chiefs sat in one train, their seconds in command and deputies in another, and during a war all eight trains would be shuffled around the tunnels, halting in a station to be linked via hardened communication channels to the transceiver sites on the immediate surface and throughout the state so they could run the war. The enemy would have a hard time cracking the granite that deep anyway, but hitting something as relatively small as a station would be even more difficult and they never could be sure that there would be a train in it, or that it would be manned, and on top of that, they had to knock out the backup train as well as the main one. Germ warfare killed them all off, and sometime between then and ten thousand years ago, the Draesen moved in, pumping the air out of the tunnels and replacing it with inert gas. Seven thousand years ago, a new ice age started, and about four thousand years after that, the place got so cold, Mr. Adequate pumped the argon out and let the planet's own atmosphere back in. It's so desiccated, nothing's rusted in the tunnels for three millennia. About three and a half thousand years ago, the Draesen came to an agreement with most of the rival galactic federations, which allowed ships in distress to cross the quiet barriers. Politically neutral, relatively powerless species were permitted to set up small bases on most of the planets of the dead, to provide help for those in distress and, I suppose, to provide a sop to the people who had always wanted to know what the planets were like. Certainly on Shah's world, Mr. Adequate let us take a good look at the system every year, and turned a blind eye when we went down unofficially. However, nobody's ever taken unscrambled recordings of any sort out of the tunnels. The entrance we're at is here, at the base of the peninsula, above Station 4, one of the three main stations. The others are 1 and 7, where repair and maintenance facilities exist. There are no trains parked in 4, 3 or 5. There are two trains in Station 1, two in seven, one train each in the rest. 
At least, that's where they ought to be. The Adirans may have moved them, though I doubt it. The stations are twenty-five to thirty-five kilometres apart, linked by twin sets of tunnels, which only join up at each of the stations. The whole system is buried about five kilometres down. We'll take lasers and a neural stunner, plus chaff grenades for protection, nothing heavier. Nysin can take his projectile rifle, the bullets he has are only light explosive, but no plasma cannons or micronukes. They'd be dangerous enough in the tunnels anyway, God knows, but they might also bring down Mr. Adequate's wrath, and we don't want that. Wubslin's rigged up our ship mass anomaly sensor into a portable set so we can spot the mind. In addition, I've got a mass sensor in my suit, so we shouldn't have any problem actually finding what we're after, even if it's hidden itself. Assuming the Adirans don't have their own communicators, they'll be using the changes. Our transceivers cover their frequencies and more, so we can listen in on them, but they can't hear us. So, those are the tunnels. That mind is in there somewhere, and so presumably are some Idirans and Medjel. Horza stood in the mess room at the head of the table, under the screen. On the screen, a diagram of the tunnels was superimposed over a map of the peninsula. The others looked at him. The empty semi-suit of the Medjel he had found lay in the centre of the table. You want to take us all in, the drone Unaha Klosp said. Yes. What about the ship? Nysen said. It can take care of itself. I'll program its automatic so that it'll recognise us and defend itself against anybody else. And you're going to take her? Yelson asked, nodding at Belveda, who was sitting opposite her. Horza looked at the culture woman. I prefer to have Balveda where I can see her, he said. I wouldn't feel safe leaving her here with any of you. I still don't see why I have to go, Unaha Klosp said. Because, Horza told it, I don't trust you on board here either. Besides, I want you to carry stuff. What? The drone sounded angry. I don't know that you're being completely honest here, Horza, Avadya said, shaking his head ruefully. You say that the Adirans and Medjel... Well, that you're on their side. But here they are, and they've killed four of your own people already, and you think that they're somewhere inside these tunnels wandering about. And they're supposed to be about the best ground troops in the galaxy. You want to send us up against them? First of all, was aside, I am on their side. We're after the same thing. Secondly, it looks to me as though they don't have many weapons of their own, otherwise that Medjel would certainly have been armed. All they probably have here are the changes' weapons. Also, it looks from this Medjel suit we've got. He gestured at the webbed apparatus in the middle of the table, which he and Wubslin had been studying since they'd brought it on board. Like a lot of their equipment is blown. Only the lights and the heaters on this thing were working. Everything else had fused. My guess is all that happened when they came through the quiet barrier. They were all zapped inside the Chihurtzi, and their battle gear was fucked up. If the same thing happened to their weapons as happened to their suits, they're virtually unarmed and with a lot of problems. With all these fancy new AG harnesses and lasers, we're much better equipped even in the unlikely event that it does come to a fight. Which is very likely, considering they won't have any communicators left, Malveda said. You'll never get close enough to tell them, and even if you did, how are they supposed to know you're who you say you are? If they're the same lot you think they are, they came in here just after the mine did. They won't even have heard of you. They certainly won't believe you. The culture agent looked round the others. Your surrogate captain is leading you to your deaths. Balveda, Horsa said, I'm doing you a courtesy letting you in on all this. Don't annoy me. Balveda arched her eyebrows, staying silent. How do we know these are the same lot who got here inside this weird animal anyway? Nysin said. He looked suspiciously at Horsa. They can't be anybody else, Horsa said. They were damn lucky to survive what the Dryasen did to them, and even the Adirans wouldn't risk sending any other forces in after they saw what had happened to this lot. But that means they've been here for months, Dorolo said. How are we supposed to find something if they've been here all this time and haven't found anything? Perhaps they have, Horsa said, spreading his arms wide and smiling at the woman, a trace of sarcasm in his voice. But if they haven't, it's very possible because they won't have any working gear with them. They'd have to search the whole command system. Besides, if that warp animal was as badly damaged as I heard it was, they won't have had much control over it. Very likely they crash-landed hundreds of kilometres away and had to slog here through the snow. In that case, they might have only been here for a few days. I can't believe the god would let this happen, 
Dorolo said, shaking her head and looking at the surface of the table in front of her. There must be something else to all this. I could feel its power and... and goodness when we came through the barrier. It wouldn't let those poor people just be shot down like that. Horza rolled his eyes. Dorolo, he said to her, leaning forward and planting his knuckles on the tabletop. The Draazen are barely aware there's a war going on. They don't really give a damn about individuals. They recognize death and decay, but not hope and faith. As long as the Adirans, or we, don't wreck the command system or blow the planet away, they won't give a damn who lives or dies. Thorolo sat back, silent but unconvinced. Horza straightened. His words sounded fine. He had the impression the mercenaries would follow him, but inside... Deeper than where the words were coming from, he felt no more caring, no more alive than the snow-covered plain outside. He, Wobslin and Nysin, had gone back into the tunnels. They had investigated the accommodation section and found more evidence of Adirin habitation. It looked as though a very small force, one or two Adirans and maybe half a dozen Medjel, had stayed for a while at the changer base after they had taken it over. They had apparently taken a lot of freeze-dried emergency food supplies with them, the two laser rifles and the few small pistols the changer base was allowed, and the four portable communication sets from the storeroom. Horza had covered the dead changes up with the reflector foil they had found in the base, and removed the semi-suit from the dead medgel. They had looked at the flyer to see if it was serviceable. It wasn't. Its micropile had been partially removed and badly damaged in the process. Like almost everything else in the base, it was without power. Back on board the clear air turbulence, Horza and Wobslin had dissected the Medjel's suit and discovered the subtle but irreparable damage which had been inflicted on it. All the time, whenever Horza wasn't worrying about what their chances and their choices were, each moment he stopped concentrating on what he was looking at or supposed to be thinking about, he saw a hard and frozen face at right angles to the body it was attached to, with frost on the eyelashes. He tried not to think about her. There was no point, nothing he could do. He had to go on. He had to see this through even more so now. He had thought for a long time about what he could do with the rest of the people on a clear air turbulence and decided he had no real choice but to take them all into the command system with him. Balveda was one problem. He wouldn't feel safe even leaving the whole crew to guard her and he wanted the best fighters along with him, not stuck on the ship. He could have got round this problem just by killing the culture agent but the others had got too used to her had come to like her just a little too much. If he killed her, he would lose them. Well, I think it's insanity to go down into those tunnels, Unaha Klosp said. Why not just wait up here until the Adirans reappear, with or without this precious mind? First of all, Horza said, watching the expressions on the others' faces for any sign of agreement with the drone, if they don't find it, they probably won't reappear. These are Adirans, and a carefully chosen crack squad of them at that. They'll stay down there forever. He looked at the tunnel system drawn on the screen, then back at the people and the machine around the table. They could search for a thousand years in there, especially if the power's off, and they don't know how to bring it back up, which I'm assuming they don't. And you do, of course, the machine said. Yes, Horza said, I do. We can turn the power on at one of three stations, this one, number seven, or number one. It still works. Woobslin looked sceptical. Well, it was working when I left. Deep geothermal producing electricity. The power shafts are sunk about a hundred kilometres through the crust. Anyway, as I say, there's too much space down there for those Idirans and Medjel to have a hope of searching properly without some sort of detection device. A mass anomaly sensor is the only one that'll work, and they can't have one. We have two. That's why we have to go in. And fight, Dorolo said. Probably not. They've taken communicators. I'll get in touch with them and explain who I am. Naturally, I can't tell you the details, but I know enough about the Adirin military system, about their ships, even some of their personnel, to be able to convince them I am who I say I am. They won't know me personally, but they were told a changer would be sent later. Liar, Malveda said. Her voice was cold. Horza felt the atmosphere in the mess change, become tense. The culture woman was looking at him, her features set, determined, even resigned. Balveda, he said softly, I don't know what you were told, but I was briefed on the hand of God, 
and Zora Lundra told me the Adirin ground force in the Chihutsi knew I'd been sent for. He said it calmly. Okay. That wasn't what I heard, Valveda said, but he sensed she was not totally sure of herself. She had risked a lot to say that, probably hoping that he would at least threaten her or do something which would turn the others against him. It hadn't worked. Horza shrugged. I can't help it if the special circumstances section can't brief you accurately, Peristek, he said, smiling thinly. The culture agent's eyes looked away from the changer's face at the table, then at each of the other people sitting around it, as though testing them to see who they each believed. Look, Horza said in his most honest-sounding and reasonable voice, spreading his hands out. I don't want to die for the Adirans, and God knows why, but I've come to like you lot. I wouldn't take you in there on a suicide mission. We'll be all right. If the worst comes to the worst, we can always pull out. We'll take the cat back through the quiet barrier and head for somewhere neutral. You can have the ship. I'll have a captured culture agent. He looked at Balveda, who was sitting in her seat with her legs crossed, her arms folded and her head down. But I don't think it'll come to that. I think we'll catch this glorified computer and be well rewarded for it. What if the cultures won the battle outside the barrier? And they're waiting for us when we come out, with or without the mind, Yelson asked. She didn't sound hostile, just interested. She was the only one he felt he could rely on, though he thought Wubslin would follow too. Horza nodded. That's unlikely. I can't see the culture falling back all over this volume but holding out here. But even if they did, they'd have to be very lucky indeed to catch us. They can only see into the barrier in real space, don't forget, so they'd have no warning of where we'd be coming out. No problem there. Yalson sat back, apparently convinced. Horza knew he looked calm, but inside he was tensed up, waiting for the mood of the rest to make itself clear. His last answer had been truthful, but the rest were either not the whole truth or lies. He had to convince them. He had to have them on his side. There was no other way he could carry out his mission, and he had come too far, done too much, killed too many people, sunk too much of his own purpose and determination into the task to back out now. He had to track the mine down. He had to go into the command system, Idirans or no Idirans, and he had to have the rest of what had been Kraklin's free company with him. He looked at them, at Yalson, severe and impatient, wanting the talking to stop and the job just to be got on with, her shadow of hair making her look both very young, almost childlike, and hard at the same time. Dorolo, her eyes uncertain, looking at the others, scratching one of her convoluted ears nervously. Wubslin, slumped comfortably in his seat, compressed, his stocky frame radiating relaxation. Wubslin's face had shown signs of interest when Horza described the command system, and the change of guest, the engineer, found the whole idea of this gigantic train set fascinating. Avager looked very dubious about the whole venture, but Horza thought that now he'd made it clear nobody was going to be allowed to stay on the ship, the old man would accept this rather than go to the trouble of arguing about it. Nysin he wasn't sure about. He had been drinking as much as ever, been quieter than Horza remembered him, but while he didn't like being bossed around and told what he could and couldn't do, he was obviously fed up being stuck on the clear air turbulence and had already been out for a walk in the snow while Wubslin and Horza were looking at the Medjel suit. Boredom would make him follow, if nothing else. Horza wasn't worried about the machine, Unaha Klosp. It would do as it was told, like machines always did. Only the culture let them get so fancy they really did seem to have wills of their own. As for Peristek Balveda, she was his prisoner. It was as simple as that. Easy in, easy out, Yasin said. She smiled, shrugged, and looking round at the other said, What the fuck? It's something to do, isn't it? Nobody disagreed. Horza was reprogramming the cat's fidelities once more, entering the computer's new instructions through a worn but still serviceable touchboard, when Yalson came onto the flight deck. She slipped into the co-pilot seat and watched the man as he worked. The touchboard's illuminated display threw the shadows of Moraine characters over his face. After a while, she said, looking at the markings on the illuminated board, Moraine, eh? Horza shrugged. It's the only accurate language I and this antique share. He tapped some more instructions in. Hey, he turned to her. You shouldn't be in here when I'm doing this. He smiled to show her he wasn't serious. Don't you trust me? Yasin said, smiling back. You're the only one I do, Horza said, 
turning to the board again. It doesn't matter anyway for these instructions. Yalson watched him for a little longer. Did she mean a lot to you, Hosa? He didn't look up, but his hands paused over the touchboard. He stared at the illuminated characters. Who? Horza, Yalson said gently. He still didn't look at her. We were friends, he said, as though talking to the touchboard. Yeah, well, she said after a pause. I suppose it must be pretty hard anyway, when it's your own people. Horza nodded, still not looking up. Yalson studied him for a little longer. Did you love her? He didn't reply immediately. His eyes seemed to inspect each of the precise, compact shapes in front of him, as though one of them concealed the answer. He shrugged. Maybe, he said. Once. He cleared his throat, looked briefly round at Yalson, then leaned back to the touchboard. That was a long time ago. Yalson got up then, as he went back to his task, and put her hands on his shoulders. I'm sorry, Horsa. He nodded again and placed one hand over hers. We'll get them, she said, if that's what you want. You and... He shook his head, looked round at her. No, we go for the mind, that's all. If the Adirans do get in the way, I won't care, but... No, there's no point in risking more than we have to. Thanks, though. She nodded slowly. That's all right. She bent, kissed him briefly, then went out. The man gazed at the closed door for a few moments, then turned back to the board full of alien symbols. He programmed the ship's computer to fire warning, then lethal laser shots at anybody or anything approaching it unless they could be identified by the distinctive electromagnetic emission signature of the suit as one of the free company. In addition, it required Hawser's, Kraklin's identity ring, to make the cat's elevator work and, once on board, to take control of the ship itself. Hawser felt safe enough doing this, only the ring would let them take over the ship, and he was confident nobody could take that from him, not without a greater risk to themselves than even a squad of mean and hungry Adirans could provide. But it was possible that he might be killed, and the others might survive. Especially for Yalson, he wanted them to have some sort of escape route that didn't depend totally on him. They took down some of the plastic boarding in the changer base so that if they did find the mind, they'd be able to get it through. Dorolo wanted to bury the dead changers, but Horza refused. He carried each of them to the tunnel entrance and left them there. He would take them with him when they left, return them to Hebor. The natural freezer of Shah's world's atmosphere would preserve them until then. He looked down at Kirakel's face for a moment, in the waning light of late afternoon, while a bank of clouds coming in from the frozen sea built over the distant mountains and the wind freshened. He would get the mind. He was determined to, and he felt it in his bones. But if it came to a firefight with the ones who had done this, he wouldn't shrink from it. He might even enjoy it. Perhaps Balveda wouldn't have understood, but there were Idirans and Idirans. Zorolundra was a friend, and a kind and humane officer. He supposed the old Quirl would be considered a moderate, and Horsa knew others in the military and diplomatic missions whom he liked. But there were Idirans who were real fanatics, who despised all other species. Zorolundra would not have murdered the changes. It would have been unnecessary and inelegant. But then, you didn't send moderates on missions like this. You sent fanatics, or a changer. Horza returned to the others. He got as far as the crippled flyer, now surrounded with the plastic boarding they had removed and facing the hole in the accommodation section as though it was about to enter a garage, when he heard firing. He ran through the corridor leading to the rear of the section, readying his gun. What is it? he said into his helmet mic. Laser, down the tunnel from the shafts, Yalson's voice said. He ran into the open storeroom area where the others were. The hole they had opened in the plastic boarding was four or five metres wide. As soon as Horsa came through from the corridor, flame splashed from the wall alongside him, and he saw the brief airglows of laser tracks just to one side of his suit, leading back through the gap in the wall and down the tunnel. Obviously, whoever was doing the shooting could see him. He rolled to one side and came up by Dorolo and Balveda, who were sheltering by a large portable winch. Holes burst through the wall of plastic boards, burning brightly then going out. The whoop of laser fire echoed down the tunnels. 
What happened? Hauser said to Dorolo. He looked around the storage area. The rest were all there, taking cover where they could, apart from Yalson. Yalson went, Dorolo began, then Yalson's voice cut in. I came through the hole in the wall and got shot at. I'm lying on the ground, I'm okay, but I'd like to know if it's all right to fire back. I won't damage anything, will I? Fire, Hauser yelled, as another fan of glowing tracks spattered a line of burning craters over the inside wall of the storeroom. Fire back! Thanks, Yelson said. Hauser heard the woman's gun snap, then the Doppler echo of sound produced by superheated air. Explosions crashed from down the tunnel. Hmm, Yelson said. Think that's got... Nysen said from the far side of the storage area. His voice cut off as more fire slammed into the wall behind him. The wall was pockmarked with dark, bubbling holes. Bastard, Yalson said. She fired back in short, rapid bursts. Keep his head down, Hauser told her. I'm coming forward to the wall. Dorolo, stay here with Balveda. He got up and ran to the edge of the hole in the plastic boards. Smoking holes in the material showed how little protection it afforded but he knelt there in its cover anyway. He could see Yalson's feet a few metres out into the tunnel, spread on the smooth, fused floor. He listened to her gun firing, then said, Right, stop long enough to let me see where it's coming from, then hit it again. OK. Yalson stopped firing. Hauser stuck his head out, feeling incredibly vulnerable, saw a couple of tiny sparks far down the tunnel and off to one side. He brought the gun up and fired continually. Yalson started again as well. His suit chirped, a screen lit up by his cheek, showing he'd been hit on the thigh. He couldn't feel anything. The side of the tunnel, far down at the elevator shafts, pulsated with a thousand sparks of light. Nysin appeared at the other side of the gap in the boards, kneeling like Hauser and firing his projectile rifle. The side of the tunnel detonated with flashes and smoke. Shockwaves blew up the tunnel, shaking the plastic boarding and ringing in Hauser's ears. Enough! he shouted. He stopped firing. Yalson stopped. Nysin put in one final burst, then stopped too. Hauser ran out through the gap, across the dark rock floor of the tunnel outside, and over to the side wall. He flattened himself there, getting some cover from the slight protrusion of a blast door's edge further down the tunnel. Where their target had been, there was a scatter of dull red shards lying on the tunnel floor, cooling from the yellow heat of the laser fire which had torn them from the wall. On the helmet night sight, Hauser could see a series of rippling waves of warm smoke and gas flowing silently under the roof of the tunnel from the damaged area. Yalson, get over here, he said. Yalson rolled over and over until she bumped into the wall just behind him. She got quickly to her feet and flattened out beside him. I think we got it, Hauser broadcasted. Nysin, still kneeling at the gap in the boarding, looked out. The rapid-fire micro-projectile rifle waving to and fro, as though its owner expected a further attack from out of the tunnel walls. Hauser started forward, keeping his back to the wall. He got to the edge of the blast door. Most of its metre-thick bulk was stowed in its recess in the wall, but about half a metre protruded. Hauser looked down the tunnel again. The wreckage was still glowing, like hot coals scattered on the tunnel floor. The wave of hot black smoke passed overhead, wafting slowly up the tunnel. Hauser looked to his other side. Yalson had followed him. Stay here, he said. He walked down the side of the wall to the first of the elevator shafts. They had been firing at the third and last one, judging by the grouping of the craters and scars all around its open, buckled doors. Hauser saw a half-melted laser carbine lying in the middle of the tunnel floor. He poked his head out from the wall, frowning. Right on the very lip of the elevator shaft, between the scarred and holed doors, surrounded by a sea of dull, red glowing wreckage, he was sure he could see a pair of hands. Gloved, stubby fingered, injured, one finger was missing from the glove nearer him, but hands without a doubt. It looked like somebody was hanging inside the shaft by the tips of their fingers. He focused the tight beam of his communicator, aiming in the direction he was looking at. Hello? he said in a dirin. Medjel. Medjel in the elevator shaft. Do you hear me? Report at once. The hands didn't move. He edged closer. What was it? Wobson's voice came through the speakers. Just a moment, Hauser said. He went closer, rifle ready. One of the hands moved slightly, as though trying to get a better grip on the lip of the tunnel floor. Hauser's heart thudded. 
he went toward the tall open doors, his feet crunching on the warm debris. He saw semi-seated arms as he went closer, then the top of a long, laser-scarred helmet. With a rasping noise he had heard Megel make when they charged during a battle, a third hand, he knew it was a foot, but it looked like a hand, and it was holding a small pistol, flashed up from the elevator shaft at the same time as the Megel's head looked up and out, straight at him. He started to duck. The pistol cracked, its plasma bolt missing him by only a few centimetres. Horsa shot quickly, ducking and going to one side. Fire blew out all around the lip of the elevator, smashing into the gloves. With a scream, the gloved hands vanished. Light flickered briefly in the circular shaft. Horsa ran forward, stuck his head between the doors and looked down. The dim shape of the falling medgel was lit by the guttering fire still burning on its suit gloves. Somehow it still held the plasma pistol. As it fell, screaming, it fired the small weapon, the cracks of its shots and the flashes from the bolts drawing further away as the creature holding it, firing it, whirled, its six limbs flailing, down into the darkness. Horza? Yelson shouted. Are you all right? What the fuck was that? I'm fine, he said. The medgel was a tiny wriggling shape, deep in the shaft's tunnel of vertical night. Its scream still echoed, the microscopic sparks of its burning hands and the firing plasma pistol still flaring. Horsa looked away. A few small thuds recorded the hapless creature's contact with the sides of the shaft as it dropped. What's that noise? Durolo said. The medgel was still alive. It shot at me, but I got it, Horsa told them walking away from the open elevator doors. It fell. It's still falling, down the elevator shaft. Shit, breathed Nysin, still listening to the faint, fading, echoing screams. How deep is that? Ten kilometres if none of the blast doors are shut, Horsa said. He looked at the external controls for the other two lifts and the transit capsule entrance. They had escaped more or less undamaged. The doors leading to the transit tubes were open. They had been closed when Horsa inspected the area earlier. Yalson shouldered her gun and walked down the tunnel toward Horsa. Well, she said, let's get this up on the road. Yeah, Nyson said. What the hell? These guys aren't so tough after all. That's one down already. Yeah, deep down, Yalson said. Horsa inspected the damage to his suit while the others came down the tunnel. There was a burn on the right thigh, a millimetre deep and a couple of finger breadths wide. Save for the unlikely chance of another shot falling on the same place, it hadn't harmed the suit. A fine start, if you ask me, the drone muttered as it started down the tunnels with the others. Horsa went back to the tall, buckled, pitted doors of the lift shaft and looked down. With the magnifier up full, he could just make out a tiny sparkling, deep, deep below. The helmet's external mics picked up a noise, but from so far away and so full of echoes, it sounded like nothing more than the wind starting to moan through a fence. They clustered in front of the open doors of an elevator shaft, not the one the medgel had fallen down. The doors were twice the height of any one of them, dwarfing them all as though they were children. Horsa had opened those doors, taken a good look, floated down on the suit's AG a little way, then come back up. It all looked safe. I'll go first, he told the assembled group. If we hit any trouble, let off a couple of chaff grenades and get back up here. We're going to the main system level, about five kilometres down. Once we get through the doors, that's us more or less in Station 4. From there, we'll be able to turn on the power, something the Adirans haven't been able to do. After that, we'll have transport in the form of transit tube capsules. What about the trains? Wibslin asked. The transit tubes are faster, Horsa said. We might have to start a train up if we capture the mind. Depends exactly how big it is. Besides, unless they've moved them since I was here, the nearest trains will be at Station 2 or Station 6, not here. But there is a spiral tunnel at Station 1 we could bring a system train up. What about the transit tube up here? Yalson said. If that's the way that Magiel suddenly appeared, what's to stop another one hiking up the tunnel? Horsa shrugged. Nothing. I don't want to fuse the doors closed in case we want to come back that way once we have the mind. But if one of them does come up that way, so what? It'll be one less down there for us to worry about. Anyway, somebody can stay up here until we're all safely down the lift shaft, then follow us. But I don't think there'll be another one so close behind that one. Yes, 
That one you didn't manage to talk into believing you were both on the same side, the drone said testily. Hawser squatted down on his haunches to look at the drone. It was invisible from above because of the pallet of equipment it was carrying. That one, he said, didn't have a communicator, did it? Whereas any Adirans down there certainly will have the ones they took from the base, won't they? And Medjel do as Adirans tell them to, right? He waited for the machine to reply, and when it didn't, he repeated, Right? Hawser had the impression that, had the drone been human, it would have spat. Whatever you say, sir, the drone said. And what do I do, Hawser? Balveda said, standing in her fabric jumpsuit, wearing a fur jacket on top. Do you intend to throw me down the shaft and say you forgot I didn't have any AG? Or do I have to walk down the transit tunnel? You'll come with me. And if we hit trouble, you'll... What? Balveda asked. I don't think we'll hit any trouble, Hawser said. You're sure there are no AG harnesses in the base? Avager said. Hawser nodded. If there had been, don't you think one of the medjel we've encountered so far would have had them on? Maybe the Adelans are using them. They're too heavy. They could use two, Avager insisted. There were no harnesses, Hawser said through his teeth. We were never allowed any. We weren't supposed to go into the command system apart from yearly inspections when we could power everything up. We did go in. We walked down the spiral to Station 4 like that medjel must have slogged up, but we weren't supposed to, and we weren't allowed gravity harnesses. They'd have made getting down there too easy. Damn it, let's get down there, Yasin said impatiently, looking at the others. Avager shrugged. If my AG fails with all this rubbish I'm carrying, the drone began, its voice muffled by the pallet over its top surface. You drop any of that stuff down that shaft and you'd be as well to follow it, machine, Hawser said. Now just save your energy for floating, not talking. You'll follow me. Keep five or six hundred metres up. Yalson, will you stay up here till we get the doors open? Yalson nodded. The rest of you, he looked round them, come after the drone. Don't bunch up too much, but don't get separated. Wubslin, stay at the same level as the machine and have chaff grenades ready. Hawser held his hand out to Balveda. Madame? He held Balveda to him. She rested her feet on his boots, facing away from him. Then Hawser stepped into the shaft, and they descended together into the night dark depths. See you at the bottom, Nysin said in the helmet speakers. We're not going to the bottom, Nysin, Hawser sighed, shifting his arm slightly around Balveda's waist. We're going to the main system level. I'll see you there. Yeah, okay, wherever. They fell on AG without incident, and Hawser forced open the doors at the system level five kilometres below in the rock. There had been only one exchange with Balveda on the way down, a minute or so after they had started out. Hawser? What? If any shooting starts, from down there, or anything happens and you have to let go, I mean, drop me. What, Balveda? Kill me. I'm serious, shoot me. I'd rather that than fall all that way. Nothing, Hawser said after a moment's thought, would give me greater pleasure. They dropped into the chill stone silence of the tunnel's black throat, clasped like lovers. God damn it. Hawser said softly. He and Wubslin stood in a room just off the dark, echoing vault that was Station 4. The others were waiting outside. The lights on Hawser and Wubslin's suits illuminated a space packed with electric switching gear. The walls were covered with screens and controls. Thick cables snaked over the ceiling and along the walls, and metal floor plates covered conduits filled with more electrical equipment. There was a smell of burning in the room. A long, black, sooty scar had printed itself onto one wall, above charred and melted cabling. They had noticed the smell on their walk through the connecting tunnels from the shaft to the station. Hawser had smelled it and felt gall rise in his throat. The odour was faint and could not have turned the most sensitive of stomachs, but Hawser had known what it meant. Think we can mend it? Wooblin asked. Hawser shook his head. Probably not. This happened once on a yearly test when I was here before. We powered up in the wrong sequence and blew that same cable run. If they've done what we did, there'll be worse damage further down in the deeper levels. It took us weeks to repair it. Hawser shook his head. Damn, he said. I guess it was pretty smart of those Adirans to figure out as much as they did, Wubslin said, opening his visor to reach in and scratch his head awkwardly. I mean, to get this far. 
Yes, Halsey said, kicking a large transformer. Too goddamn smart. They made a brief search of the station complex, then gathered again in the main cavern and crowded round the jury rig mass sensor Wubslet had removed from the clear air turbulence. Wires and light fibres were tangled about it, and attached to the top of the machine was a cannibalised screen from the ship's bridge, now plugged directly into the sensor. The screen lit up. Wubslin fiddled with its controls. The screen hologram showed a diagrammatic representation of a sphere with three axes shown in perspective. That's about four kilometres, Wubslin said. He seemed to be talking to the mass sensor, not to the people around it. Let's try eight. He touched the controls again. The number of lines on the axes doubled. One very faint smudge of light blinked near the edge of the display. Is that it? Dorolo said. Is that what it is? No, Wubslin said, fiddling with the controls again, trying to get the little patch of light to become clearer. Not dense enough. Wubslin doubled the range twice more, but only the single trace remained submerged in clutter. Horza looked round, orienting himself with the grid pattern shown on the screen. Would that thing be fooled by a pile of uranium? Oh, yeah, Wubslin said, nodding. The power we're putting through it, any radiation will upset it a bit. That's why we're down to roughly thirty kilometres maximum anyway, see? Just because of all this granite. Yeah, if there's a reactor, even an old one, it'll show up when the sensor's reader waves get to it. But just like this is a patch. If this mine's only fifteen metres long and weighs ten thousand tonnes, it'll be really bright, like a star on the screen. OK, Horsa said. That's probably just the reactor down at the deepest service level. Oh, Wubson said. They had reactors too. Back up, Horsa said. That one was for ventilation fans if the natural circulation couldn't cope with smoke or gas. The trains have reactors too in case the geothermal failed. Horsa checked the reading on the screen with a built-in mass sensor in his suit, but the faint trace of the backup reactor was out of its range. Should we investigate this one? Wubson asked, his face lit by the glowing screen. Horsa straightened up, shaking his head. No, he said wearily, not for now. They sat in the station and had something to eat. The station was over three hundred metres long and twice the width of the main tunnels. The metal rails the command system trains ran on stretched across the level floor of fused rock in double tracks, appearing from one wall through an inverted U and disappearing through another, toward the repair and maintenance area. At either end of the station there were sets of gantries and ramps which rose almost to the roof. Those provided access to the two upper floors of the trains when they were in the station, Horser explained, when Nysen asked about them. I can't wait to see these trains, Wilson mumbled, mouthful. You won't be able to see them if there's no light, Avager told him. I think it's intolerable that I have to go on carrying all that junk, the drone said. It had set the equipment-loaded pallet down, and now I'm told I have to carry even more weight. I'm not that heavy, Unaha Klosp, said Balveda. You'll manage, Horza told the machine. With no power, the only thing they could do was use their suits AG to float along to the next station. It would be slower than the transit tube, but quicker than walking. Balveda would have to be carried by the drone. Horza, I was wondering, Yasen said. What? How much radiation have we all soaked up recently? Not much. Horza checked the small screen inside his helmet. The radiation level wasn't dangerous. The granite around them gave off a little, but even if they hadn't been seated up, they'd have been in no real danger. Why? Nothing. Yelson shrugged. Just with all these reactors and this granite and that blast when the bomb went off and the gear you vacked from the cat, well, I thought we might have taken a dose. Being on the megaship when Lamb tried to blow it apart didn't help either, but if you say we're okay, we're okay. Unless somebody's particularly sensitive to it, we haven't got much to worry about. Yelson nodded. Horza was wondering whether they should split up. Should they all go together, or should they go in two groups, one down each of the foot tunnels which accompanied the main line and the transit tube? They could even split up further and have somebody go down each of the six tunnels which led from station to station. That was going too far, but it showed how many possibilities there were. Split up, they might be better placed for a flanking attack if one group encountered the Adirans, though they wouldn't initially have the same firepower. They wouldn't be increasing their chances of finding the mind, not if the mass sensor was working properly, but they would be increasing their chances of stumbling into the Adirans in the first place. Staying together, though, in the one tunnel, gave Horsa a feeling of claustrophobic foreboding. One grenade could wipe them out, 
A single fan of heavy laser fire would kill or disable all of them. It was like being set a cunning but unlikely problem in one of the Haybor Military Academy's term exams. He couldn't even decide which way to head. When they'd searched the station, Yalson had seen marks in the thin layer of dust on the foot tunnel floor leading to Station 5, which suggested the Adherents had gone that way. But ought they to follow, or should they go in the opposite direction? If they followed, and he couldn't convince the Adherents he was on their side, they'd have to fight. But if they went in the other direction and turned the electricity on at Station 1, they'd be giving power to the Adherents as well. There was no way of restricting the energy to one part of the command system. Each station could isolate its section of track from the supply loop, but the circuitry had been designed so that no single traitor or incompetent could cut off the whole system. So the Adherents, too, would have use of the transit tubes, the trains themselves, and the engineering workshops. Better to find them and try to parley, settle the issue one way or the other. Hawser shook his head. This whole thing was too complicated. The command system with its tunnels and caverns, its levels and shafts, its sidings and loops and crossovers and points seemed like some infernal closed-circuit flowchart for his thoughts. He would sleep on it. He needed sleep now like the rest of them. He could sense it in them. The machine might get run down, but it didn't need sleep, and Balveda still seemed alert enough, but all the rest were showing signs of needing a deeper rest than just sitting down. According to their body clocks, it was time to sleep. He would be foolish to try to push them further. He had a restrainer harness on the pallet. That should keep Balveda secure. The machine could stand guard, and he would use the remote sensor on his suit to watch for movement in the immediate area where they slept. They ought to be safe enough. They finished their meal. Nobody disagreed with the idea of turning in. Balveda was trussed in the restrainer harness and barricaded in one of the empty storerooms off the platform. Unaha Klosp was told to sit itself up on one of the tall gantries and stay still unless it heard or saw anything untoward. Horza set his remote sensor near where he would sleep, on one of the lower girders of a hoist mechanism. He had wanted a word with Yalsen, but by the time he had finished making all these arrangements, several of the others, including Yalsen, had fallen asleep already, lying back against the wall or laid out on the ground. Their visors blanked or their heads turned away from the weak lights of the others' suits. Horza watched Wubslin wander around the station for a bit. Then the engineer too lay down, and everything was still. Horza switched the remote sensor on, primed to alarm if it sensed anything above a certain low level of movement. He slept fitfully. His dreams woke him. Ghosts chased him in echoing docks and silent deserted ships, and when he turned to face them, their eyes were always waiting like targets, like mouths, and the mouths swallowed him so that he fell into the eye's black mouth, past ice rimming it, dead ice rimming the cold, swallowing eye. And then he wasn't falling, but running, running with a leaden, pitch-like slowness through the bone cavities in his own skull, which was slowly disintegrating. A cold planet riddled with tunnels, crashing and crumpling against a never-ending wall of ice, until the wreckage caught him and he fell, burning into the cold eye tunnel again. And as he fell, a noise came from the throat of the cold ice eye, and from his own mouth, and chilled him more than ice, and the noise said, State of Play 3. Fal and Gistra was where she liked being most, on top of a mountain. She had just made her first real climb since she'd broken her leg. It was a relatively unforbidding peak, and she had taken the easiest route. But now, here at the summit, drinking in the view, she was dismayed at how unfit she'd become. The healed leg hurt a little, deep inside, of course, but so did the muscles in both legs, as though she'd just climbed a mountain twice the height and with a full pack. Just out of condition, she guessed. She sat on the summit of the ridge, looking out over smaller white summits to the sharp forested creases of the higher foothills and the rolling downs beyond, where grassland and trees combined. In the distance was the plain, rivers sparkling in the sunlight, and, marking its far side, the hills where the lodge was her home. Birds wheeled far away in the high valleys beneath her, and sometimes light glinted from the plain as some reflective surface moved. A part of her listened to the distant bone ache, assessing it, then switched the nagging sensation off. She wanted no distractions. She hadn't climbed all this way just to enjoy the view. She'd come up here for a purpose. It meant something to climb, to haul this sack of bones and flesh all this way, and then look, then think, then be. 
She could have taken a flyer here any time when she'd been recovering, but she hadn't, even though Jace had suggested it. That was too easy. Being here wouldn't have meant anything. She concentrated, her eyelids drooping, going through the quiet internal chant, the unmagical spell that called up the spirits buried in her genofixed glands. The trance came on with an initial rush of dizzying force that made her put her hands out to each side, steadying herself when she didn't need steadying. The sounds in her ears, of her own blood coursing, of her breath's slow tide, loudened, took on strange harmonies. The light beyond her eyelids pulsed in time to the blood beat. She felt herself frown, imagining her brow creasing like the folding hills, and one part of her, still distant, watching, thought, still not very good at this. She opened her eyes, and the world had changed. The far hills were forever rolling brown and green waves with a crest of breaking white foam. The plain fumed with light. The pattern of pasture land and copses in the foothills looked like camouflage, moving but not moving, like a tall building seen against quick clouds. The forested ridges were buckled divisions in some huge, busy tree brain, and the snow and ice-covered peaks about her had become vibrating sources of a light that was sound and smell as well. She experienced a dizzying sense of concentricity, as though she was the nucleus of the landscape. Here, in an inside-out world, an inverted hollowness. Part of it. Born here. All she was, each bone and organ, cell and chemical and molecule and atom and electron, proton and nucleus, every elementary particle, each wavefront of energy from here, not just the orbital, dizzy again, touching snow with gloved hands, but the culture, the galaxy, the universe. This is our place, and our time, and our life, and we should be enjoying it. But are we? Look in from outside, ask yourself, just what are we doing? Killing the immortal, changing to preserve, warring for peace, and so embracing utterly what we claimed to have renounced completely for our own good reasons. Well, it was done. Those people in the culture who had really objected to the war were gone. They were no longer culture. They were not part of the effort. They had become neutrals, formed their own groupings, and taken new names, or claimed to be the real, true culture yet another shading of confusion along the culture's incohate boundaries. But for once, the names did not matter. What did matter was the disagreement and the ill-feeling produced by the split. Ah, oh, the contempt of it, the glut of contempt we seem to have achieved, our own disguised contempt for primitives, the contempt of those who left the culture when war was declared for those who chose to fight the adherents, the contempt so many of our own people feel for special circumstances, the contempt we all guess the minds must feel for us, and elsewhere. The Adiran's contempt for us, all of us humans, and human contempt for changes. A federated disgust, a galaxy of scorn. Us, with our busy, busy little lives, finding no better way to pass our years than in competitive disdain. And what the Adirans must feel toward us. Consider, near immortal, singular and unchanged, Forty-five thousand years of history on one planet, with one all-embracing religion philosophy. Whole, steady eons of contented study. A calm age of devotion on that one worshipped place, uninterested in anything outside. Then, millennia ago, in another ancient war, invasion. Suddenly finding themselves pawns in somebody else's squalid imperialism. From introverted peacefulness, through ages of torment and repression, a forging force indeed, to extroverted militancy, determined zeal. Who could blame them? They had tried to keep themselves apart, and been shattered, almost made extinct, by forces greater than those they could muster. No surprise that they decided the only way to protect themselves was to attack first, expand, become stronger and stronger, push their boundaries as far from the treasured planet of Idia as possible. And there is even a genetic template for that catastrophic change from meek to fierce, in the step from breeder to warrior. Oh, a savage and noble species, justifiably proud of themselves, and refusing to alter their genetic code. Not far wrong in claiming perfection already. What they must feel for the swarming biped tribes of humankind. Repetition, 
matter and life, and the materials that could take change, that could evolve, forever repeating. Life's food talking back to it. And us, just another belch in the darkness, sound but not a word, noise without meaning. We are nothing to them, mere biotomatons, and the most terrible example of the type. The culture must seem like some fiendish amalgam of everything the Adherents have ever found repugnant. We are a mongrel race, our past a history of tangles, our sources obscure, our rowdy upbringing full of greedy, short-sighted empires and cruel, wasteful diasporas. Our ancestors were the lost and found of the galaxy, continually breeding and breeding and milling and killing their societies and civilizations, forever falling apart and reforming. There had to be something wrong with us, something mutant in the system, something too quick and nervous and frantic for our own good or anybody else's. We are such pathetic, fleshy things, so short-lived, swarming and confused and dull, just so stupid to an Adiran. Physical repugnance, then, but worse to come. We are self-altering, we meddle with the code of life itself, re-spelling the word which is the way the incantation of being, interfering with our own inheritance and interfering in the development of other peoples, <laughs> an interest we share. And worst still, worst of all, not just producing but embracing and giving ourselves over totally to the ultimate anathema, the minds, the sentient machines, the very image and essence of life itself desecrated, idolatry incarnate. No wonder they despise us. Poor, sick mutations that we are, petty and obscene, servants of the machine devils that we worship. Not even sure of our own identity. Just who is culture? Where exactly does it begin and end? Who is and who isn't? The Adherents know exactly who they are. Pure bread, the one race, or nothing. Do we? Contact is contact, the core. But after that... The level of genofixing varies, despite the ideal not everybody can mate successfully with everybody else. The minds? No real standards. Individuals, too, and not fully predictable, precocious, independent. Living on a culture made orbital or in a rock, another sort of hollowed world. Small wanderer? No. Too many claiming some kind of independence. No clear boundaries to the culture, then. It just fades away at the edges, both fraying and spreading. So who are we? The buzz of meaning and matter about her, the mountain song of light, seemed to rise around her like a cauldron tide, drenching and engulfing. She felt herself as the speck she was, a moat, a tiny, struggling, imperfect chip of life, lost in the surrounding waste of light and space. She sensed the frozen force of the ice and snow around her and felt consumed by the skin-burning chill of it. She felt the sun beat and knew the crystals fracturing and melting, knew the water as it dripped and slithered and became dark bubbles under ice and dewdrops on the icicles. She saw the fronded trickles, the tumbling streams and the cataracted rivers. She sensed the winding and unwinding loops as the river slowed and oxbowed, calm, estuarial, into lake and sea where vapour rose once more and she felt lost within it, dissolved within it, and for the first time in her young life was truly afraid, more frightened there and then than she had been when she'd fallen and broken her leg, during either the brief moments of falling, the stunning instant of impact and pain, or the long cold hours afterward, crumpled in the snow and rocks, sheltering and shivering and trying not to cry. That was something she had long before prepared herself for. She knew what was happening. She had worked out the effects it might have and the ways she might react. It was a risk you took, something you understood. This was not, because now there was nothing to understand, and maybe nothing, including her, to understand it. Help! Something wailed inside her. She listened and could do nothing. We are ice and snow. We are that trapped state. We are water falling, itinerant and vague, ever seeking the lowest level, trying to collect and connect. We are vapour, raised against our own devices, made nebulous, blown on whatever wind arises, to start again, glacial or not. She could come out. She felt the sweat bead on her brow, sensed her hands create their own moulds in the crisp, crunching snow, and knew there was a way out, knew she could come down, but with nothing, having found nothing, done nothing, understood nothing. 
She would stay then. She would fight it out. The cycle began again, her thoughts looping, and she saw the water as it flowed down gorges and valleys, or collected lower in trees, or fell straight back to lakes and the sea. She saw it fall on meadowland and on the high marshes and the moors, and she fell with it, terrace to terrace, over small lips of rock, foaming and circling. She felt the moisture on her forehead start to freeze, chilling her, and knew the danger. Wondered again whether to come out of the trance, wondered how long she had sat here, whether they were watching over her or not. She felt dizzy again, and grabbed deeper at the snow around her, her gloves pressuring the frozen flakes, and as she did that, she remembered. She saw the pattern of frozen foam once more. She stood again beside that ledge on the moor's cold surface, by the tiny waterfall and the pool where she'd found the lens of frothed ice. She remembered holding it in her hands, and recalled that it did not ring when she flicked it with her finger, that it tasted of water no more, when she touched it with her tongue and that her breath blew across it in a cloud, another swirling image in the air. And that was her. That was what it meant. Something to hold on to. Who are we? Who we are. Just what we're taken as being. What we know and what we do. No less, no more. Information being passed on. Patterns, galaxies, stellar systems, planets, all evolve. Matter in the raw changes, progresses in a way. Life is a faster force, reordering, finding new niches, starting to shape. Intelligence, consciousness, an order quicker, another new plane. Beyond was unknown, too vague to be understood. Ask a draazen, perhaps, and wait for the answer. All just refining, a process of getting it more right, if right itself was right. And if we tamper with our inheritance, so what? What is more ours to tamper with? What makes nature more right than us? If we get it wrong, that's because we are stupid, not because the idea was bad. And if we are no longer on the breaking edge of the wave, well, too bad. Hand on the baton. Best wishes. Have fun. Everything about us, everything around us, everything we know and can know of is composed ultimately of patterns of nothing. That's the bottom line, the final truth. So... Where we find we have any control over those patterns, why not make the most elegant ones, the most enjoyable and good ones, in our own terms? Yes, we're hedonists, Mr. Bora Horza Gobachul. We seek pleasure and have fashioned ourselves so that we can take more of it, admitted. We are what we are. But what about you? What does that make you? Who are you? What are you? A weapon. A thing made to deceive and kill by the long dead. The whole subspecies that is the changes is the remnant of some ancient war, a war so long gone that no one willing to tell recalls who fought it, or when, or over what. Nobody even knows whether the changes were on the winning side or not. But in any event, you were fashioned, Horza. You did not evolve in a way you could call natural. You are the product of careful thought and genetic tinkering and military planning and deliberate design. And war. Your very creation depended on it. You are the child of it. You are its legacy. Changer, change yourself. But you cannot. You will not. All you can do is try not to think about it. And yet the knowledge is there, the information implanted, somewhere deep inside. You could, you should, live easy with it, all the same. But I don't think you do. And I'm sorry for you because I think I know now who you really hate. She came out of it quickly, as the supply of chemicals from glands in her neck and brainstem shut off. The compounds already in the girl's brain cells began to break down, releasing her. Reality blew around her, the breeze freshening cold against her skin. She wiped the sweat from her brow. There were tears in her eyes, and she wiped them too, sniffing and rubbing her reddened nose. Another failure, she thought bitterly. But it was a young, unstable sort of bitterness, a kind of fake, something she assumed for a while, like a child trying on adult clothes. She luxuriated in the feeling of being old and disillusioned for a moment, then let it drop. The mood did not fit. Time enough for the genuine version when she was old, she thought, wryly, smiling at the line of hills on the far side of the plain. But it was a failure nevertheless. She had hoped for something to occur to her, Something about the Adherence, or Balveda, or the Changer, or the War, or... 
anything. Instead, old territory mostly, accepted facts the already known. A certain self-disgust at being human, an understanding of the Adiran's proud disdain for her kind, a reaffirmation that at least one thing was its own meaning, and a probably wrong, probably over-sympathetic glimpse into the character of a man she had never met and never would meet who was separated from her by most of a galaxy and all of a morality. Little enough to bring down from the frozen peak. She sighed. The wind blew, and she watched clouds mass far along the high range. She would have to start down now if she was going to beat the storm. It would seem like cheating not to get back down under her own steam, and Jace would scold her if conditions got so bad she had to send for a flyer to pick her up. Fal and Gistra stood. The pain in her leg came back, signals from her weak point. She paused for a moment, reassessing the state of that mending bone, and then, deciding it would hold up, started the descent toward the unfrozen world below. Chapter 11 The Command System Stations He was being shaken gently. Wake up now. Come on. Wake up. Come on now. Up you get. He recognised the voice as Zorolundra's. The old Adiran was trying to get him to wake up. He pretended to stay asleep. I know you're awake. Come on now. It's time to get up. He opened his eyes with a false weariness. Zorolundra was there, in a bright blue circular room, with lots of large couches set into alcoves in the blue material. Above hung a white sky with black clouds. It was very bright in the room. He shielded his eyes and looked. No, know you're awake. Come on now. It's time to get up. He opened his eyes with a false weariness. Zorolundra was there, in a bright blue circular room, with lots of large couches set into alcoves in the blue material. Above hung a white sky with black clouds. It was very bright in the room. He shielded his eyes and looked at the Adiran. What happened to the command system? He said, looking around the circular blue room. That dream is over now. You did well. Passed with flying colours. The Academy and I are very pleased with you. He couldn't help but feel pleased. A warm glow seemed to envelop him, and he couldn't stop a smile appearing on his face. Thanks, he said. The quirl nodded. You did very well as Bora Horzogobachul, Zorolundra said in his rumbling great voice. Now you should take some time off and go and play with Girashel. He was swinging his feet off the bed, getting ready to jump down to the floor when Zorolundra said that. He smiled at the old quirl. Who? he laughed. Your friend, the Girashel, the Adiran said. You mean Kirakel? He laughed, shaking his head. Zorolandra must be getting old. I mean Girashel, the Adiran insisted coldly, stepping back and looking at him strangely. Who is Kirashel? You mean you don't know? But how could you get her name wrong? he said, shaking his head again at the quirl's foolishness. Or was this still part of some test? Just a moment, Zorolandra said. He looked at something in his hand which threw coloured lights across his broad, gleaming face. Then he slapped his other hand to his mouth, an expression of astonished surprise on his face, as he turned to him and said, Oh, sorry, and suddenly reached over and shoved him back into the... He sat upright. Something whined in his ear. He sat back down again slowly, looking round in the grainy darkness to see if any of the others had noticed. But they were all still. He told the remote sensor alarm to switch off. The wine in his ear faded. Una Haklosp's casing could be seen high on the far gantry. Horza opened his visor and wiped some sweat from his nose and brows. The drone had no doubt seen him each time he woke up. He wondered what it was thinking now, what it thought of him. Could it see well enough to know that he was having nightmares? Could it see through his visor to his face? or sense the small twitches his body made while his brain constructed its own images from the debris of all his days. He could blank the visor out, he could set the seat to expand and lock rigid. He thought about how he must look to it, a small, soft, naked thing writhing in a hard cocoon, convulsed with illusions in its coma. He decided to stay awake until the others started to rise. The night passed, and the free company awoke to darkness and the labyrinth, the drone said nothing about seeing him wake up during the night, and he didn't ask it. He was falsely jolly and hearty, going round the others laughing and slapping backs, telling them they'd get to Station 7 today, and there they could turn on the lights and get the transit tubes working. 
Tell you what, Wobslin, he said, grinning at the engineer as he rubbed his eyes. We'll see if we can get one of those big trains working, just for the hell of it. Well, Wobslin yawned, if that's all right. Why not, Horser said, spreading his arms out. I think Mr. Adequate's leaving us to it. He's turning a blind eye to this whole thing. We'll get one of those super trains running, eh? Wobslin stretched, smiling and nodding. Well, yeah, sounds like a good idea to me. Horser smiled widely, winked at Wubslin, and went to release Belveda. It was like going to release a wild animal, he thought, as he shifted the empty cable drum he had used to block the door. He half expected to find Balveda gone, miraculously escaped from her bonds and disappeared from the room without opening the door. But when he looked in, there she was, lying calmly in her warm clothes, the harness making troughs in the fur of the jacket and still attached to the wall Horza had fixed it to. "'Good morning, Perestek, he said breezily. Horza, the woman said grumpily, sitting slowly upright, flexing her shoulders and arcing her neck. Twenty years at my mother's side, more than I care to think of as a gay and dashing young blade indulging in all the pleasures the culture has ever produced, one or two of maturity, seventeen in contact and four in special circumstances, have not made me pleasant to know or quick to wake in the mornings. You wouldn't have some water to drink, would you? I've slept too long. I wasn't comfortable. It's cold and dark. I had nightmares I thought were really horrible until I woke up and remembered what reality was like at the moment. And I mentioned water a moment or two ago. Did you hear? Or aren't I allowed any? I'll get you some, he said, going back to the door. He stopped there. Uh, you're right, by the way. You are pretty off-putting in the morning. Balveda shook her head in the darkness. She put one finger in her mouth and rubbed it around on one side as though massaging her gums or cleaning her teeth. Then she just sat with her head between her knees, staring at the jet-black nothing of the cold rock floor beneath her, wondering if this was the day she died. They stood in a huge semicircular alcove carved out of the rock and looking out over the dark space of Station 4's repair and maintenance area. The cavern was three hundred metres or more square, and from the bottom of the scooped gallery they stood on to the floor of the vast cave, littered with machinery and equipment, was a thirty-metre drop. Great cradle arms capable of lifting and holding an entire command system train were suspended from the roof above, another thirty metres up in the gloom. In the mid-distance, a suspended gantry lanced out over the cave, from a gallery on one side to the other, bisecting the cavern's dark bulk. They were ready to move. Horza gave the order. Wubslin and Nysin each headed down small side tubes toward the main command system tunnel and the transit tubeway respectively, using AG. Once in the tunnels, they would keep level with the main group. Horza switched on his own AG, rose about a metre from the floor, and floated down a branch tunnel of the foot gallery, then started slowly forward, down into the darkness, towards Station 5, thirty kilometres away. The rest would follow him, also floating. Balveda shared the pallet with the equipment. He smiled when Balveda sat down on the pallet. She suddenly reminded him of Fui Song sitting on his heavy-duty litter in the space and sunlight of a place now gone. The comparison struck him as wonderfully absurd. Horza floated along the foot tunnel, stopping to check the side tubes as they appeared and contacting the others whenever he did so. His suit sensors were turned as high as they would go. Any light, the slightest noise, an alteration in the airflow, even vibrations in the rock around him, all were catered for. Unusual smells would register too as would power flowing through the cables buried in the tunnel walls and any sort of broadcast communication. He'd thought about signalling the adherents as they went along, but decided not to. He'd sent one short signal from Station 4 without receiving a reply, but to send more on the way would be to give too much away if, as he suspected, the adherents were not in a mood to listen. He moved through the darkness as though sitting on an invisible seat, the crews cradled in his arms. He heard his heartbeat, his breathing, and the quiet slipstreaming of the cold, half-stale air around his suit. The suit registered vague background radiation from the surrounding granite, punctuated by intermittent cosmic rays. On the faceplate of the suit's helmet, he watched a ghostly radar image of the tunnels as they unwound through the rock. In places the tunnel ran straight. If he turned, he could see the main group following half a kilometre behind him. In other places the tunnel described a series of shallow curves, cutting down the view provided by the scanning radar to a couple of hundred metres or less, so that he seemed to float alone in the chill blackness. At Station 5, they found a battleground. 
His suit had picked up odd scents. That had been the first sign, organic molecules in the air, carbonized and burned. He'd told the others to stop, gone on ahead cautiously. Four dead Medjel were laid out near one wall of the dark, deserted cavern, their burned and dismembered bodies echoing the formation of frozen changer corpses at the surface base. Idiran religious symbols had been burned onto the wall over the fallen. There had been a firefight. The station walls were pocked with small craters and long laser scars. Horza found the remains of one laser rifle smashed, a small piece of metal embedded in it. The Medjel bodies had been torn apart by hundreds more of the same tiny projectiles. At the far end of the station, behind the half-demolished remains of one set of access ramps, he found the scattered components of some crudely manufactured machine, a kind of gun on wheels like a miniature armoured car. Its mangled turret still contained some of the projectile ammunition, and more bullets were scattered like wind seeds about the flame-seared wreck. Horza smiled slightly at the debris, weighing a handful of the unused projectiles in his hand. The mind, Wupslin said, looking down at what was left of the small vehicle. It made this thing. He scratched his head. Must have, Horza said, watching Yelson poke warily at the torn metal of the wreck's hull with one booted foot, gun ready. There was nothing like this down here, but you could manufacture it in one of the workshops. A few of the old machines still work. It'd be difficult, but if the mine still had some of its fields working, and maybe a drone or two, it could do it. It had the time. Pretty crude, Wolfslin said, turning over a piece of the gun mechanism in his hand. He turned and looked back at the distant corpses of the Medjel and added, Worked well enough, though. No more Medjel by my count, Horza said. Still two Adirans left, Yalson said sourly, kicking at a small rubber wheel. It rolled a couple of metres across the debris and flopped over again near Nysin, who was celebrating the discovery of the demised Medjel with a drink from his flask. You sure these Adirans aren't still here? Avaja asked, looking round anxiously. Dorolo peered into the darkness too and made the sign of the circle of flame. Positive, Horza said. I checked. Station 5 hadn't been difficult to search. It was an ordinary station, just a set of points, a chicane in the command system's double loop, and a place for the trains to stop and connect themselves with the communication links to the planet's surface. There were a few rooms and storage areas off the main cavern, but no power switching gear, no barracks or control rooms, and no vast repair and maintenance area. Marks in the dust showed where the Adirans had walked away from the station after the battle with the mine's crude automaton, heading for Station 6. You think we'll be a train at the next station? Whoopsin said. Horza nodded. Should be. The engineer nodded too, staring vacantly at the double sets of steel rails gleaming on the station floor. Balveda swung herself off the pallet, stretching her legs. Horza still had the suit's infrared sensor on and saw the warmth of the culture agent's breath waft from her mouth in a dimly glowing cloud. She clapped her hands and stamped her feet. Still not too warm, is it? she said. Don't worry, grumbled the drone from underneath the pallet. I may start to overheat soon. That ought to keep you cosy until I seize up completely. Balveda smiled a little and sat back on the pallet, looking at Horza. Still thinking of trying to convince your tripedal pals you're all on the same side? she said. <laughs> said the drone. We'll see, was all Horza would say. Again, his breathing, his heartbeat, the slow wash of stale air. The tunnels led on into the deep night of the ancient rock like an insidious circular maze. The war won't end, Avager said. It'll just die away. Horza floated along the tunnel, half listening to the others talk over the open channel as they followed him. He'd switched his suit's external mics from the helmet speakers to a small screen near his cheek. The trace showed silence. Avager continued. I don't think the culture will give in like everybody thinks it will. I think they'll keep fighting because they believe in it. The Adirans won't give in either. They'll keep fighting to the last, and they and the culture will just keep going at each other all the time, all over the galaxy, eventually. And their weapons and bombs and rays and things will just keep getting better and better. And in the end, the whole galaxy will become a battleground until they've blown up all the stars and planets and orbitals and everything else big enough to stand on. And then they'll destroy all of each other's big ships, and then the little ships too, until everybody will be living in single suits, blowing each other up with weapons that could destroy a planet. And that's how it'll end. 
Probably they'll invent guns or drones that are even smaller, and there'll only be a few smaller and smaller machines fighting over whatever's left of the galaxy, and there'll be nobody left to know how it all started in the first place. Well, said Una Harkloth's voice, that sounds like a lot of fun, and what if things go badly? That's too negative an attitude to battle, Avager, Dorlo's high-pitched voice broke in. You have to be positive. Contest is formative. Battle is a testing. War a part of life, and the evolutionary process. In its extremity we find ourselves. Usually in the shit, Yelson said. Hosa grinned. Yelson, Dorla began. Even if you don't be... Hold it, Hosa said suddenly. The screen near his cheek had flickered. Wait there. I'm picking up some sound from ahead. He stopped, sat still in midair, and put the sound from outside through the helmet speakers. A low noise, deep and boomy, like heavy surf from a long way off, or a thunderstorm in distant mountains. Well, there's something making a noise up there, Horsa said. How far to the next station? Yarsen said. About two kilometres. Think it's them? Nysin sounded nervous. Probably, Horsa said. Okay, I'm going ahead. Yelson, put Malveda in the restrainer harness. Everybody check weapons. No noise. Wubslin, Nysen, go forward slowly. Stop as soon as you can see the station. I'm going to try talking to these guys. The noise boomed vaguely on, making him think of a rock slide heard from a mine deep inside a mountain. He approached the station. A blast door came into view round a corner. The station would be only another hundred metres beyond. He heard some heavy clunking noises. They came down the dark tunnel, deep and resonant, hardly muffled by the distance, sounding like huge switches being closed, massive chains being fastened. The suit registered organic molecules in the air. Idirin scent. He passed the edge of the blast door and saw the station. There was light in Station 6, dim and yellow as though from a weak torch. He waited for Wubslin and Nysin to tell him they could see the station from their tunnels. Then he went closer. A command system train stood in Station 6, its rotund bulk three stories tall and three hundred metres long, half filling the cylindrical cavern. The light came from the train's far end, high at the front, where the control deck was. The sounds came from the train too. He moved across the foot tunnel so he could see the rest of the station. At the far end of the platform, floated the mind. He stared at it for a moment, then magnified the image to make sure. It looked genuine. An ellipsoid, maybe fifteen metres long and three in diameter, silvery yellow in the weak light spilling from the train's control cabin, and floating in the stale air like a dead fish on the surface of a still pond. He checked the suit's mass sensor. It registered the fuzzy signal of the train's reactor, but nothing else. Yelson, he said, whispering, even though he knew it was unnecessary. Anything on that mass sensor? Just a weak trace and a reactor, I guess. Wubslin, Horsa said. I can see what looks like the mind in the station, floating at the far end. But it's not showing on either sensor. Would its AG make it invisible to the sensors? Shouldn't. Wubslin's puzzled voice came back. Might fool a passive gravity sensor, but not... A loud metallic braking noise came from the train. Hawser's suit registered an abrupt increase in local radiation. Holy shit, he said. What's happening? Yelson said. More clicking, snapping noises echoed through the station, and another weak yellow light appeared from beneath the reactor car in the middle of the train. They're fucking about with the reactor carriage, that's what's happening, Hawser said. God, Wubslin said. Don't they know how old all this stuff is? What are they doing that for? Avager said. Could be trying to get the train to run under its own power, Horsa said. Crazy bastards. Maybe they're too lazy to push their prize back to the surface, the drone suggested. These nuclear reactors, they can't explode, can they? Avager said. Just as a blinding blue light burst from under the centre of the train. Horsa flinched, his eyes closed. He heard Wubslin shout something. He waited for the blast, the noise, death. He looked up. The light still flashed and sparkled under the reactor car. He heard an erratic hissing noise, like static. Horsa? Yelson shouted. God's balls, Wubslin said. I nearly filled my pants. It's okay, Horsa said. I thought they'd blown the damn thing up. What is that, Wubslin? Welding, I think, 
Woodslin said. Electric arc. Right, Orza said. Let's stop these crazies before they blow us all away. Yalson, join me. Dorlo, meet up with Woodslin. Avager, stay with Balveda. It took a few minutes for the others to arrange themselves. Horza watched the bright, flickering blue light as it sizzled away under the centre of the train. Then it stopped. The station was lit only by the two weak lights from the control deck and reactor car. Yalson floated down the foot tunnel and landed gently at Horza's side. Ready? Dorlo said over the intercom. Then a screen in Horza's helmet flashed. A speaker beeped in his ear. Something had transmitted a signal nearby, not one of their suits or the drone. What was that? Wolfson said. Then, look there on the ground. Looks like a communicator. Horza and Yalson looked at each other. Horza? Wolfson said. There's a communicator on the floor of the tunnel here. I think it's on. It must have picked up the noise of Dorlo sitting down beside me. That was what transmitted. They're using it as a bug. Sorry, Dorolo said. Well, don't touch the thing, Yalson said quickly. Could be boobied. So, now they know we're here, Avager said. They were going to know soon anyway, Horza said. I'll try hailing them. Everybody ready in case they don't want to talk. Horza cut his AG and walked to the end of the tunnel, almost onto the level platform of the station. Another communicator, lying there, transmitted its single pulse. Horza looked at the great dark train and switched on his suit PA. He drew a breath, ready to speak in Adirin. Something flashed from a slit window near the rear of the train. His head was knocked back inside the helmet and he fell, stunned, his ears ringing. The noise of the shot echoed through the station. The suit alarm beeped frantically at him. Horza rolled over against the tunnel wall. More shots slammed down on him, flaring against the suit helmet and body. Yalson ducked and ran. She skidded to the lip of the tunnel and raked fire over the window the shots were coming from, then swivelled, grabbed Horza by one arm and pulled him further into the tunnel. Plasma bolts crashed into the wall he'd been lying against. Horza? she shouted, shaking him. Command override level zero, a small voice chirped in Horza's buzzing ears. This suit has sustained system fatal damage, automatically voiding all warranties from this point. Immediate total overhaul required. Further use at wearer's risk. Powering down. Horza tried to tell Yeltsin he was all right, but the communicator was dead. He pointed to his head to make her understand this. Then more shots from the nose of the train came bursting into the foot tunnel. Yeltsin dived to the floor and started firing back. Fire! she yelled to the others. Get those bastards! Horza watched Yeltsin shooting at the far end of the train. Laser trails flicked out from the left side of their tunnel, tracer shells from the right as the others joined in. The station filled with a spastic, blazing light. Shadows leapt and danced across the walls and ceiling. He lay there, stunned, dull-headed, listening to the muffled cacophony of sound breaking against his suit like surf. He fumbled with his laser rifle, trying to remember how to fire it. He really had to help the others fight the Adirans. His head hurt. Yalson stopped shooting. The front of the train glowed red where she'd been firing at it. The explosive shells from Nysin's gun crackled round the window the first shots had come from, short bursts of fire. Wubslin and Dorolo had come out of the main tunnel, past the slab of the train's rear. They crouched near the wall, firing at the same window as Nysin. The plasma fire had stopped. The humans stopped shooting too. The station went dark. The gunfire echoed. Faded. Horza tried to stand up, but somebody seemed to have removed the bones from his legs. Anybody? Yasin began. Fire cascaded around Wubslin and Dorolo, lancing out from the lower deck of the last carriage. Dorolo screamed and fell. Hand spasming, a gun blasted wildly over the cavern roof. Wubslin rolled along the ground, shooting back at the Adirans. Yalson and Nysin joined in. The carriage's skin buckled and burst under the fusillade. Dorolo lay on the platform, moving spasmodically, moaning. More shots came from the front of the train, bursting around the tunnel entrances. Then something moved midway up the rear carriage near the rear actress gantry. An Adiran ran from a carriage door and along the middle ramp. He levelled the gun and fired down, first at Dorolo where she lay on the ground, then at Wubslin, lying near the side of the train. Dorolo's suit was blown, tumbling and burning across the black floor of the station. Wubslin's gun arm was hit. Then Yalson's shots found the Adiran, scattering fire across his suit, the structure of the gantry and the side of the train. 
The ramp supports gave way before the Adirin's armoured suit, softening and disintegrating under the stream of fire. The gantry tubing sagged and collapsed, sending the top platform of the ramp crashing down, trapping the Adirin warrior underneath the smoking wreckage. Wobslin cursed and shot one-handed at the nose of the train, where the second Adirin was still firing. Horza lay against the wall, his ears roaring, his skin cold and sweat-slicked. He felt numb, dissociated. He wanted to take his helmet off and gasp at some fresh air, but knew he shouldn't. Even though the helmet was damaged, it would still protect him if he was shot again. He compromised by opening the visor. Sound assaulted his ears. Shockwaves thrummed at his chest. Yalson looked back at him, motioned him further back down the tunnel as shots smacked into the floor near him. He stood, but fell, blacking out briefly. The Adiran at the front of the train stopped firing for a moment. Yalson took the opportunity to look back at Horser again. He lay on the tunnel floor behind her, moving weakly. She looked out to where Dorolo lay, her suit ripped and smouldering. Nysin was almost out of his tunnel, firing long bursts down the station, scattering explosions all over the nose of the train. The air boomed with the rasping noise of his gun, ebbing and flowing through the cavern and accompanied by a pulsing wave of light that seemed to reach back from where the bullet struck and detonated. Yalson was aware of somebody shouting, a woman's voice yelling, but you could hardly hear over the noise of Nysin's gun. Plasma bolts came singing down the platform from the front of the train again, from high up near the forward access ramps. She returned fire. Nysin poured shots in the same direction, paused. In stop! The voice shouted in Yalson's ears. It was Balveda. There's something wrong with your gun. It'll... The culture agent's voice was drowned by the noise of Nysin firing again. Crash! Yalson heard Balveda scream despairingly, then a line of light and sound seemed to fill the station from one end to the other, ending at Nysin. The bright stalk of noise and flame blossomed into an explosion Yalson felt through her suit. Bits of Nysin's gun were scattered across the platform. The man was thrown back against the wall. He fell to the ground and lay still. Motherfucker! Yalson heard herself say, and she started running up the platform, enfilading the front of the train, trying to widen the angle of fire. Shots dipped to meet her, then cut out. There was a pause while she still ran and fired, then the second Adiran appeared on the top level of the distant access ramp, holding a pistol in both hands. He ignored both her and Wobslin's fire and shot straight across the breadth of the cavern at the mind. The silvery ellipsoid started to move, heading for the far foot tunnel. The first shot seemed to go right through it, as did a second. A third bolt made it vanish completely, leaving only a tiny puff of smoke where it had been. The Adirin's suit glittered as Yalson and Wobslin's shots struck home. The warrior staggered. He turned as though to start firing down at them again, just as the armoured suit gave way. He was blown back and across the gantry, one arm disappearing in a cloud of flame and smoke. He fell over the edge of the ramp and crashed down to the middle level, the suit burning brightly, one leg snagging over the guardrails on the middle ramp. The plasma pistol was blown from his hand. Other shots tore at the wide helm, fracturing the blackened visor. He hung, limp and burning and pummeled with laser fire for a few more seconds. Then the leg caught on the guardrail gave way, snapping cleanly off and falling to the station floor. The Adiran slid, crumpling to the deck of the ramp. Horza listened, his ears still ringing. After a while it was quiet. Acrid smoke stung his nose. Fumes of burned plastic, molten metal, roasted meat. He had been unconscious, then woken to see Yalson running up the platform. He had tried to give her covering fire, but his hands shook too much, and he hadn't been able to get the gun to work. Now everybody had stopped firing, and it was very quiet. He got up and walked unsteadily into the station, where smoke rose from the battered train. Wobslin knelt by Dorolo's side, trying with one hand to undo one of the woman's gloves. Her suit still smouldered. The helmet visor was smeared red, covered with blood on the inside, hiding her face. Horza watched Yalson come back down the station, gun still at the ready. Her suit had taken a couple of plasma bolts to the body, the roughly spiralled marks showed as black scars on the grey surface. She looked up suspiciously at the rear access ramps, where one Adiran lay, trapped and unmoving. Then she opened her visor. You all right? she asked Horza. Yes, but groggy. Sore head, he said. Yalson nodded. They went over to where Nysin lay. Nysin was still just alive. His gun had exploded, riddling his chest, arms and face with shrapnel. 
Moans bubbled from the crimson ruin of his face. Fucking hell, Yelson said. She took a small medipack from her suit and reached through what was left of Nysin's visor to inject the semi-conscious man's neck with painkiller. What's happened? Abager's tiny voice came from Yelson's helmet. Is it safe yet? Yelson looked at Horza, who shrugged, then nodded. Yeah, it's safe, Abager, Yelson said. You can come in. I'll let Balveda use my suit, Mike. She said she... We heard, Yelson said. Something about a barrel crash. That right? Hosa heard Balveda's muffled voice affirming this. She thought Nysen's gun might blow up or something. Well, it did, Yelson said. He looks pretty bad. She glanced over at Wubslin, who was putting Dorolo's hand back down. Wubslin shook his head when he saw Yelson looking at him. Dorolo got blown away, Avager, Yelson said. The old man was silent for a moment, then said, and Horza? Took a plasma round on the head box. Suit damage. No communication. He'll live. Yalson paused. Sighed. Looks like we lost the mind, though. It disappeared. Avager waited another few moments before saying, his voice shaking. Well, a fine little mess. Easy in, easy out. Another triumph. Our change of friend taking over where Creeklin left off. His voice finished on a high pitch of anger. He switched his transceiver off. Yalson looked at Hosa, shook her head and said, Old asshole. Wubslin still knelt over Dorolo's body. They heard him sob a couple of times, before he too cut out of the open channel. Nysin's slowing breath spluttered through a mask of blood and flesh. Yalson made the circle of flame sign over the red haze masking Dorlo's face, then covered the body with a sheet from the pallet. Horza's ears stopped ringing, the grogginess cleared. Balveda, freed from the restrainer harness, watched the changer tend to Nysin. Avager stood nearby with Wubslin, whose arm wound had already been treated. I heard the noise, Balveda explained. It has a distinctive noise. Wubslin had asked why Nysin's gun had exploded and how Balveda had known it was going to happen. I'd have recognised it too if I hadn't been smacked on the head, Horsa said. He was teasing fragments of visor out of the unconscious man's face, spraying skin gel onto the places where blood oozed. Nysin was in shock, probably dying, but they couldn't even take him out of his suit. Too much blood had clotted between the man's body and the materials of the device he wore. It would plug the many small punctures effectively enough until the suit was removed, but then Nysin would start to bleed in too many places for them to cope with. So they had to leave him in the thing, as though in that mutual wreckage the human and machine had become one fragile organism. But what happened? Wubsin said. His gun barrel crashed, Horsa said. The projectiles must have been set to explode on too soft an impact, so the shells started to detonate when they hit the blast wave from the bullets in front, not the target. He didn't stop firing, so the blast front retarded right back into the muzzle of the gun. The guns have sensors to stop it happening, Balveda added, wincing with vicarious pain as Horsa drew a long sliver of visor from an eye socket. I guess his wasn't working. Told him that gun was too damn cheap when he bought it, Yalson said, coming over to stand by Horsa. Poor little bugger, Whoopslin said. Two more dead, Avager announced. I hope you're happy, Mr. Hauser. I hope you're so pleased about what your allies have... Avager, Yalson said calmly. Shut up. The old man glared at her for a second, then stamped off. He stood looking down at Dorolo. Unaha Klosp floated down from the rear access ramp. That a deer up there, it said, its voice pitched to betray mild surprise. He's alive. A couple of tons of junk on top of him, but he's still breathing. What about the other one? Horsa said. No idea. I didn't like to go too close. It's terribly messy up there. Horsa left Yalson to look after Nysin. He walked over the debris-strewn platform to the wreckage of the rear access gantry. He was bareheaded. The suit's helmet was ruined, and the suit itself had lost its AG and motor power, as well as most of its sensors. On backup energy, the lights still worked, as did the small repeater screen set into one wrist. The suit's mass sensor was damaged, the wrist screen filled with clutter when linked to the sensor, barely registering the train's reactor at all. 
His rifle was still working, for whatever that was worth now. He stood at the bottom of the ramps and felt the dregs of heat seeping from the metal support legs where laser fire had struck. He took a deep breath and climbed up the ramp to where the Adiran lay, his massive head sticking out of the wreckage sandwiched between the two levels of ramp. The Adiran turned slowly to look at him, and one arm tensed against the wreckage, which creaked and moved. Then the warrior brought his arm out from beneath the press of metal and unfastened the scarred battle helm. He let it fall to the floor. The great saddle face looked up at the changer. The greetings of the battle day, Horsa said in careful Adiran. Oh, boomed the Adiran. The little one speaks her tongue. I'm even on your side, though I don't expect you to believe it. I belong to the intelligence section of the first marine dominant under the Quirl Zoralundra. Horsa sat down on the ramp, almost level with the Adiran's face. I was sent in here to try to get the mind, he continued. Really, the Adiran said. Pity. I believe my comrade just destroyed it. So I hear, Horsa said, levelling the laser rifle at the big face, viced between the twisted metal planking. You also destroyed the changers back up at the base. I am a changer. That's why our mutual masters sent me in here. Why did you have to kill my people? What else could we do, human? The Adiran said impatiently. They were an obstacle. We needed their weaponry. They would have tried to stop us. We were too few to guard them. The creature's voice was laboured as it fought the weight of ramp, crushing its torso and rib cylinder. Horsa aimed the rifle straight at the Adiran's face. You vicious bastard. I have to blow your fucking head off right now. By all means, midget. The Adiran smiled, the double set of hard lips spreading. My comrade has already fallen bravely. Quea Norl has started his long journey through the upper world. I am captured and victorious at once, and you offer me the solace of the gun. I shall not close my eyes, human. You don't have to, Horsa said, letting the gun down. He looked over through the darkness of the station at Dorolo's body then into the dim, smoked, hazed light in the distance, where the nose and control deck of the train glowed faintly, illuminating an empty patch of floor where the mind had been. He turned back to the Adiran. I'm taking you back. I believe there are still units of the 93rd Fleet out beyond the quiet barrier. I have to report my failure and deliver a female culture agent to the Fleet Inquisitor. I'm going to report you for exceeding your orders and killing those changes. Not that I expect it'll do any good. Your story bores me, little one. The Adiran looked away and strained once more at the press of twisted metal covering him, but to no avail. Kill me now. You do smell so, and your speech grates. Ours is not a tongue for animals. What's your name? Horsa said. The saddle head turned to him again. The eyes blinked slowly. Zogzarl, human. Now you'll sully it by trying to pronounce it, no doubt. Well, you just rest there, Zoxal. Like I said, we'll take you with us. First, I want to check on the mind you destroyed. A thought has just occurred to me. Horsa got to his feet. His head hurt abominably where the helmet had slammed into it, but he ignored the pounding in his skull and started back down the ramp, limping a little. Your soul is shit, the Adiran called Zoxal boomed after him. Your mother should have been strangled at the moment she came on heat. We were going to eat the changes we killed, but they smelled like filth. Save your breath, Zuxal, Horsa said, not looking at the Adiran. I'm not going to shoot you. Horsa met Yalson at the bottom of the ramp. The drone had agreed to look after Nysin. Horsa looked to the far end of the station. I want to see where the mind was. What do you think happened to it? Yalson asked, falling into step beside him. He shrugged. Yalson went on. Maybe it did the trick it did earlier, went into hyperspace again. Maybe it reappeared somewhere else in the tunnels. Maybe, Horsa said. He stopped by Wubslin, taking the man's elbow and turning him round from Dorolo's body. The engineer had been crying. Wubslin, Horsa said. Guard that bastard. He might try and get you to shoot him, but don't. That's what he wants. I'm going to take the son of a bitch back to the fleet so they can court-martial him. Dirtying his name is a punishment. Killing him would be doing him a favour, understand? Wubslin nodded. Still rubbing the bruised side of his head, Horsa went off down the platform with Yalson. They came to where the mind had been. 
Horsa turned the lights on his suit up and looked over the floor. He picked up a small, burned-looking thing near the mouth of the foot tunnel leading to Station 7. What's that? Yasa said, turning away from the body of the Adiran on the other access gantry. I think, Horsa said, turning the still warm machine over in his hand. It's a remote drone. The mind left it behind? Yalson came over to look at it. It was just a blackened slab of material, some tubes and filaments showing through the lumpy, irregular surface where it had been hit by plasma fire. It's the mind's all right, Horsa said. He looked at Yalson. What exactly happened when they shot the mind? When he eventually hit it, it vanished. It had started to move, but it couldn't have accelerated that fast. I'd have felt the shock wave. It just vanished. It was like somebody turning off a projection, Horsa said. Yalson nodded. Yes, and there was a bit of smoke, not much. Do you mean to... He got it eventually. What do you mean? I mean, Yalson said, putting one hand on her hip and looking at Horsa with an impatient expression on her face, that it took three or four shots. The first went straight through it. Are you saying it was a projection? Horsa nodded and held up the machine in his hand. It was this, a remote drone producing a hologram of the mind. Must have had a weak force field as well, so that it could be touched and pushed as though it was a solid object. But all there was inside was this. He smiled faintly at the wrecked machine. No wonder the damn thing didn't show up on our mass sensors. So the mind's still around somewhere, Yalson said, looking at the drone in Horsa's hand. The changer nodded. Balveda watched Horsa and Yalson walk into the darkness at the far end of the station. She went over to where the drone floated above Nysin, monitoring his vital functions and sorting out some vials of medicine in the medkit. Wubslin kept his gun pointed at the trapped Idirin, but watched Balveda from the corner of his eye at the same time. The culture woman sat down cross-legged near the stretcher. Before you ask, the drone said, no, there's nothing you can do. I had guessed that, Unaharklosp. Valveda said. Hm. Then you have ghoulish tendencies? No. I wanted to talk to you. Really? The drone continued to sort the medicines. Yes. She sat forward, elbow on her knee, chin cupped in her hand. She lowered her voice a little. Are you biding your time, or what? The drone turned its front to her, an unnecessary gesture they both knew, but one it was used to making. Biding my time? You've let him use you so far. I just wondered how much longer. The drone turned away again, hovering over the dying man. Perhaps you hadn't noticed, Ms. Balveda, but my choices in this matter are almost as limited as yours. I've only got arms and legs, and I'm locked away at night, trussed up, you're not. I have to keep watch. He has a movement sensor which he leaves switched on anyway, so he would know if I tried to escape, and besides, where would I go? The ship? Balveda suggested, smiling. She looked back up the dark station, where the lights on their suits showed Yalson and the changer, picking something up from the ground. I would need his ring. Do you want to take it from him? You must have an effector. Couldn't you fool the ship's circuits, or even just that motion sensor? Ms. Balveda, call me Peristek. Peristek. I am a general-purpose drone, a civilian. I have light fields, the equivalent of many fingers, but not major limbs. I can produce a cutting field, but only a few centimetres in depth, and not capable of taking on armour. I can interface with other electronic systems, but I cannot interfere with the hardened circuits of military equipment. I possess an internal force field which lets me float, regardless of gravity, but apart from using my own mass as a weapon, that is not really of much use either. In fact, I am not particularly strong. When I needed to be for my job, there were attachments available for my use— Unfortunately, I was not employing them when I was abducted. Had I been, I probably wouldn't be here now. Damn, Balveda said into the shadows. No aces up your sleeve? No sleeves, Peristek. Balveda took in a deep breath and stared glumly at the dark floor. Oh, dear, she said. Our leader approaches, Unahar Klosp said, affecting weariness in its voice. It turned and nodded its front toward Yalson and Horsa, returning from the far end of the cavern. The changer was smiling. Malveda rose smoothly to her feet as Horsa beckoned to her. Peristic Balveda, Horsa said, 
standing with the others at the bottom of the rear access gantry and holding out one hand toward the Indiran, trapped in the wreckage above. Meet Zogzal. This is the female you claim as a culture agent, human, the Adiran said, turning his head awkwardly to look down at the group of people below him. Pleased to meet you, Belveda muttered, arching one eyebrow as she gazed up at the trapped Adiran. Horza walked up the ramp, passing Wobslin, who was training his gun on the trapped being. Horza still held the remote drone. He came to the second level ramp and looked down at the Adiran's face. See this, Zogzal? He held the drone up. It glinted in the lights of his suit. Zogzal nodded slowly. It is a small piece of damaged equipment. The deep, heavy voice betrayed signs of strain, and Horza could see a trickle of dark purple blood on the floor of the ramp Zogzal lay squashed upon. It's what you two proud warriors had when you thought you'd captured the mind. This is all there was. A remote drone casting a weak soligram. If you'd taken this back to the fleet, they'd have thrown you into the nearest black hole and wiped your name from the records. You're damn lucky I came along when I did. The Adiran looked thoughtfully at the wrecked drone for a short while. You, Zoxal said slowly, are lower than vermin, human. Your pathetic tricks and lies would make a yearling laugh. There must be more fat inside your thick skull than there is even on your skinny bones. You aren't fit to be thrown up. Horza stepped onto the ramp, which had fallen on top of the Adiran. He heard the being's breath suck in harshly through taut lips as he walked slowly over to where Zogzal's face stuck out beneath the wreckage. And you, you goddamn fanatic, aren't fit to wear that uniform. I'm going to find the mind you thought you had, and then I'm going to take you back to the fleet, where if they've any sense, they'll let the Inquisitor try you for gross stupidity. Fuck, the Adiran gasped painfully. Your animal soul. Horza used the neural stunner on Zaxal. Then he and Yalsen and the drone Unaha Klosp levered the ramp off the Adiran's body and sent it crashing down to the station floor. They cut the armour from the giant's body, then hobbled his legs with wire and tied down his arms to his sides. Zaxal had no broken limbs, but the keratin on one side of his body was cracked and oozed blood, while another wound between his collar scale and right shoulder plate, had closed up once the pressure was taken off him. He was big, even for an Adiran, over three and a half metres, and not thin. Horza was glad the tall male, a section leader according to the insignia on the armour he had been wearing, was probably injured internally and going to be in pain. It would make him less of a problem to guard once he'd woken up. He was too big for the restrainer harness. Yalson sat, eating a ration food bar, her gun balanced on one knee and pointing straight at the unconscious Adiran, while Horza sat at the bottom of the ramp and tried to repair his helmet. Unaha Klosp watched over Nysin, as powerless as the rest of them to do anything to help the wounded man. Wubslin sat on the pallet making some adjustments to the mass sensor. He had already taken a look round the command system train, but what he really wanted was to see a working one, in better light and without radiation stopping him looking through the reactor car. Avager stood by Dorolo's body for a while. Then he went to the far access ramp, where the body of the other Adiran, the one Zaxal had called Quernol, lay, holed and battered, limbs missing. Avager looked around and thought nobody was watching, but both Horza looking up from the wrecked helmet and Balveda walking round and stamping and shaking her feet in an attempt to keep warm, saw the old man swing his foot at the still body lying on the ramp, kicking the helmed head as hard as he could. The helmet fell off. Avager kicked the naked head. Valveda looked at Horza, shook her head, then went on pacing up and down. You're sure we've accounted for all the adherents? Unaha Klosp asked Horza. It had floated about the station and through the train accompanying Wubslin. Now it was facing the changer. That's the lot, Horza said, looking not at the drone, but at the mess of fractured optic fibres lying bloated and fused together inside the outer skin of his helmet. You saw the tracks. Hmm the machine said. We've won, drone, Horza said, still not looking at it. We'll get the power on in Station 7, and then it won't take us long to track the mine down. Your Mr. Adequate seems remarkably unconcerned about the liberties we're taking with his train set, the drone observed. Horza looked round at the wreckage and debris scattered near the train, then shrugged and went back to tinkering with the helmet. Maybe he's indifferent, he said. Or could it be he's enjoying all this? 
Una Harklosp said. Horza looked at it. The drone went on. This place is a monument to death, after all. A sacred place. Perhaps it is as much an altar as a monument, and we are merely carrying out a service of sacrifice for the gods. Horza shook his head. I think they left the fuse out of your imagination circuits, machine, he said, and looked back at the helmet. Unaha Klosp made a hissing noise and went to watch Wubslin poking around inside the mass sensor. What have you got against machines, Horza? Balveda said, interrupting her pacing to come and stand nearby. She rubbed her hands on her nose and ears now and again. Horza sighed and put down the helmet. Nothing, Balveda, as long as they stay in their place. Balveda made a snorting noise at that, then went on pacing. Yalson spoke from further up the ramp. Did you say something funny? I said machines ought to stay in their place. Not the sort of remark that goes down well with the culture. Yeah, Yasin said, still watching the Adiran. Then she looked down at the scarred area on the front of her suit where it had been hit by a plasma bolt. Horza, she said. Can we talk somewhere, not here? Horza looked up at her. Of course, he said, puzzled. Wubslin replaced Yalson on the ramp. Yalson walked to where Unahar Klosp floated over Nysin, its lights dim. It held an injector in one hazy field extension. How is he? she asked the machine. It turned its lights up. How does he look? it said. Yalson and Horza said nothing. The drone let its lights fade again. He might last a few more hours. Yalson shook her head and headed for the tunnel entrance which led to the transit tube, followed by Horza. She stopped inside just out of sight of the others, and turned to face the changer. She seemed to search for words but could not find them. She shook her head again and took off her helmet, leaning back against the curved tunnel wall. What's the problem, Yalson? he asked her. He tried to take her hand, but she crossed her arms. Are you having second thoughts about going on with this? She shook her head. No, I'm going on. I want to see this goddamn super brain. I don't care who gets it or if it gets blown up, but I want to find it. I didn't think you regarded it as that important. It's become important. She looked away, then back again, smiling uncertainly. Hell, I'd come along anyway, just to try and keep you out of trouble. I thought maybe you'd gone off me a little lately, he said. Yeah, Yasin said. Well, I haven't been... <sighs> she sighed heavily. <sighs> what the hell? What? Horza said. He saw her shrug. The small shaved head dropped again, silhouetted against the distant light. She shook her head. Oh, Horza, she said, and gave a small grunting laugh. You're not going to believe this. Believe what? I don't know that I should tell. Tell me, he said. I don't expect you to believe me, and if you do, I don't expect you to like it. Not all of it. I'm serious. Maybe I just shouldn't. She sounded genuinely troubled. He laughed lightly. Come on, Yalson, he said. You said too much to stop now. You just said you weren't one for turning back. What is it? I'm pregnant. He thought he'd misheard at first, and was going to make a joke about what he'd thought he'd just heard, but some part of his brain played the sounds her voice had made back, double-checking, and he knew that that was exactly what she'd said. She was right. He didn't believe it. He couldn't. Don't ask me if I'm sure, Yasin said. She was looking down again, fiddling with her fingers and staring at them, or the floor beyond in the darkness, her ungloved hands protruding nakedly from the suit arms and pressing against each other. I'm sure. She looked at him, though he couldn't see her eyes, and she wouldn't be able to see his. I was right, wasn't I? You don't believe me, do you? I mean, it is by you. That's why I'm telling you I wouldn't say anything if it... If you weren't... If I just happened to be... She shrugged. I thought maybe you'd guess when I asked about how much radiation we'd all absorbed. But now you're wondering how, aren't you? Well, Horza said, clearing his throat and shaking his head. It certainly shouldn't be possible. We're both... But we're from different species. It, it ought not to be possible. Well, there is an explanation. Yalson sighed, still looking at her fingers, as they picked and kneaded at each other. But I don't think you'll like that either. Try me. It's... it's like this. My mother... 
My mother lived on a rock, a, a traveling rock, just one of the many, you know, one of the oldest. It had been just tramping around the galaxy for maybe eight or nine thousand years, and wait a minute, Hosa said, one of who's oldest? My dad was some, some man from a place, a planet the rock stopped off at one time. My mother said she'd be back sometime, but she never did go back. I told her I'd go back sometime just to see him, if he's still alive. Pure sentimentalism, I guess, but I said I would, and I will sometime, if I live through this lot. She gave that same small half-laugh, half-grunt, and turned away from her picking fingers for a second to glance round the dark spaces of the station. Then her face again turned to the changer, and her voice was suddenly urgent, almost pleading. I'm only half-cultured by birth, Horsa. I, I let the rock as soon as I was old enough to aim a gun properly. I, I knew the culture wasn't the place for me. That's how I inherited the genofixing for trans-species mating. I never thought about it before. I it's supposed to be deliberate, or at least you've got to stop thinking yourself into not getting pregnant. But it, it didn't work this time. Maybe I let my guard slip somehow. It wasn't deliberate, Horsa. It really wasn't. It never occurred to me. It just happened. I how long have you known? Horsa asked quietly. Since I'm the cat? We were still a few days out from this place. I, I can't remember exactly. I, I didn't believe it at first. I know it's true, though. Look. She leaned closer to him, and the note of pleading was in her voice again. I can abort it. Just by thinking about it, I can get rid of it, if you want. Maybe I'd have done that already, but I know you've told me about not having any family, nobody to carry on your name, and I thought... Well, I don't care about my name. I, I just thought you... She broke off and suddenly put her head back and ran her fingers through her short hair. It's a nice thought, Yelson, he said. Yelson nodded silently and went back to picking her fingers again. Well, I'm giving you the choice, Horza, she said without looking at him. I can keep it, I can let it grow. I can keep it at the stage it's at now. It's up to you. Maybe I just don't want to have to make the decision. I mean, maybe I'm not being all noble and self-sacrificing, but there it is. You decide. Fuck knows what sort of weird crossbreed I might have inside me, but I thought you ought to know. Because I like you, and because... I don't know. Because it was about time I did something for somebody else for a change. She shook her head again, and her voice was confused, apologetic, resigned all at once. Or maybe because I want to do something to please myself, as usual. Oh. He had started to put his arms out to her and edge closer. She suddenly came toward him, wrapping her arms tight round him. Their suits made the embrace cumbersome, and his back felt tight and strained. But he held her to him, and rocked her gently backward and forward. It would only be a quarter culture, Hosa, if you want. I'm sorry to leave it to you, but if you don't want to know, okay, I'll... Think again and make my own decision. It's still part of me, so maybe I don't have any right to ask you. I, I don't really want to... She sighed mightily. Oh, God, I don't know, Horser. I really don't. Yelson, he said, having thought about what he was going to say. I don't give a damn your mother was from the culture. I don't give a damn why what has happened has happened. If you want to go through with it, that's fine by me. I don't give a damn about any crossbreeding either. He pushed her away slightly and looked into the darkness that was her face. I'm flattered, Yelson, and I'm grateful too. It's a good idea. Like you would say, what the hell? He laughed then, and she laughed with him, and they hugged each other tightly. He felt tears in his eyes, though he wanted to laugh at the incongruity of it all. Yelson's face was on the hard surface of his suit's shoulder, near a laser burn. Her body shook gently inside her own suit. Behind them in the station, the dying man stirred slightly and moaned in the cold and darkness without an echo. He held her for a little while, then she pushed away to look into his eyes again. Don't tell the others. <laughs> of course not, if that's what you want. Please, she said. In the dimmed glow of their suit lights, the down on her face and the hair on her head seemed to shine, like a hazy atmosphere around a planet seen from space. He hugged her again, unsure what to say. Surprise, partly, no doubt. But in addition, there was the fact that this revelation made whatever existed between them that much more important. And so he was more anxious than ever not to say the wrong thing, not to make a mistake. He could not let it mean too much. Not yet. She had paid him, perhaps, the greatest compliment he had ever had. But the very value of it frightened him, distracted him. 
He felt that whatever continuity of his name or clan the woman was offering him, he could not yet build his hopes upon it. The glimmer of that potential succession seemed too weak, and somehow also too temptingly defenceless to face the continuous frozen midnight of the tunnels. Thanks, Yelson. Let's get this over with, down here, then we'll have a better idea what we want to do. But even if you change your mind later... Thank you. It was all he could say. They returned to the station's dark cavern, just as the drone pulled a light sheet over Nysen's still form. Oh, there you are, it said. I didn't see any point in contacting you. Its voice was hushed. There wasn't anything you could have done. Satisfied? Avager asked Horza, after they had put Nysin's body with Dorlo's. They stood near the access gantry, where Yelson had resumed guard duty on the unconscious Idiran. I'm sorry about Nysin and Dorolo, Horza told the old man. I liked them too, I can understand you being upset. You don't have to stay here now, if you want, go back to the surface. It's safe now, we've accounted for them all. You've accounted for most of us too, haven't you? Avager said bitterly. You're no better than Creeklin. Shut up, Avager, Yelson said from the gantry. You're still alive. And you haven't done too badly either, have you, young lady? Avager said to her, you and your friend here. Yelson was quiet for a moment, then said, You're braver than I thought, Avager. Just remember, it doesn't bother me a bit you're older and smaller than me. You want me to kick your balls in? She nodded and pursed her lips, still staring at the limp body of the Adiran officer lying in front of her. I'll do it for you, old boy. Balveda came out to Avager and slipped her arm through his, starting to lead him away as she walked by. Avager, she said, let me tell you about the time. But Avager shrugged her away and went off by himself to sit with his back to the station wall opposite the reactor car. Horza looked down the platform to where the old man sat. He better watch his radiation meter, he said to Yelson. It's pretty hot down there near the reactor car. Yelson gnawed at another ration bar. Let the old bastard fry, she said. Zogzal woke up. Yalson watched him regain consciousness, then waved the gun at him. Tell the big creep to head on down the ramp, will you, Hauser? she said. Zogzal looked down at Hauser and struggled awkwardly to his feet. Don't bother, he said in Moraine. I can bark as well as you in this miserable excuse for a language. He turned to Yalson. After you, my man. I am a female, Yelson growled, and waved the gun down the ramp. Now get your trefoil ass down there. Horza's suit AG was finished. Unaha Klosp couldn't have taken Zoxal's weight anyway, so they would have to walk. Avager could float, so could Wubslin and Yelson, but Balveda and Horza would have to take turns riding on the pallet, and Zoxal would need to footslog the whole twenty-seven kilometres to Station 7. They left the two human bodies near the doors to the transit tubes, where they could collect them later. Horza threw the useless lump of the mine's remote drone to the station floor, then blasted it with his laser. Did that make you feel better? Avager said. Horza looked at the old man floating in his suit, ready to head up the tunnel with the rest of them. Tell you what, Avager, if you want to do something useful, why don't you float up to that access ramp and put a few shots through the head of Zoxal's comrade up there, just to make sure he's properly dead? Yes, Captain, Avager said, and gave a mock salute. He moved through the air to the ramp where the Adiran's body lay. OK, Horza said to the rest. Let's go. They entered the foot tunnel as Avager landed on the middle level of the access ramp. Avager looked down at the Adiran. The armoured suit was covered with burn marks and holes. The creature had one arm and one leg missing. There was blood, dried black all over the place. The Adiran's head was charred on one side, and where he had kicked it earlier, Avager could see the cracked keratin just below the left eye socket. The eye, dead, jammed open, stared at him. It looked loose in its bone hemisphere, and some sort of pus had oozed out of it. Avager pointed his gun at the head, setting the weapon to single shot. The first pulse blew the injured eye off. The second punched a hole in the creature's face under what might have been its nose. A jet of green liquid splashed out of the hole and landed on Avager's suit chest. He splashed some water from his flask over the mess and let it dribble off. Filth, he muttered to himself, shouldering his gun. All of it. Filth. Look. 
They were less than fifty metres into the tunnel. Avager had just entered it and started floating toward them when Wubslin shouted. They stopped, looking into the screen of the mass sensor. Almost at the centre of the close-packed green lines, there was a grey smudge. The reactor trace they were used to seeing, the sensor being fooled by the nuclear pile in the train behind them. Right at the very edge of the screen, straight ahead and over twenty-six kilometres away, there was another echo. It was no grey patch, no false trace. It was a harsh, bright pinpoint of light, like a star on the screen. Chapter 12 The Command System Engines A sky like chipped ice, a wind to cut you to the bloody core, too cold for snow for most of the journey. But once for eleven days and nights it came, a blizzard over the field of ice we walked on, howling like an animal with a bite like steel. The crystals of ice flowed like a single torrent over the hard and frozen land. You could not look into it or breathe, even trying to stand was near impossible. We made a hole, shallow and cold, and lay in it until the skies cleared. We were the walking wounded, straggled band. Some we lost when their blood froze in them. One just disappeared, at night in a storm of snow. Some died from their wounds. One by one we lost them, our comrades and our servants. Every one begged us make use what we could of their corpse once they were gone. We had so little food. We all knew what it meant. We were all prepared. Name a sacrifice more total or more noble. In that air, when you cried, the tears froze on your face with a cracking sound like a heart breaking. Mountains. The high passes we climbed to, famished in that thin and bitter air. The snow was white powder, dry as dust. To breathe it was to freeze from inside. Flurries from the jagged slopes, dislodged by feet in front, stung in the throat like acid spray. I saw rainbows in the crystal veils of ice and snow, which were the product of our passing, and grew to hate those colours. That freezing dryness, the starved high air and dark blue skies. Three glaciers we traversed losing two of our comrades in crevasses, beyond sight or sound, falling further than an echo's reach. Deep in the mountain ring we came to a marsh. It lay in that scoop like a cess for hope. We were too slow, too stupefied to save our quarrel, when he walked out into it and floundered there. We thought it could not be, with air so cold around us, even in that one sunlight. We thought it must be frozen, and we saw what only seemed to be, and our eyes would clear, and he would come walking back to us, not slip beneath that dark ooze out of reach. It was an oil marsh, we realized too late, after the tarry depths had claimed their toll from us. The next day, while we were still looking for a way across, the chill came harder still, and even that sludge locked itself to stillness, and we walked quickly to the other side. In the midst of frozen water, we began to die of thirst. We had little to heat the snow with save our own bodies, and eating that white dust until it numbed us made us groggy with the cold of it, slowing our speech and step. But we kept on, though the cold sucked at us, whether awake or trying to sleep, and the harsh sun blinded us in fields of glittering white and filled our eyes with pain. The wind cut us, snow tried to swallow us, mountains like cut black glass blocked us, and the stars on clear nights taunted us, but on we came. Near two thousand kilometers, little one, with only the small amount of food we could carry from the wreck. What little equipment had not been turned to junk by the barrier beast and our own determination. We were forty-four when we left the battle cruiser, twenty-seven when we began our trek across the snows, eight of my kind, nineteen of the Medial folk. Two of us completed the journey, and six of our servants. Do you wonder that we fell upon the first place we found with light and heat? Does it surprise you that we just took and did not ask? We had seen brave warriors and faithful servants die of cold, watched each other wear away as though the ice blasts had abraded us. We had looked into the cloudless, pitiless skies of a dead and alien place and wondered who might be eating who when the dawnlight came. We made a joke of it at first, but later, when we had marched a thirty day and most of us were dead, in ice gullies, mountain ravines, or raw in our own bellies, we did not think it so funny. Some of the last, perhaps, not believing our course was true, I think died of despair. We killed your human friends, these other changes. I killed one with my own hands. Another, the first, fell to a medjel while he still slept. 
The one in the control room fought bravely, and when he knew he was lost, destroyed many of the controls. I salute him. And there was another who put up a fight in the place where they stored things. He, too, died well. You should not grieve too much for them. I shall face my superiors with the truth in my eyes and heart. They will not discipline me. They will reward me, should I ever stand before them. Horza was behind the Adiran, walking down the tunnel after him, while Yalsen took a rest from guarding the tall tripod. Horza had asked Zogzal to tell him what had happened to the raiding party which had come to the planet inside the Chihertzi animal. The Adiran had responded with an oration. She, Horza said. What, human? Zogzal's voice rumbled down the tunnel. He hadn't bothered to turn round when he talked. He spoke to the clear air of the foot tunnel leading to Station 7, his powerful, bassy voice easily heard even by Wubslin and Avager, who were bringing up the rear of the small, motley band. You did it again, Horsa said, wearily, talking to the back of the Adiran's head. The one killed while asleep, it was a she, a woman, a female. Well, the Medjel attended to her. We laid them out in the corridor. Some of their food proved edible. It tasted like heaven to us. How long ago was that? Horsa asked. About eight days, I think. It is hard to keep time down here. We tried to construct a mass sensor immediately, knowing that it would be invaluable, but we were unsuccessful. All we had was what was undamaged from the changer base. Most of our own equipment had been attacked by the beast of the barrier, or had to be abandoned when we set off from the warp animal to come here, or left en route as we died off. You must have thought it was a bit of luck finding the mine so easily. Horza kept his rifle trained on the tall Idirin's neck, watching Zogzal all the time. The creature might be injured. Horza knew enough about the species to tell that the section leader was in pain just from the way he walked. But he was still dangerous. Horza didn't mind him talking, though. It passed the time. We knew it was injured. We found it in Station 6, and it did not move or show any sign of noticing us. We assumed that those were only the signs of its damage. We already knew that you had arrived. It was only a day ago. We accepted our good luck without second thoughts and prepared to make our escape. You only just stopped us. Another few hours and we would have had that train working. More likely you'd have blown yourself into radioactive dust, Horza told the Adiran. Think what you like, little one. I knew what I was doing. I'm sure, Horza said skeptically. Why did you take all the guns with you and leave the Medjel on the surface without a weapon? We had intended to take one of the changes alive and interrogate him, but failed. Our own fault, no doubt. Had we done so, we could have reassured ourselves there was nobody else down here ahead of us. We were so late in getting here, after all. We took all the available weaponry down with us and left the servant on the surface with only a communicator, so we didn't find the communicator, Horza interrupted. Good. He was supposed to hide it when not checking in, Zuxal said, then went on. So we had what little firepower we did possess where it might be needed most. Once we realized that we were in here by ourselves, we sent a servant up with a weapon for our guard. Unhappily for him, it would appear he arrived very shortly after you did. Don't worry, Horsa said. He did well. Damn nearly blew my head off. Zogzal laughed. Horsa flinched slightly at the sound. It was not only loud, it was cruel in a way Zoralandra's laugh had not been. His poor slave soul is at rest then, Zuxal boomed. His tribe can ask for no more. Horza refused to pause until they were halfway to Station 7. They sat in the foot tunnel, resting. The Adiran sat furthest down the tunnel. Horza, across the tunnel from him, and roughly six metres away, gun ready. Yelson was by his side. Horza, she said, looking at his suit and then at her own. I think we could take the AG of my suit. It does detach. We could rig it up to yours. It might look a bit untidy, but it would work. She looked into his face. His eyes shifted from Zuxal for a moment, then flicked back. I'm all right, he said. You keep the AG. He nudged her gently with his free arm and lowered his voice. You're carrying a bit more weight, after all. He grunted, then rubbed the side of the suit in faked pain when Yelson elbowed him hard enough to move him fractionally across the floor of the tunnel. Ouch, he said. I wish I hadn't told you now, Yelson said. Balveda, Zogzal said suddenly, turning his huge head slowly to look at the tunnel, past Horza and Yelson, 
Over the pallet and the drone Unaha Klosp, past Wumslin, watching the mass sensor, and Avager, to where the culture agent sat, her eyes closed, silent against the wall. Section leader, Belveda said, opening her calm eyes, looking down the tunnel to the Adiran. The changer says you are from the culture. That is the part he has cast you in. He would have me believe you are an agent of espionage. Zuxal put his head on one side, looking down the dark tube of tunnel at the woman sitting against the curved wall. You seem, like me, to be a captive of this man. Do you tell me you are what he says you are? Balveda looked at Horza, then at the Adiran, her slow gaze lazy, almost indolent. I am afraid so, section leader, she said. The Adiran moved his head from side to side, blinked his eyes, then rumbled, Most strange. I cannot imagine why you should all be trying to trick me, or why this one man should have such a hold over all of you. Yet his own story I find scarcely credible. If he really is on our side, then I have behaved in a way which may hinder the great cause, and perhaps even aid yours, woman, if you are who you say. Most strange. Keep thinking about it, Balveda drawled, then closed her eyes and put her head back against the tunnel wall again. Horses on his own side, not anybody else's, Avager said from further up the tunnel. He was speaking to the Adiran, but his gaze shifted to Horza at the end of his sentence, and he dropped his head, looking down at a container of food at his side, and picking a last few crumbs from it. That is the way with all of your kind, Suxal said to the old man who wasn't looking. It is how you are made. You must all strive to claw your way over the backs of your fellow humans during the short time you are permitted in the universe. Breathing when you can, so that the strongest strain survive and the weakest die. I would no more blame you for that than I would try to convert some non-sentient carnivore to vegetarianism. You are all on your own side. With us it is different. Suxal looked at Horza. You must agree with that, changer ally. You're different, all right, Horza said. But all I care about is you're fighting the culture. You may be God's gift or plague in the end result, but what matters to me is that at the moment you're against her lot. Horza nodded at Malveda, who didn't open her eyes, but did smile. What a pragmatic attitude, Zuxal said. Horza wondered if the others could hear the trace of humour in the giant's voice. Whatever did the culture do to you to make you hate it so? Nothing to me, Horza said. I just disagree with them. My, Suxal said, you humans never cease to surprise me. He hunched suddenly, and a crackling, booming noise like rocks being crushed came from his mouth. His great body shuddered. Zuxal turned his head away and spat onto the tunnel floor. He kept his head turned away while the humans looked at each other, wondering how badly injured the Adiran really was. Zuxal became silent. He leaned over and looked at whatever he had spat up made a distant, echoing sort of noise in his throat, then turned back to Horza. His voice was scratchy and hoarse when he spoke again. Yes, Mr. Changer, you are a strange fellow. Allow a little too much dissension in your ranks, mind you. Zogzal looked up the tunnel to Avager, who raised his head and glanced at the Adiran with a frightened expression. I get by, Horza told the section leader. He got to his feet, looking round the others and stretching his tired legs. Time to go. He turned to Zuxal. Are you fit to walk? Untie me and I could run too fast for you to escape, human, Zuxal purred. He unfolded his huge frame from its squatting position. Horza looked up into the dark, broad V of the creature's face and nodded slowly. Just think about staying alive so I can take you back to the fleet, Zuxal, Horza said. The chasing and fighting are over. We're all looking for the mind now. A poor hunt, human, Zuxal said. An ignominious end to the whole endeavor. You make me ashamed for you. But then, you are only human. Oh, shut up and start walking, Yalson told the Adiran. She stabbed at buttons on her suit control unit and floated into the air, level with Zuxal's head. The Adiran snorted and turned. He started to hobble off down the foot tunnel. One by one, they followed him. Horza noticed the Adiran starting to tire after a few kilometres. 
The giant steps became shorter. He moved the great keratinous plates of his shoulders more and more frequently, as though trying to relieve some ache within, and every so often his head shook as if he was trying to clear it. Twice he turned and spat at the walls. Hawser looked at the dripping patches of fluid, idiran blood. Eventually, Zogzal stumbled, his steps veering to one side. Hawser was walking behind him again, having had a spell on the pallet. He slowed down when he saw the Adirin start to sway, holding one hand up to let the others know as well. Zogzal made a low, moaning noise, half-turned, then, with a sideways stagger, the wires on his hobbled feet snapping tight and humming like strings on an instrument, he fell forward, crashing to the floor and lying still. Oh, somebody said. Stay back, Hawser said, then went carefully toward the long, inert body of the Adirin. He looked down at the great head, motionless on the tunnel floor. Blood oozed from under it, forming a pool. Yalson joined Hawser, a gun trained on the fallen creature. Is he dead? she asked. Hawser shrugged. He knelt down and touched the Adirin's body with his bare hand, at a point near the neck where it was sometimes possible to sense the steady flow of blood inside. But there was nothing. He closed, then opened one of the section leader's eyes. I don't think so. He touched the dark blood, gathering in its pool. Looks like he's bleeding badly inside. What can we do? Yasen said. Not a lot. Hawser rubbed his chin thoughtfully. What about some anticoagulant? Avager said from the far side of the pallet, while Balveda sat and watched the scene in front of her with dark, calm eyes. Ours doesn't work on them, Hawser said. Skin spray, Balveda said. They all looked at her. She nodded, looking at Hawser. If you have any medical alcohol and some skin spray, make up an equal solution. If he's got digestive tract injuries, that might help him. If it's respiratory, he's dead. Balveda shrugged at Hawser. Well, let's do something rather than stand around here all day, Yasen said. It's worth a try, Hawser said. Better get him upright if we want to pour the stuff down his throat. That, the drone said wearily from beneath the pallet, no doubt means me, him. If it's respiratory, he's dead. Balveda shrugged at Hawser. Well, let's do something rather than stand around here all day, Yasen said. It's worth a try, Hawser said. Better get him upright if we want to pour the stuff down his throat. That, the drone said wearily from beneath the pallet, no doubt means me. It floated forward, placing the pallet on the floor near Zoxile's feet. Balveda stepped off as the drone transferred the load from its back to the tunnel floor. It floated to where Yalson and Hawser stood by the prone Adirin. I'll lift with the drone, Hawser told Yalson, putting his gun down. You keep your gun on him. Wormslin, now kneeling on the tunnel floor and fiddling with the controls of the mass sensor, whistled quietly to himself. Balveda went round the back of the pallet to watch. There it is. Wormslin smiled at her, nodding at the bright white dot on the green line screen. Isn't that a beauty? Station seven, you reckon, Wormslin? Balveda hunched her slim shoulders and shoved her hands deep into her jacket pockets. She wrinkled her nose as she watched the screen. She could smell herself. They were all smelling, all giving off animal scents after their time down there without washing. Wubslin was nodding. Must be, he said to the culture agent. Hawser and the drone struggled to get the slack-limbed Idirin into a sitting position. Avager went forward to help, taking off his helmet as he went. Must be, Wubslin breathed more to himself than to Balveda. His gun fell off his shoulder and he took it off, frowning at the jammed reel which was supposed to take up the slack on the weapon's strap. He placed the weapon on the pallet and went back to tinkering with the mass sensor. Balveda edged closer, peering over the engineer's shoulder. Wubslin looked round and up at her as Hawser and the drone Unaha Klosp slowly heaved Zoxal from the floor. Wubslin smiled awkwardly at the culture agent and moved the laser rifle he had placed on the pallet further away from Balveda. Balveda gave a small smile in return and took a step backward. She took her hands out of her pockets and folded her arms watching Wubslin work from a little further away. Heavy bastard, Hawser gasped, as he, Avager and Unaha Klosp finally pulled and pushed Zuxal's back against the side of the tunnel. The massive head was angled limply forward over his chest. Liquid drooled from the side of his huge mouth. Hawser and Avager straightened. Avager stretched his arms, grunting. Zuxal seemed dead. For a second, maybe two. 
Then it was as though some immense force blasted him away from the wall. He threw himself forward and sideways, one arm whacking into Hawser's chest and sending the changer cannoning into Yalson. At the same time, his partly buckled legs flicking straight. The Adiran pounced away from the group forward of the pallet, past Avager, thrown against the tunnel wall, and Unahar Klosp slapped into the floor of the tunnel with Zuxal's other hand toward the pallet. Zuxal flew over the pallet, his raised arm and massive fist coming down. Wubslin's hand hadn't even started to move for his gun. The Adiran brought his fist down with all his strength, shattering the mass sensor with a single crushing blow. His other hand flashed out to snatch the laser. Wubslin threw himself back instinctively, knocking into Balveda. Zuxal's hand snapped shut round the laser rifle like a sprung trap round an animal's leg. He rolled through the air and over the disintegrating wreckage of the sensor. The gun twirled in his hand, pointing back down the tunnel to where Horza, Yelson and Avager were still trying to recover their balance, and Unahar Klosp was just starting to move. Zuxal steadied briefly and aimed straight at Horza. Unahar Klosp slammed into the Idiran's lower jaw like a small, badly streamlined missile, lifting the section leader bodily from the pallet, stretching his neck on his shoulders, jerking all three of his legs together and throwing his arms out to each side. Zuxal landed with a thud beside Wubslin and lay still. Horza stooped and grabbed his gun. Yalson ducked and swivelled, bringing her gun to bear. Wubslin sat up. Balveda had staggered back after Wubslin had fallen against her, a hand at her mouth. She stood now, staring down at where Unahar Klosp hovered in the air over Zuxal's face. Avager rubbed his head and looked resentfully at the wall. Horza went over to the Adiran. Zuxal's eyes were closed. Wubslin tore his rifle from the Adiran's slack fist. Not bad, drone, Horza said, nodding. The machine turned to him. Unahar Klosp! It said exasperatedly. OK, he sighed. Well done, Unahar Klosp. Horza went to look at Zuxal's wrists. The wires had been snapped. The wires on his legs were intact, but those on his arms had been broken like threads. I didn't kill him, did I? Unahar Klosp said. Horza, the barrel of his rifle against Zuxal's head, shook his head. Zuxal's body started to tremble. His eyes flicked open. No, I'm not dead, little friends, the Adiran rumbled, and the cracking, scraping noise of his laughter echoed through the tunnels. He levered his torso slowly from the ground. Horza kicked him in the side. You little one, Zuxal laughed before Horza could say any more. Is this how you treat your allies? He rubbed his jaw, moving fractured plates of keratin. I am injured, the great voice announced, then broke with laughter again the big V head rocking forward toward the wreckage lying on the back of the pallet, but not yet in the same state as your precious mass sensor. Horza rammed his gun against the Adiran's head. I ought, you ought to blow my head off right now. I know, Changer. I have told you already you should. Why don't you? Horza tightened his finger round the trigger, holding his breath, then roared, shouted without words or sense at the seated figure in front of him, and strode off past the pallet. Tie that motherfucker up, he bellowed, and stamped by Yelson, who pivoted briefly to watch him go. Then she turned back with a small shake of her head to watch while Avager, helped by Wubslin, who cast the occasional mournful look at the debris from the mass sensor, trussed the Adiran's arms down tightly to his sides with several loops of wire. Zoxal was still shaking with laughter. I think it sensed my mass. I think it sensed my fist. <laughs> I hope somebody told that three-legged scumbag we still have a mass sensor in my seat, Horza said, when Yalson caught up with him. Yalson looked over her shoulder, then said, Well, I told him, but I don't think he believed me. She looked at Horza. Is it working? Horza glanced at the small repeater screen on his wrist controls. Not at this range, but it will when we get closer. We'll still find the thing, don't worry. I'm not worried, Yalson said. You going to come back and join us? She looked back at the others again. They were twenty metres behind. Zoxal, still chortling now again, was in front, with Wubslin walking behind, guarding the Adiran with a stun gun. Balveda sat on the pallet, with Avager floating behind. Horza nodded. I suppose so. Let's wait here. He halted. Yalson, who'd been walking rather than floating, stopped too. They leaned against the tunnel wall as Zoxal came closer. How are you, anyway? 
Hosa asked the woman. Yelson shrugged. Fine. How are you? I meant, Hosa began, I know what you meant, Yelson said. And I told you I'm fine. Now stop being such a pain in the ass. She smiled at him. Okay? Okay, Hosa said, pointing the gun at Zoxal as the Adiran went past. Lost your way, Changer, the giant rumbled. Just keep walking, Hosa told him. He fell into step alongside Wubslin. Sorry I put my gun down on the pallet, the engineer said. It was stupid. Never mind, Hauser told him. It was the sensor he was after. The gun must have just been a pleasant surprise. Anyway, the drone saved us. Hauser gave a kind of snort through his nose like a laugh. The drone saved us, he repeated to himself, and shook his head. Ah, my soul, my soul, all is darkness now. Now I die. Now I slip away and nothing will be left. I am frightened. Great one, pity me, but I am frightened. No sleep of victory. I heard. Merely my death. Darkness and death. Moment for all to become one. Instance of annihilation. I have failed. I heard and now I know. Failed. Death too good for me. Oblivion-like release, more than I deserve, much more I cannot let go. I must hold on because I do not deserve a quick, willed end. My comrades wait, but they do not know how much I have failed. I am not worthy to join them. My clan must weep. Ah, this pain. Darkness and pain. They came to the station. The command system train towered over the platform, its dark length glistening in the lights of the small band of people entering the station. Well, here we are at last, Una Harklosp said. It stopped and let Balveda slide off the pallet, then put the slab with its supplies and material down on the dusty floor. Horza ordered the Adiran to stand against the nearest access gantry and tied him against it. Well, Zuxal said, as Horza strapped him to the metal. What of your mind, little one? He looked down like a reproachful adult at the human wrapping the wire around his body. Where is it? I don't see it. Patience, section leader, Horsa said. He secured the wire and tested it, then stepped back. Comfortable? he asked. My gut's ache, my chin is broken, and my hand has pieces of your mass sensor embedded in it, Zaxal said. Also, my mouth is a little sore inside where I bit it earlier to produce all that convincing blood. Otherwise, I am well. Thank you, ally. Zuxal bowed his head as much as he was able. Don't go away now. Horza smiled thinly. He left Yalson to guard Zuxal and Balveda while he and Wubslin went to the power switching room. I'm hungry, Avager said. He sat on the pallet and opened a ration bar. Inside the switching room, Horza studied the meters, switches and levers for a few moments, then started to adjust the controls. I, uh, Wubson began, scratching his brow through the open visor of his helmet. I was wondering about the mass sensor in your suit. I is it working? Lights came on in one control group, a bank of twenty dials glowing faintly. Horsa studied the dials and then said, No, I already checked. It's getting a low reading from the train, but nothing else. It's been that way since about two kilometres back up the tunnel. Either the mine's gone since the ship's sensor was smashed, or this one in my suit isn't working properly. Oh, shit, Wubslin sighed. What the hell, Horsa said, flicking some switches and watching more meters light up. Let's get the power on. Maybe we'll think of something. Yes, Wubslin nodded. He glanced back out through the open doors of the room, as if to see whether the lights were coming on yet. All he saw was the dark shape of Yalson's back out on the dim platform. A section of shadowy train, three stories high, showed beyond. Horsa went to another wall and repositioned some levers. He tapped a couple of dials, peered into a bright screen, then rubbed his hands together and put his thumb over a button on the central console. Well, this is it, he said. He brought his thumb down on the button. Yes! Hey! We did it! About time, too, if you ask me. Hmm, little ones, well, that's how it's done. Shit, if I'd known it was this colour, I wouldn't have started eating it. Horsa heard the others, 
He took a deep breath and turned to look at Wobslin. The stocky engineer stood, blinking slightly in the bright lights of the power control room. He smiled. Great, he said, looking round the room, still nodding. Great, at last. Well done, Horza, Yarsen said. Horza could hear other switches, bigger ones, automatics linked to the master switch he had closed, moving in the space beneath his feet. Humming noises filled the room, and the smell of burning dust rose like the warm scent of an awakening animal all around him. Light flooded in from the station outside. Horza and Wobslin checked a few meters and monitors, then went outside. The station was bright. It sparkled. The grey-black walls reflected the strip lights and glow panels which covered the roof. The command system train, now seen properly for the first time, filled the station from end to end, a shining metal monster, like a vast android version of a segmented insect. Yalson took off her helmet, ran her fingers through her short cropped hair, and looked up and around, squinting in the bright yellow-white light falling from the station roof high above. Now then, Una Harklosp said, floating over toward Horza. The machine's casing glittered in the harsh new light. Where exactly is this device we're looking for? It came close to Horza's face. Does your suit sensor register it? Is it here? Have we found it? Horza pushed the machine away with one hand. Give me time, drone. We only just got here. I got the power on, didn't I? He walked past it, followed by Yalson, still looking about her, and Wobslin also staring, though mostly at the gleaming train. Lights shone inside it. The station filled with the hum of idling motors, the hiss of air circulators and fans. Unaha Klosp floated round to face Horza, reversing through the air while keeping level with the man's face. What do you mean? Surely all you have to do is look at the screen. Can you see the mind on there or not? The drone came closer, dipping down to look at the controls and the small screen on Horza's suit cuff. He swatted it away. I'm getting some interference from the reactor. Horza glanced at Webslin. We'll cope with it. Take a look round the repair area. Check the place out, Yalson said to the machine. Make yourself useful. It isn't working, is it? Unaha Klosp said. It kept pace with Horza, still facing him and backing through the air in front of him. That three-legged lunatic smashed the mass sensor on the pallet, and now we're blind. We're back to square one, aren't we? No, Horza said impatiently. We are not. We'll repair it. Now, how about doing something useful for a change? For a change? Unaha Klosp said, with what sounded like feeling. For a change? You're forgetting who it was who saved all our skins back in the tunnels when our cute little Edirin liaison officer over there started running amok. All right, drone, Horza said through clenched teeth. I've said thank you. Now why don't you take a look around the station, just in case there's anything to be seen? Like mines you can't spot on wasted suit mass sensors, for example? And what are you lot going to be doing while I'm doing that? Resting, Horza said, and thinking. He stopped at Zogzal and inspected the Adirans' bonds. Oh, great, Unahar Klosp sneered. And a lot of good all your thinking has done. For fuck's sake, Unahar Klosp, Yalson said, sighing heavily. Either go or stay, but shut up. I see. Right. Unahar Klosp drew away from them and rose in the air. I'll just go and lose myself then. I should have... It was floating away as it spoke. Horza shouted over the drone's voice. Before you go, can you hear any alarms? What? Unaha Klosp came to a halt. Wubslin put a pained, studious expression on his face and looked around the station's bright walls, as though making an effort to hear about the frequencies his ears could sense. Unaha Klosp was silent for a moment, then said, No, no alarms. I'm going now. I'll check out the other train. When I think you might be in a more amenable mood, I'll come back. It turned and sped off. Dorolo would have heard the alarms, Avager muttered, but nobody heard. Wobslin looked up at the train, gleaming in the station lights, and like it, seemed to glow from within. What is this? Is it light? Though I imagine it? Am I dying? Is this what happens? Am I dying now, so soon? I thought I had a while left, and I don't deserve... Light. It is light. I can see again. Welded to the cold metal by his own dry blood, his body cracked and twisted, mutilated and dying, he opened his one good eye as far as he could. 
mucus had dried on it, and he had to blink, trying to clear it. His body was a dark and alien land of pain, a continent of torment. One eye left, one arm, a leg missing just lopped off. One numb and paralysed, another broken. He tested to make sure, trying to move that limb. A pain like fire flashed through him, like a lightning flash over the shadowed country that was his body and his pain. And my face. My face. He felt like a smashed insect, abandoned by some children after an afternoon's cruel play. They had thought he was dead, but he was not built the way they were. A few holes were nothing. An amputated limb, well, his blood did not gush like theirs when a leg or arm was removed. He remembered a recording of a human dissection, and for the warrior there was no shock, not like their poor, soft, flesh-flabby systems. He had been shot in the face, but the beam or bullet had not penetrated through the internal keratin brain cover or severed his nerves. Similarly, his eyes had been smashed, but the other side of his face was intact, and he could still see. It was so bright. His sight cleared and he looked without moving at the station roof. He could feel himself dying slowly, an internal knowledge which again they might not have had. He could feel the slow leak of his blood inside his body, sense the pressure build-up in his torso and the faint oozing through cracks in his keratin. The remains of the suit would help him but not save him. He could feel his internal organs slowly shutting down, too many holes from one system to another. His stomach would never digest his last meal, and his anterior lung sac, which normally held a reserve of hyperoxygenated blood for use when his body needed its last reserves of strength, was emptying, its precious fuel being squandered in the losing battle his body fought against the falling pressure of his blood. Dying. I am dying. What difference, whether it is in darkness or in light? Great one. Fallen comrades, children, and mate. Can you see me any better in this deeply buried alien glare? My name is Quayanol, Great One, and... The idea was brighter than the pain when he tried to move his shattered leg, brighter than the station's silent, staring glow. They had said they were going to Station 7. It was the last thing he remembered, apart from the sight of one of them floating through the air toward him. That one must have shot him in the face. He couldn't remember it happening, but it made sense. Sent to make sure he was dead. But he was alive, and he had just had an idea. It was a long shot, even if he could get it to work, even if he could shift himself, even if it all worked. A long shot, in every sense. But it would be doing something. It would be a suitable end for a warrior, whatever happened. The pain would be worth it. He moved quickly, before he could change his mind, knowing that there might be little time, if he wasn't already too late. The pain seared through him like a sword. From his broken, bloody mouth, a shout came. Nobody heard. His shout echoed in the bright station. Then there was silence. His body throbbed with the aftershock of pain, but he could feel that he was free. The blood weld was broken. He could move. In the light, he could move. Zogzarl, if you are still alive, I may soon have a little surprise for our friends. Drone? What? Horza wants to know what you're doing. Yalsen spoke into her helmet communicator, looking at the changer. I'm searching this train, the one in the repair section. I would have said if I'd found anything, you know. Have you got that suit sensor working yet? Horza made a face at the helmet Yalsen held on her knees. He reached over and switched off the communicator. It's right, though, isn't it? Avager said, sitting on the pallet. That one in your suit isn't working, is it? There's some interference from the train's reactor, Horza told the old man. That's all. We can deal with it. Avager didn't look convinced. Horza opened a drink canister. He felt tired, drained. There was a sense of anti-climax now, having got the power on but not found the mind. He cursed the broken mass sensor and Zoxal and the mind. He didn't know where the damn thing was, but he'd find it. Right now, though, he just wanted to sit and relax. He needed to give his thoughts time to collect. He rubbed his head where it had been bruised in the firefight in Station 6. It hurt, distantly, naggingly inside. Nothing serious, but it would have been distracting if he hadn't been able to shut the pain off. 
Don't you think we should search this train now? Wubslin said, gazing up hungrily at the shining curved bulk of it in front of them. Hawser smiled at the engineer's rapt expression. Yes, why not, he said. On you go, take a look. He nodded at the grinning Wubslin, who swallowed a last mouthful of food and grabbed his helmet. Right. Yeah, might as well start now, he said, and walked off quickly, past the motionless figure of Zoxal, up the access ramp and into the train. Balveda was standing with her back against the wall, her hands in her pockets. She smiled at Wubslin's retreating back as he disappeared into the train's interior. Are you going to let him drive that thing, Hawser? she asked. Somebody may have to, Hawser said. We'll need some sort of transport to take us round if we're going to look for the mind. What fun, Balveda said. We could all just go riding round in circles for ever and ever. Not me, Ava just said, turning from Hawser to look at the culture agent. I'm going back to the cat. I'm not going round looking for this damn computer. Good idea, Yasen said, looking at the old man. We could make you a sort of prisoner detail, send you back with Zakzal, just the two of you. I'll go alone, Ava just said in a low voice, avoiding Yasen's gaze. I'm not afraid. Zakzal listened to them talk. Such squeaky, scratchy voices. He tested his bonds again. The wire had cut a couple of millimetres into his keratin, on his shoulders, thighs and wrists. It hurt a little, but it would be worthwhile, maybe. He was quietly cutting himself on the wire, rubbing with all the force he could muster against the places where the wire held him tightest, chafing the nail-like cover of his body deliberately. He'd taken a deep breath and flexed all the muscles he could when he was tied up, and that had given him just enough room to move. But he would need a little more if he was to have any chance of working his way loose. He had no plan, no time scale. He had no idea when he might have an opportunity. But what else could he do? Stand there like a stuffed dummy, like a good boy, while these squirming, soft-bodied worms scratched their pulpy skin and tried to work out where the mind was. A warrior could do no such thing. He had come too far, seen too many die. Hey! Wubslin opened a small window on the top story of the train and leaned out, shouting to the others. These elevators work. I just came up in one. Everything works. Yeah? Yasen waved. Great, Wubslin. The engineer ducked back inside. He moved through the train, testing and touching, inspecting controls and machinery. Quite impressive, though, isn't it? Balveda said to the others. For its time. Hawser nodded, gazing slowly from one end of the train to the other. He finished the drink in the container and put it down on the pallet as he stood up. Yes, it is, but much good it did them. Quernall dragged himself up the ramp. A pall of smoke hung in the station air, hardly shifting in the slow circulation of air. Fans were working in the train, though, and what movement there was in the grey-blue cloud came mostly from the places where open doors and windows blew the acrid mist out from the carriages, replacing it with air scrubbed by the train's conditioning and filter system. He dragged himself through wreckage, bits and pieces of wall and train, even scraps and shards from his own suit. It was very hard and slow, and he was already afraid he would die before he even got to the train. His legs were useless. He would probably be doing better if the other two had been blown off as well. He crawled with his one good arm, grasping the edge of the ramp and pulling with all his might. The effort was agonizingly painful. Every time he pulled, he thought it would grow less, but it didn't. It was as though for each of the two long seconds he hauled at that ramp edge and his broken, bleeding body scraped further at the littered surface, his blood vessels ran with acid. He shook his head and mumbled to himself. He felt blood run from the cracks in his body, which had healed while he lay still, and now were being ripped open again. He felt tears run from his one good eye. He sensed the slow weep of healing fluid welling where his other eye had been torn from his face. The door ahead of him shone through the bright mist, a faint air current coming from it, making curls in the smoke. His feet scraped behind him, and his suit chest ploughed a small bow wave of wreckage from the surface of the ramp as he moved. He gripped the ramp's edge again and pulled. He tried not to call out, not because he thought there was anyone to hear and be warned, but because all his life, from when he had first got to his feet by himself, he had been taught to suffer in silence. He did try, he could remember his nest quirl and his mother parent teaching him not to cry out, and it was shaming to disobey them. But sometimes it got too much, 
Sometimes the pain squeezed the noise from him. On the station roof, some of the lights were out, hit by stray shots. He could see the holes and punctures in the train's shining hull, and he had no idea what damage might have been done to it. But he couldn't stop now. He had to go on. He could hear the train. He could listen to it like a hunter, listening to a wild animal. The train was alive, injured. Some of its whirring motors sounded damaged, but it was alive. He was dying, but he would do his best to capture the beast. What do you think? Hawser asked Wubslin. He had tracked the engineer down under one of the command system train carriages, hanging upside down looking at the wheel motors. Hawser had asked Wubslin to take a look at the small device on his suit chest, which was the main body of the mass sensor. I don't know, Wubslin said, shaking his head. He had his helmet on and visor down, using the screen to magnify the view of the sensor. It's so small. I'd need to take it back to the cat to have a proper look at it. I didn't bring all my tools with me. He made a tutting noise. It looks all right. Can't see any obvious damage. Maybe the reactors are putting it off. Damn, we'll have to search then, Hawser said. He let Wobslin close the small inspection panel on the suit front. The engineer leaned back and shoved his visor up. The only trouble is, he said glumly, if the reactors are interfering, there isn't much point in taking the train to look for the mind. We'll have to use the transit tube. We'll search the station first, Hawser said. He stood up. Through the window across the station platform, he could see Yalson standing watching Balveda as the culture woman paced slowly up and down the smooth rock floor. Avager still sat on the pallet. Zoxal stood strapped to the girders of the access ways. OK if I go up to the control deck, Wubslin said. Hawser looked into the engineer's broad, open face. Yeah, why not? Don't try to get it to move just yet, though. OK, Wubslin said, looking happy. Changer said Zoxal, as Hawser walked down the access ramp. What? These wires. They are too tight. They are cutting into me. Hawser looked carefully at the wires round the Adirin's arms. Too bad, he said. They cut into my shoulders, my legs and my wrists. If the pressure goes on, they will cut through to my blood vessels. I should hate to die in such an inelegant manner. By all means, blow my head off, but this slow slicing is undignified. I only tell you because I am starting to believe you do intend to take me back to the fleet. Hawser went behind the Adirin to look at where the wires crossed over Zoxal's wrists. He was telling the truth. The wires had cut into him, like fence wire into tree bark. The changer frowned. I've never seen that happen, he said to the motionless rear of the Adirin's head. What are you up to? Your skin's harder than that. I am up to nothing, human, Zoxal said wearily, sighing heavily. My body is injured. It tries to rebuild itself. Of necessity it becomes more pliable, less hardy, as it tries to rebuild the damaged parts. Ah, if you don't believe me, never mind, but don't forget that I did warn you. I'll think about it, Hawser said. If it gets too bad, shout out. He stepped out through the girders, back onto the station floor, and walked toward the others. I shall have to think about that, Zuxal said quietly. Warriors are not given to shouting out because they are in pain. So, Yalson said to the changer, is Wubslin happy? Worried he won't get to drive the train, Hawser told her. What's the drone doing? Taking its time looking through the other train. Well, we'll leave it there, Hawser said. You and I can search the station. Avager? He looked at the old man, who was using a small piece of plastic to prise bits of food from between his teeth. What? Avager said looking up suspiciously at the changer. Watch the Adiran. We're going to take a look around the station. Avager shrugged. All right, I suppose so. Not too many places I can go for the moment. He inspected the end of the piece of plastic. He reached out, took hold of the end of the ramp and pulled. He moved forward on a wave of pain. He gripped the edge of the train door and hauled again. He slid and scraped from the ramp and onto the interior floor of the train itself. When he was fully inside, he rested. Blood made a steady roar inside his head. His hand was becoming tired now and sore. It was not the aching, grinding pain from his wounds, but it worried him more. He was afraid that his hand would soon seize up, that it would grow too weak to grip, and he would be unable to haul himself along. 
At least now the way was level. He had a carriage and a half to drag himself, but there was no slope. He tried to look back, behind and down to the place he had lain, but could manage only a brief glimpse before he had to let his head fall back. There was a scraped and bloody trail on the ramp, as though a broom laced with purple paint had been dragged through the dust and debris of the metal surface. There was no point in looking back. His only way was forward. He had only a little while left. In a half hour or less he would be dead. He would have had longer just lying on the ramp, but moving had shortened his life, quickened the sapping forces steadily draining him of strength and vitality. He hauled himself toward the longitudinal corridor. His two useless, shattered legs slithered after him on a thin slick of blood. Ginger! Horsa frowned. He and Jolson were setting out to look over the station. The Adiran called Horsa when he was only a few steps away from the pallet where Avager now sat, looking fed up and pointing his gun in roughly the same direction as Balveda, while the culture agent continued pacing up and down. Yes, Zogzal, Horsa said. These wires, they will slice me up soon. I only mention it because you have so studiously avoided destroying me so far. It would be a pity to die accidentally due to an oversight. Please, go on your way if you cannot be bothered. You want the wires loosened? The merest fraction. They have no given them, you see, and it would be nice to breathe without dissecting myself. If you try anything this time, Horsa told Idiran, coming close to him, gun pointed at his face, I'll blow both your arms and all three legs off and slide you home on the pallet. Your threatened cruelty has convinced me, human. You obviously know the shame we attach to prosthetics, even if they are the result of battle wounds. I shall behave. Just loosen the wires a little, like a good ally. Horsa loosened the wires slightly where they were cutting into Zoxal's body. The section leader flexed and made a loud sighing sound with his mouth. Much better, little one. Much better. Now I shall live to face whatever retribution you may imagine is mine. Depend on it, Horsa said. If he breathes belligerently, he told Avager, shoot his legs off. Oh, yes, sir, Avager said, saluting. Hoping to trip over the mind, Horsa? Balveda asked him. She had stopped pacing and stood facing him and Yelson, her hands in her pockets. One never knows, Balveda, Horsa said. Tomb robber, Balveda said through a lazy smile. Horsa turned to Yelson. Tell Wubslin we're leaving. Ask him to keep an eye on the platform, make sure Avager doesn't fall asleep. Yelson raised Wubslin on the communicator. You'd better come with us, Horsa told Balveda. I don't like leaving you here with all this equipment switched on. Oh, Horsa, Balveda smiled. Don't you trust me? Just walk in front and shut up, Horsa said in a tired voice, and pointed to indicate the direction he wanted to go in. Balveda shrugged and started walking. Does she have to come? Yarsen said, as she fell into step beside Horsa. We could always lock her up, Horsa said. He looked at Yarsen, who shrugged. Ah, oh, what the hell, she said. Unaha Klosp floated through the train. Outside, it could see the repair and maintenance cavern, all its machinery, lathes and forges, welding rigs, articulated arms, spare units, huge hanging cradles, a single suspended gantry like a narrow bridge, glinting in the bright overhead lights. The train was interesting enough. The old technology provided things to look at and bits and pieces to touch and investigate. But Unaha Klosp was mostly just glad to be by itself for a while. It had found the company of the humans wearing after a few days, and the changer's attitude distressed it most of all. The man was a speciesist. Me, just a machine, thought Unaha Klosp. How dare he? It had felt good when it had been able to react first in the tunnels, perhaps saving some of the others, perhaps even saving that ungrateful changer by knocking Zoxal out. Much as it disliked admitting it, the drone had felt proud when Horsa had thanked it. But it hadn't really altered the man's view. He would probably forget what had happened, or try to tell himself it was just a momentary aberration by a confused machine, a freak. Only Unaha Klosp knew what it felt. Only it knew why it had risked injury to protect the humans. Or it should know, it told itself ruefully. Maybe it shouldn't have bothered. 
Maybe it should have just let the Adirans shoot them. It just hadn't seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Mug, you know how Klosp told itself. It drifted through the bright, humming spaces of the train, like a detached part of the mechanism itself. Wubslin scratched his head. He'd stopped at the reactor car on his way to the control deck. Some of the reactor carriage doors wouldn't open. They had to be on some sort of security lock, probably controlled from the bridge, or flight deck, or footplate, or whatever they call the bit at the nose the train was controlled from. He looked out of a window, remembering what Horza had ordered. Avager sat on the pallet, his gun pointing at the Adiran, who stood stock still against the girders. Wubslin looked away, tested the door through to the reactor area again, then shook his head. The hand, the arm, was weakening. Above him, rows of seats faced blank screens. He pulled himself along by the stems of the chairs. He was almost at the corridor, which led through to the front car. He wasn't sure how he would get through the corridor. What was there to hold on to? No point in worrying about it now. He grabbed at another chair stem, hauled at it. From the terrace, which looked over the repair area, they could see the front train, the one the drone was in. Poised over the sunken floor of the maintenance area, the glittering length of the train, nestling in the scooped half-tunnel which ran along the far wall, looked like a long, thin spaceship, and the dark rock around it like starless space. Yelson watched the culture agent's back, frowning. She's too damn docile, Horza, she said, just loud enough for the man to hear. That's fine by me, Horza said. The more docile, the better. Yalson shook her head slightly, not taking her eyes off the woman in front. No, she's stringing us along. She hasn't cared up till now. She's known she can afford to let things happen. She's got another card she can play, and she's just relaxing until she has to use it. You're imagining things, Horza told her. Your hormones are getting the better of you, developing suspicions and second sight. She looked at him, transferring the frown from Balveda to the changer. Her eyes narrowed. What? Horza held up his free hand. A joke, he smiled. Yalson looked unconvinced. She's up to something, I can tell, she said. She nodded to herself. I can feel it. Quernall dragged himself through the connecting corridor. He pushed open the door to the carriage, crawled slowly across the floor. He was starting to forget why he was doing this. He knew he had to press on, go forward, keep crawling. But he could no longer recall exactly what it was all for. The train was a torture maze designed to pain him. I am dragging myself to my death. Somehow, even when I get to the end, where I can crawl no more, I keep going. I remember thinking that earlier, but what was I thinking of? Do I die when I get to the train's control area and continue my journey on the other side in death? Is that what I was thinking of? I'm like a tiny child crawling over the floor. Come to me, little fellow, says the train. We were looking for something, but I can't recall exactly what. It. They looked through the great cavern, searching, then climbed steps to the gallery, giving access to the station's accommodation and storage sections. Balveda stood at the edge of the broad terrace which ran round the cavern, midway between floor and roof. Yalson watched the culture agent while Horza opened the doors to the accommodation section. Balveda looked out over the broad cavern, slender hands resting on the guard rail. The topmost rail was level with Balveda's shoulders, waist level on the people who had built the command system. Near where Balveda stood, a long gantry led out over the cavern, suspended on wires from the roof and leading to the terrace on the other side, where a narrow, brightly lit tunnel led into the rock. Balveda looked down the length of the narrow gantry at the distant tunnel mouth. Yalson wondered if the culture woman was thinking of making a run for it, but knew she wasn't, and wondered then whether perhaps she only wanted Balveda to try so she could shoot her, just to be rid of her. Balveda looked away from the narrow gantry, and Horza swung open the doors to the accommodation section. Zugzal flexed his shoulders. The wires moved a little, sliding and bunching. The human they had left to guard him looked tired, perhaps even sleepy. But Zogzal couldn't believe the others would stay away for very long. 
He couldn't afford to do too much now in case the changer came back and noticed how the wires had moved. Anyway, though it was far from being the most interesting way things could fall, there was apparently a good chance that the humans would be unable to find the supposedly sentient computing device they were all looking for. In that case, perhaps, the best course of action would be no action. He would let the little ones take him back to their ship. Probably the one called Horza intended to ransom him. This had struck Zogzal as the most likely explanation for being kept alive. The fleet might pay for the return of a warrior, though Zogzal's family were officially barred from doing so, and, anyway, were not rich. He could not decide whether he wanted to live and perhaps redeem the shame of being caught and paid for by future exploits, or to do all he could either to escape or to die. Action appealed to him most. It was the warrior's creed. When in doubt, do. The old human got up from the pallet and walked around. He came close enough to Zogzal to be able to inspect the wires, but gave them only a perfunctory glance. Zogzal looked at the laser gun the human carried. His great hands, tied together behind his back, opened and closed slowly, without him thinking about it. Wobslin came to the control deck in the nose of the train. He took his helmet off and put it on the console. He made sure it wasn't touching any controls, just covering a few small, unlit panels. He stood in the middle of the deck, looking round with wide, fascinated eyes. The train hummed under his feet. Dials and meters, screens and panels indicated the train's readiness. He cast his eyes over the controls, set in front of two huge seats which faced over the front console toward the armoured glass which formed part of the train's steeply sloping nose. The tunnel in front was dark, only a few small lights burning on its side walls. Fifty meters in front, a complex assembly of points led the tracks into two tunnels. One route went dead ahead, where Wubslin could see the rear of the train in front. The other tunnel curved, avoiding the repair and maintenance cavern and giving a through route to the next station. Wubslin touched the glass, stretching his arm out over the control console to feel the cold, smooth surface. He grinned to himself. Glass, not a view screen. He preferred that. The designers had had holographic screens and superconductors and magnetic levitation. They had used all of them in the transit tubes. But for their main work, they had not been ashamed to stick to the apparently cruder but more damage-tolerant technology. So the train had armoured glass, and it ran on metal tracks. Wubslin rubbed his hands together slowly and gazed round the many instruments and controls. Nice, he breathed. He wondered if he could work out which controls opened the locked doors in the reactor car. Quayanol reached the control deck. It was undamaged. From floor level, the deck was metal seat stems overhanging control panels and bright ceiling lights. He hauled himself over the floor, racked with pain, muttering to himself, trying to remember why he had come all this way. He rested his face on the cold floor of the deck. The train hummed at him, vibrating beneath his face. It was still alive. It was damaged, and like him, it would never get any better. But it was still alive. He had intended to do something, he knew that but it was all slipping away from him now. He wanted to cry with the frustration of it all, but it was as though he had no energy left even for tears. What was it? he asked himself, while the train hummed. I was... I was... What? Unaha Klosp looked through the reactor car. Much of it was inaccessible at first, but the drone found a way into it eventually through a cable run. It wandered about the long carriage, noting how the system worked. The dropped absorber baffles preventing the pile from heating up. The wasted uranium shielding designed to protect the fragile humanoids' bodies. The heat exchange pipes, which took the reactor's heat to the batteries of small boilers, were steam-turned generators to produce the power which turned the train's wheels. All very crude, Unaha Klosp thought. Complicated and crude at the same time. So much to go wrong, even with all their safety systems. At least if it and the humans did have to move around in these archaic, nuclear steam electric locomotives, they would be using the power from the main system. The drone found itself agreeing with the changer. The Adirans must have been mad to try to get all this ancient junk working. They slept in those things? Yalson looked at the suspended nets. Horza, Balveda and she stood at the end door of a large cavern, which had been a dormitory for the long-dead people who had worked in the command system. 
Balveda tested one of the nets. They were like open hammocks strung between sets of poles which hung from the ceiling. Perhaps a hundred of them filled the room like fishing nets hung out to dry. They must have found them comfortable, I guess, Hawser said. He looked round. There was nowhere the mind could have hidden. Let's go, he said. Balveda, come on. Balveda left one of the net beds swinging gently and wondered if there were any working baths or showers in the place. He reached up to the console. He pulled with all his strength and got his head onto the seat. He used his neck muscles as well as his aching, feeble arm to lever himself up. He pushed round and swivelled his torso. He gasped as one of his legs caught on the underside of the seat and he almost fell back. At last, though, he was in the seat. He looked out over the massed controls, through the armoured glass and into the broad tunnel beyond the train's sloped nose. Lights edged the black walls, steel rails snaked glittering into the distance. Quernall gazed into that still and silent space and experienced a small, grim feeling of victory. He had just remembered why he'd crawled there. Is that it? Yelson said. They were in the control room where the station complex's own functions were monitored. Hawser had turned on a few screens checking figures and now sat at a console using the station's remote control cameras to take a final look at the corridors and rooms, the tunnels and shafts and caverns. Balveda was perched on another huge seat, swinging her legs, looking like a child in an adult's chair. That's it, Horsa said. The station checks out, unless it's on one of the trains. The mind isn't here. He switched to cameras in the other stations, flicking through in ascending order. He paused at station five, looking down from the cavern roof at the bodies of the four Medjel and the wreckage of the mind's crude gun carrier, then tried the roof camera in station six. They haven't found me yet. I can't hear them properly. All I can hear is their tiny footsteps. I know they're here. But I can't tell what they're doing. Am I fooling them? I detected a mass sensor, but its signal vanished. There is another. They have it here with them, but it can't be working properly. Maybe fooled as I hoped, the train saving me. How ironic. They may have captured an Adiran. I heard another rhythm in their step. All walking or some with A.G.? How did they get in here? Could they be the changes from the surface? I would give half my memory capacity for another remote drone. I'm hidden, but I'm trapped. I can't see and I can't hear properly. All I can do is feel. I hate it. I wish I knew what is going on. Quay and all stared at the controls in front of him. They had worked out a lot of their functions earlier, before the humans had arrived. He had tried to remember it all now. What did he have to do first? He reached forward, rocking unsteadily on the alien-shaped seat. He flicked a set of switches. Lights blinked. He heard clicks. It was so hard to remember. He touched levers and switches and buttons. Meters and dials moved to new readings. Screens flickered. Figures began blinking on the readouts. Small, high noises bleeped and squeaked. He thought he was doing the right things, but couldn't be sure. Some of the controls were too far away, and he had to drag himself halfway on top of the console, being careful not to alter any of the controls he had already set to reach them, then shove himself back into the seat again. The train was whirring now. He could feel it stir. Motors turned, air hissed, speakers bleeped and clicked. He was getting somewhere. The train wasn't moving, but he was slowly bringing it closer to the moment when it might. His sight was fading, though. He blinked and shook his head, but his eye was giving out. The view was going grey before him. He had to stare at the controls and the screens. The lights on the tunnel wall in front, retreating into the black distance, seemed to be dimming. He could have believed that the power was failing, but he knew it wasn't. His head was hurting deep inside. Probably it was sitting that was causing it, the blood draining. He was dying quickly enough anyway, but now there was even more urgency. He hit the buttons, moved some levers. The train should have moved, flexed, but it stayed motionless. What else was there left to do? He turned to his blind side. Light panels flashed. Of course, the doors. He hit the appropriate sections of the console and heard rumbling, sliding noises, and most of the panels stopped flashing. Not all, though. 
Some of the doors must have been jammed. Another control overrode their fail-safes. The remaining panels went dim. He tried again. Slowly, like an animal stretching after hibernation, the command system train, all three hundred metres of it, flexed. The carriages pulling a little tighter to each other, taking up slack, readying. Quay and all felt the slight movement and wanted to laugh. It was working. Probably he had taken far too long, probably it was now too late, but at least he had done what he had set out to do against all the odds and the pain. He had taken command of the long silver beast, and with only a little more luck, he would at least give the humans something to think about, and show the beast at the barrier what he thought of its precious monument. Nervously, fearing that it would still not work after all his effort and agony, he took hold of the lever he and Zoxal had decided governed the power fed to the main wheel motors, then pushed it until it was at its limit for the starting mode. The train shuddered, groaned, and did not move. His one eye, containing the grey view, began to cry, drowning in tears. The train jerked. A noise of metal tearing came from behind. He was almost thrown from the seat. He had to grab the edge of the seat, then lean forward and take the power lever again as it flicked back to the off position. The roaring in his head grew and grew. He was shaking with exhaustion and excitement. He pushed the lever again. Wreckage blocked one door. Welding gear hung under the reactor car. Strips of metal torn from the train's hull were splayed out like stray hairs from a badly groomed coat. Lumps of debris littered the tracks by the sides of both access gantries, and one whole ramp, where Zaxal had been buried for a while, had crashed through the side of a carriage when it had been cut free. Groaning and moaning, as though its own attempts at movement were as painful as Quern Alls had been, the train lurched forward again. It moved half a turn of its wheels, then stopped as the jammed ramp stuck against the access gantry. A whining noise came from the train motors. In the control deck, alarms sounded, almost too high for the injured Idiran to hear. Meters flashed, needles climbed into danger zones, screens filled with information. The ramp started to tear itself free from the train, crumpling a jagged edge trench from the carriage surface as the train slowly forced its way forward. Quay and all watched the lip of the tunnel mouth edge closer. More wreckage ground against the forward access gantry. The welding gear under the reactor car scraped along the smooth floor until it came to the lip of stone surrounding an inspection trough. It jammed, then broke, clattering to the bottom of the trough. The train rammed slowly forward. With a grinding crash, the ramp caught on the rear access assembly fell free, snapping aluminium ribs and steel tubes, flaying the aluminium and plastic skin of the carriage it had lodged in. One corner of the ramp was nudged under the train, covering a rail. The wheels hesitated at it, the linkages between the cars straining until the slowly gathering onward pull overcame the ramp. It buckled, its structures compressing, and the wheels rolled over it, thumping down on the far side and continuing along the rail. The next wheels clattered over it with hardly a pause. Quay and all sat back. The tunnel came to the train and seemed to swallow it, the view of the station slowly disappeared. Dark walls slid gently by on either side of the control deck. The train still shuddered, but it was slowly gathering speed. A series of bangs and crashes told Quen all of the carriages, dragging their way after him, through the debris, over the shining rails, past the wrecked gantries, out of the damaged station. The first car left at a slow walking pace, the next a little faster, the reactor carriage at a fast walk, and the final car at a slow run. Smoke tugged after the departing train, then drifted back and rose to the roof again. The camera in Station 6, where they had had the firefight, where Dorolo and Nysin had died and the other Adiran had been left for dead, was out of action. Horsa tried the switch a couple of times, but the screen stayed dark. A damage indicator winked. Horsa flicked quickly through the views from the other stations on the circuit, then switched the screen off. Well, everything seems to be all right. He stood up. Let's get back to the train. Yalson told Wobslin and the drone. Balveda slipped off the big seat, and with her in the lead, they walked out of the control room. Behind them, a power monitoring screen, one of the first Horser had switched on, was registering a massive energy drain in the locomotive supply circuits, indicating that somewhere, in the tunnels of the command system, a train was moving.
Chapter 13 The Command System Terminus One can read too much into one's own circumstances. I am reminded of one race who set themselves against us, oh, long ago now, before I was even thought of. Their conceit was that the galaxy belonged to them, and they justified this heresy by a blasphemous belief concerning design. They were aquatic, their brain and major organs housed in a large central pod, from which several large arms or tentacles protruded. These tentacles were thick at the body, thin at the tips and lined with suckers. Their water god was supposed to have made the galaxy in their image. You see? They thought that because they bore a rough physical resemblance to the great lens that is the home of all of us, even taking the analogy as far as comparing their tentacle suckers to globular clusters, it therefore belonged to them. For all the idiocy of this heathen belief, they had prospered and were powerful, quite respectable adversaries, in fact. Hmm, Avager said. Without looking up, he asked, What were they called? Hmm, Zogzal rumbled. Their name. The Adiran pondered. I believe they were called the... The Fanch. Never heard of them, Avager said. No, you wouldn't have. Zoxal purred. We annihilated them. Yelson saw Horza staring at something on the floor near the doors leading back to the station. She kept watching Balveda but said, What have you found? Horza shook his head, reached to pick something from the floor, then stopped. I think it's an insect, he said incredulously. Wow, Yelson said, unimpressed. Balveda moved over to have a look. Yelson's gun still trained on her. Horza shook his head, watching the insect crawl over the tunnel floor. What the hell's that doing down here? he said. Yelson frowned when he said that, worried at a note of near panic in the man's voice. Probably brought it down ourselves, Balveda said, rising. Hitched a ride on the pallet or somebody's suit, I'll bet. Horza brought his fist down on the tiny creature, squashing it, grinding it into the dark rock. Balveda looked surprised. Yalson's frown deepened. Horza stared at the mark left on the tunnel floor, wiped his glove, then looked up, apologetic. Sorry, he told Balveda, as though embarrassed. Couldn't help thinking about that fly in the ends of invention. Turned out to be one of your pets, remember? He got up and walked quickly into the station. Balveda nodded, looking down at the small stain on the floor. Well, she said, arching one eyebrow. That was one way of proving its innocence. Zoxal watched the male and the two females come back into the station. Nothing, little one? he asked. Lots of things, section leader, Hawes replied, going up to Zoxal and checking the wires holding him. Zoxal grunted. They're still somewhat tight, ally. What a shame, Hawes said. Try breathing out. Ha! <laughs> Zoxal laughed and thought the man might have guessed but the human turned away and said to the old man who'd been guarding him, Avager, we're going onto the train. Keep our friend company. Try not to fall asleep. Fat chance of them gibbering all the time, the old man grumbled. The other three humans entered the train. Zoxal went on talking. In one section of the train there were lit map screens which showed how Shah's world had looked at the time the command system had been built. The cities and the states shown on the continents the targets on one state on one continent, the missile grounds, air bases, and naval ports belonging to the system's designers shown on another state on another continent. Two small ice caps were shown, but the rest of the planet was steppe, savannah, desert, forest, and jungle. Balveda wanted to stay and look at the maps, but Horza pulled her away and threw another door going forward to the nose of the train. He switched off the lights behind the map screens as he went and the bright surface of blue oceans, green, yellow, brown, and orange land, blue rivers and red cities, and communication lines faded slowly into grey darkness. Uh-oh, there are more on the train. Three, I think, walking from the rear. Now what? Zoxal breathed in, breathed out. He flexed his muscles, and the wires slipped over his keratin plates. He stopped when the old man wandered over to look at him. You are Avidir, aren't you? That's what they call me, the old man said. He stood looking at the Adiran, gazing from Zoxal's three feet with their three slab toes and round ankle collars, over his padded-looking knees, 
the massive girdle of pelvic plates and the flat chest, up to the section leader's great saddle head, the broad face tipped and looking down at the human beneath. Frightened I'll escape? Zoxal rumbled. Avager shrugged and gripped his gun a little tighter. What do I care? he said. I'm a prisoner too. That madman's got us all trapped down here. I just want to go back. This isn't my war. A very sensible attitude, Zoxal said. I wish more humans would realize what is and what is not theirs, especially regarding wars. <laughs> I don't suppose you lot are any better. Let us say, different, then. Say what you like. Avager looked over the Adirin's body again, addressing Zoxal's chest. I just wish everybody would mind their own business. I see no change, though. It'll all end in tears. I don't think you really belong here, Avager. Zoxal nodded wisely, slowly. Avager shrugged and did not raise his eyes. I don't think any of us do. The brave belong where they decide. Some harshness entered the Adiran's voice. Avager looked at the broad, dark face above him. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you? He turned away and walked back toward the pallet. Zoxal watched and vibrated his chest quickly, tensing his muscles, then releasing. The wires on him slipped a little further. Behind his back... He felt the bonds around one wrist slacken fractionally. The train gathered speed. The controls and screens looked dim to him, so he watched the lights on the tunnel walls outside. They had slid by gently at first, passing the side windows of the broad control deck more slowly than the quiet tide of his breathing. Now there were two or three lights running by for each time he breathed. The train was pushing him gently in the back, drawing him toward the rear of the seat and anchoring him there. Blood, a little of it, not much, had dried under him, sticking him there. His course, he felt, was set. There was only one thing left to do. He searched the console, cursing the darkness gathering behind his eye. Before he found the circuit breaker on the collision brake, he found the lights. It was like a little present from God. The tunnel ahead flashed with bright reflections as the train's nose headlights clicked on. The double set of rails glinted, and in the distance he could see more shadows and reflections in the tunnel walls, where access tubes slanted in from the foot tunnels and blast doors ribbed the black rock walls. His sight was still going, but he felt a little better for being able to see outside. At first he worried, in a distant, theoretical way, that the lights might give too much warning, should he be lucky enough to catch the humans still in the station. But it made little difference. The air pushed in front of the train would warn them soon enough. He raised a panel near the power control lever and peered at it. His head was light. He felt very cold. He looked at the circuit breaker and then bent down, jamming himself between the rear of the seat, cracking the blood seal beneath him and starting to bleed again, and the edge of the console. He shoved his face against the edge of the power control lever, then took his hand away and gripped the collision brake failsafe. He moved his hand so that it would not slip out, then just lay there. His one eye was high enough off the console to see the tunnel ahead. The lights were coming faster now. The train rocked gently, lulling him. The roaring was fading from his ears, like the sight dimming, like the station behind slipping away and vanishing, like the seemingly steady, slow, quickening stream of lights flowing by on either side. He could not estimate how far he had to go. He had started it off. He had done his best. No more, finally, could be asked of him. He closed his eye, just to rest. The train rocked him. It's great! Wubslin grinned when Horza, Yelson and Balveda walked onto the control deck. It's all ready to roll, all systems go. Well, don't wet your pants, Yelson told him, watching Balveda sit down in a seat, then sitting in another herself. We might have to use the transit tubes to get around. Horza pressed a few buttons, watching the readouts on the train systems. It all looked, as Wubslin had said, ready to go. Where's that damn drone? Horza said to Yelson. Drone? Unaha Clasp? Yelson said into her helmet mic. What is it now? Unaha Clasp said. Where are you? I'm taking a good look through this antiquated collection of rolling stock. I do believe these trains may actually be older than your ship. Tell it to get back here, Horza said. He looked at Wubslin. Did you check this whole train? Yelson ordered the drone back as Wubslin nodded and said, all of it except the reactor car couldn't get into bits of it. Which are the door controls? 
Hawser looked around for a moment, recalling the layout of the train controls. That lot. He pointed at one of the banks of buttons and light panels to one side of Wubslin. The engineer studied them. Ordered back. Told to return, like it was a slave, one of the Adirans' medjel, as though it was a machine. Let them wait a little. Unaha Klosp had also found the map screens in the train just down the tunnel. It floated in the air in front of the coloured expanses of backlit plastic. It used its manipulating fields to work the controls, turning on small sets of lights which indicated the targets on both sides, the major cities and military installations. All of it dust now. All of their precious humanoid civilization ground to junk under glaciers or weathered away by wind and spray and rain and frozen in ice. All of it. Only this pathetic maze tomb left. So much for their humanity or whatever they chose to call it, thought Unaha Klosp. Only their machines remained. But would any of the others learn? Would they see this for what it was, this frozen rock ball? Would they indeed? Unaha Klosp left the screens glowing and floated out of the train back through the tunnel toward the station itself. The tunnels were bright now, but no warmer. And to Unaha Klosp, it seemed as though there was a sort of revealed heartlessness about the harsh yellow-white light which streamed from ceilings and walls. It was operating theatre light, dissection table light. The machine floated through the tunnels, thinking that the Cathedral of Darkness had become a glazed arena, a crucible. Zoxal was on the platform, still trussed against the access ramp girders. Unaha Klosp didn't like the way the Adiran looked at it when it appeared from the tunnels. It was almost impossible to read the creature's expression, if he could be said to have one. But there was something about Zoxal that Unaha Klosp didn't like. It got the impression the Adiran had just stopped moving or doing something he didn't want to be seen doing. From the tunnel mouth, the drone saw Avager look up from the pallet where he was sitting, then look away again, without even bothering to wave. The changer and the two females were in the train control area with the engineer, Wubslin. Unaha Klosp saw them and went forward to the access ramps and the nearest door. As it got there, it paused. Air moved gently. Hardly anything. But it was there. It could feel it. Obviously, with the power on, some automatic systems were circulating more fresh air from the surface or through atmospheric scrubbing units. Unaha Klosp went into the train. Unpleasant little machine, that, Zogzal said to Avager. The old man nodded vaguely. Zogzal had noticed that the man looked at him less when he was speaking to him. It was as though the sound of his voice reassured the human that he was still tied there, safe and sound, not moving. On the other hand, talking moving his head to look at the human, making the occasional shrugging motion, laughing a little, gave him excuses to move and so to slip the wires a little further. So he talked. With luck, the others would be on the train for a while now and he might have a chance to escape. He would lead them a merry dance if he got away into the tunnels with a gun. Well, they should be open, Horsa was saying. According to the console in front of him and Wubslin, the doors in the reactor car had never been locked in the first place. Are you sure you were trying to open them properly? He was looking at the engineer. Of course, Wubson said, sounding hurt. I know how different types of lock work. I tried to turn the recessed wheel, catches off. OK, this armour mine isn't perfect, but, well, it should have opened. Probably a malfunction, Orza said. He straightened, looking back down the train, as though trying to see through the hundred metres of metal and plastic between him and the reactor car. Hmm. There's not enough room there for the mine to hide, is there? Wubslin looked up from the panel. I wouldn't have thought so. Well, here I am, Unaha Klosp said testily, floating through the door to the control deck. What do you want me to do now? You took your time searching that other train, Horsa said, looking at the machine. I was being thorough. More thorough than you, unless I misheard what you were saying before I came in. Where might there be enough room for the mind to hide? The reactor car, Wubslin said. I couldn't get through some of the doors. Horsa says, according to the controls, they ought to be open. Shall I go back and have a look, then? Unaha Klosp turned to face Horsa. The changer nodded. If it isn't asking too much, he said levelly. No, no, Unaha Klosp said airily, backing off through the door it had entered by. I'm starting to enjoy being ordered about. Leave it to me. It floated away, back through the front carriage toward the reactor car. Balveda looked through the armoured glass at the rear of the train in front the one the drone had been looking through. If the mind was hiding in the reactor car, wouldn't it show up on your mass sensor? 
or would it be confused with the trace from the pile? She turned her head slowly to look at the changer. Who knows, Horsa said. I'm not an expert on the workings of the suit, especially now it's damaged. You're getting very trusting, Horsa, the culture agent said, smiling faintly, letting the drone do your hunting for you. Just letting it do some scouting, Balveda, Horsa said, turning away and working at some more of the controls. He watched screens and dials and meters, changing displays and readout functions, trying to tell what was going on, if anything, in the reactor car. It all looked normal, as far as he could tell, though he knew less about the reactor systems than about most of the train's other components from his time as a sentinel. OK, Yelsa said, turning her chair to one side, putting her feet upon the edge of one console and taking her helmet off. So what do we do if there's no mine there in the reactor car? Do we all start touring round in this thing, take the transit tube, or what? I don't know that taking a mainline train is a good idea, Horsa said, glancing at Wobslin. I considered leaving everybody else here and taking a transit tube by myself on a circular journey right round the system, trying to spot the mine on the suit and mass sensor. It wouldn't take too long, even doing it twice to cover both sets of tracks between stations. The transit tubes have no reactors, so we wouldn't get any false echoes to interfere with the sensor's readings. Wubslin, sitting in the seat which faced the train's main controls, looked downcast. Why not send the rest of us back to the ship, then? Balveda said. Horsa looked at her. Balveda, you are not here to make suggestions. Just trying to be helpful? The culture agent shrugged. What if you still can't find anything? Yalson asked. We go back to the ship, Horsa said, shaking his head. That's about all we can do. Wobbsling can check the suit mass sensor on board, and depending on what we find is wrong with it, we might come back down or we might not. Now the power's on, none of that should take very long or involve any hard slog. Pity, Wobbsling said, fingering the controls. We can't even use this train to get back to Station 4 because of that train in Station 6 blocking the way. It probably would still move, Horsa told the engineer. We'll have to do some shunting whichever way we go if we use the mainline trains. Oh, well then. Wobson said a little dreamily, and looked over the controls again. He pointed at one of them. Is that the speed control? Horsa laughed, crossing his arms and grinning at the man. Yes, we'll see if we can arrange a little journey. He leaned over and pointed out a couple of other controls, showing Wubslin how the train was readied for running. They pointed and nodded and talked. Yalson stirred restlessly in her seat. Finally, she looked over at Balveda. The culture woman was looking at Horsa and Wubslin with a smile. She turned her head to Yalson, sensing her gaze, and smiled more widely, moving her head fractionally to indicate the two men and raising her eyebrows. Yalson reluctantly grinned back and shifted the weight of her gun slightly. The lights came quickly now. They streamed by, creating a flickering, strobing pattern of light in the dim cabin. He knew he had opened his eye and had seen... It had taken all his strength just to lift that eyelid. He had drifted off to sleep for a while. He was not sure for how long. He only knew he had been dozing. The pain was not so bad now. He had been still for some time, just lying here with his broken body, slanted out of the strange alien chair, his head on the control console, his hand wedged into the small flap by the power control, fingers jammed under the failsafe lever inside. It was restful. He could not have expressed how pleasant it all was after that awful crawl through both the train and the tunnel of his own pain. The train's motion had altered. It still rocked him, but a little faster now, and with a new rhythm added as well, a more rapid vibration which was like a heart beating fast. He thought he could hear it too now. The noise of the wind blowing through these deep buried holes far under the blizzard-swept wastes above. Or maybe he imagined it. He found it hard to tell. He felt like a small child again, on a journey with his year fellows and their old quirl mentor, rocked to sleep, slipping in and out of a dozing, happy sleep. He kept thinking, I have done all I could. Perhaps not enough, but it was all I had in my power to do. It was comforting. Like the ebbing pain, it eased him. Like the rocking of the train, it soothed him. He closed his eye again. There was comfort in the darkness, too. He had no idea how far along he was, and was starting to think it did not matter. Things were beginning to drift away from him again. He was just beginning to forget why he was doing all this. But that didn't matter either. It was done. So long as he didn't move, nothing mattered. Nothing. Nothing at all. The doors were jammed all right, same as the other train. 
the drone became exasperated and slammed against one of the reactor chamber doors with a force field, knocking itself back through the air with the reaction. The door wasn't even dented. Uh-oh. Back to the crawlways and cable runs. Unaha Klosp turned and headed down a short corridor, then down a hole in the floor, heading for an inspection panel under the floor of the lower deck. Of course, I end up doing all the work. I might have known. Basically, what I'm doing for that bastard is hunting down another machine. I ought to have my circuits tested. I have a good mind not to tell him even if I do find the mine somewhere. That would teach him. It threw back the inspection hatch and lowered itself into the dim, narrow space under the floor. The hatch hissed shut after it, blocking out the light. It thought about turning back and opening the hatch again, but knew it would just close automatically once more, and that it would lose its temper and damage the thing, and that was all a bit pointless and petty. So it didn't. That sort of behaviour was for humans. It started off along the crawlway, heading toward the rear of the train, underneath where the reactor ought to be. The Adiran was talking. Avager could hear it, but he wasn't listening. He could see the monster out of the corner of his eye, too, but he wasn't really looking at it. He was gazing absently at his gun, humming tunelessly and thinking about what he would do if, somehow, he could get hold of the mind himself. Suppose the others were killed and he was left with the device. He knew the Adirans would probably pay well for the mind. So would the culture. They had money, even if they weren't supposed to use it in their own civilization. Just dreams. But anything could happen out of this lot. You never knew how the dust might fall. He would buy some land, an island on a nice safe planet somewhere. He'd have some retro-aging done and raise some sort of expensive racing animals, and he'd get to know the better-off people through his connections. Or he'd get somebody else to do all the hard work. With money, you could do that. You could do anything. The Adiran went on talking. His hand was almost free. That was all he could get free for now, but maybe he could twist his arm out later. It was getting easier all the time. The humans had been on the train for a while. How much longer would they stay? The small machine hadn't been on for so long. He'd only just seen it in time, appearing from the tunnel mouth. He knew its sight was better than his own, and for a moment he'd been afraid it might have seen him moving the arm he was trying to get free, the one on the far side from the old human. But the machine had disappeared into the train, and nothing had happened. He kept looking over at the old man, checking. The human seemed lost in a daydream. Zogzal kept talking, telling the empty air about old Adiran victories. His hand had been afraid it might have seen him moving the arm he was trying to get free the one on the far side from the old human. But the machine had disappeared into the train, and nothing had happened. He kept looking over at the old man, checking. The human seemed lost in a daydream. Zogzal kept talking, telling the empty air about old Adiran victories. His hand was almost out. A little dust came off a girder above him, about a metre over his head, and floated down through the near still air, falling almost, but not quite, straight down gradually drifting away from him. He looked at the old man again and strained at the wires over his hand. Come free, damn you. Unaha Klosp had to hammer a corner from a right angle to a curve to get into the small passage it wanted to use. It wasn't even a crawlway. It was a cable conduit, but it led into the reactor compartment. It checked its senses, same amount of radiation here as in the other train. It scraped through the small gap it had created in the cable run deeper into the metal and plastic guts of the silent carriage. I can hear something. Something's coming. Underneath me. The lights were a continuous line, flashing past the train too quickly for most eyes to have distinguished them individually. The lights ahead down the track appeared round curves, or at the far end of straights, swelled and joined and tore past the windows like shooting stars in the darkness. The train had taken a long time to reach its maximum speed, fought for long minutes to overcome the inertia of its thousands of tons of mass. Now it had done so, and was pushing itself and the column of air in front of it as fast as it ever would, hurtling down the long tunnel with a roaring, tearing noise greater than any train had ever made in those dark passages, its damaged carriages breaking the air or scraping the blast door edges to decrease its speed a little, but increase the noise of its passage a great deal. The scream of the train's whirling motors and wheels, of its ruffled metal body tearing through the air and of that same air swirling through the open spaces of the punctured carriages, rang from the ceiling and the walls, the consoles on the floor and the slope of armoured glass. Quainoil's eye was closed. Inside his ears, membranes pulsed to the noise outside, but no message was transmitted to his brain. 
His head bobbed up and down on the vibrating console as though still alive. His hand shook on the collision brake override as if the warrior was nervous or afraid. Wedged there, glued, soldered by his own blood, he was like a strange, damaged part of the train. The blood was dried. Outside Quenall's body, as within, it had stopped flowing. How goes it, Anna Haklasp? Yelson's voice said. I'm under the reactor and I'm busy. I'll let you know if I find anything. Thank you. It switched its communicator off and looked at the black-sheathed entrails in front of it, wires and cables disappearing into a cable run. More than there had been in the front train. Should it cut its way in or try another route? Decisions, decisions. His hand was out. He paused. The old man was still sitting on the pallet, fiddling with his gun. Zogzal allowed himself a small sigh of relief and flexed his hand, letting the fingers stretch, then fist. A few motes of dust moved slowly past his cheek. He stopped flexing his hand. He watched the dust move. A breath, something less than a breeze, tickled at his arms and legs. Most odd, he thought. All I'm saying, Yalson told Horsa, shifting her feet on the console a little, is that I don't think it's a good idea for you to come down here yourself. Anything could happen. I'll take a communicator. I'll check in, Horsa said. He stood with his arms crossed, his backside resting on the edge of a control panel, the same one Wobslin's helmet lay on. The engineer was familiarising himself with the controls of the train. They were pretty simple, really. It's basic, Horza, Yalson told him. You never go alone. What stuff did they teach you at this goddamn academy? If I'm allowed to say anything, Balveda put in, clasping her hands in front of her and looking at the changer, I would just like to say I think Yalson's right. Horza stared at the culture woman with a look of unhappy amazement. No, you are not allowed to say anything, he told her. Whose side do you think you're on, Peristek? Oh, Horza, Balveda grinned, crossing her arms. I almost feel like one of the team after all this time. About half a metre away from the gently rocking, slowly cooling head of subordinate Captain Quernall Gidborox Stogrela III, a small light began to flash very rapidly on the console. At the same time, the air in the control deck was pierced by a high-pitched ululating whine, which filled the deck and the whole front carriage and was relayed to several other control centres throughout the speeding train. Quernall, his firmly wedged body, tugged to one side of the force of the train roaring around a long curve, could have heard that noise, just if he had been alive. Very few humans could have heard it. Unaha Klosp thought the better of cutting off all communication with the outside world and reopened its communicator channels. Nobody wanted to speak to it, however. It started to cut the cables leading into the conduit, snipping them one by one with a knife-edged force field. No point in worrying about damaging the thing after all that had happened to the train in Station 6, it told itself. If it hit anything vital to the normal running of the train, it was sure Hawes would yell out soon enough. It could repair the cables without too much trouble anyway. A draft. Zoxal thought he must be imagining it, then that it was the result of some air circulation unit recently switched on. Perhaps the heat from the lights and the station systems, once it was powered up, required extra ventilation. But it grew. Slowly, almost too slowly to discern, the faint, steady current increased in strength. Zoxal racked his brains. What could it be? Not a train. Surely not a train. He listened carefully, but could hear nothing. He looked over at the old human and found him staring back. Had he noticed? Run out of battles and victories to tell me about, Avager said, sounding tired. He looked the Adiran up and down. Zogzal laughed, a little too loudly, even nervously, had Avager been well enough versed in Adiran gestures and voice tones to tell. Not at all, Zogzal said. I was just thinking. He launched into another tale of defeated enemies. It was one he had told to his family, in ship messes and in attack shuttle holds. He could have told it in his sleep. While his voice filled the bright station and the old human looked down at the gun he held in his hands, Zoxal's thoughts were elsewhere, trying to work out what was going on. He was still pulling and tugging at the wires on his arm. Whatever was happening, it was vital to be able to do more than just move his hand. The draught increased. Still, he could hear nothing. A steady stream of dust was blowing off the girder above his head. It had to be a train. Could one have been left switched on somewhere? 
Impossible. Quay and all. Did we set the controls to... But they hadn't tried to jam the controls on. They'd only worked out what the various controls did and tested their action to make sure they all moved. They hadn't tried to do anything else, and there had been no point, no time. It had to be Quayanol himself. He had done it. He must still be alive. He had sent the train. For an instant, as he tugged desperately at the wires holding him, talking all the time and watching the old man, Zoxal imagined his comrade, still back in Station 6, but then he remembered how badly injured he had been. Zoxal had earlier thought his comrade might still be alive when he was still lying on the access ramp, but then the changer had told the old man, this same Avager, to go back and shoot Quernall in the head. That should have finished Quernall, but apparently it hadn't. You failed, old one, Zoxal exulted as the draught became a breeze. A distant whining noise, almost too high-pitched to hear, started up. It was muffled, coming from the train. The alarm. Zoxal's arm, held by one last wire just above his elbow, was almost free. He shrugged once, and the wire slipped up over his upper arm and spilled loose onto his shoulder. Old one, Avager, my friend, he said. Avager looked up quickly as Zoxal interrupted his own monologue. What? This will sound silly, and I shall not blame you if you are afraid, but I have the most infernal itch in my right eye. Would you scratch it for me? I know it sounds silly, a warrior tormented after death by a sore eye, but it has been driving me quite demented these past ten minutes. Would you scratch it? Use the barrel of your gun if you like. I shall be very careful not to move a muscle or do anything threatening if you use the muzzle of your gun, or anything you like. Would you do that? I swear to you on my honor as a warrior, I tell the truth. Avager stood up. He looked toward the nose of the train. He can't hear the alarm, he is old. Can the other, younger ones hear? Is it too high-pitched for them? What of the machine? Oh, come here, you old fool, come here. Unaha Klosp pulled the cut cables apart. Now it could reach into the cable run and try cutting further up so it could get in. Drone, drone, can you hear me? It was the woman, Yalson again. Now what? it said. Horse has lost some readouts from the reactor car. He wants to know what you're doing. Damn right I do, Horza muttered in the background. I had to cut some cables. Seems to be the only way into the reactor area. I'll repair them later if you insist. The communicator channel cut off for a second. In that moment, Unaha Klosp thought it could hear something high-pitched. But it wasn't sure. Fringes of sensation, it thought to itself. The channel opened again. Yelson said, All right, but Horza says to tell him the next time you think about cutting anything, especially cables. All right, all right the drone said. Now will you leave me alone? The channel closed again. It thought for a moment. It had crossed its mind that there might be an alarm sounding somewhere, but logically an alarm ought to have repeated on the control deck, and it had heard nothing in the background when Yalson spoke apart from the changes muttered interjection. Therefore no alarm. It reached back into the conduit with a cutter field. Which eye? Ava just said from just too far away. A wisp of his thin, yellowish hair was blown across his forehead by the breeze. Zoxal waited for the man to realise, but he didn't. He just patted the hairs back and stared up quizzically at the Adiran's head, gun ready, face uncertain. This right one, Zoxal said, turning his head slowly. Avager looked round toward the nose of the train again, then back at Zoxal. Don't tell you know who, all right? I swear. Now please, I can't stand it. Avager stepped forward, still out of reach. On your honour, you're not playing a trick, he said. As a warrior, on my mother parents unsullied name, on my clan and folk, may the galaxy turn to dust if I lie. All right, all right, Ava just said, raising his gun and holding it out high. I just wanted to make sure. He poked the barrel toward Zoxal's eye. Whereabouts does it itch? Here, hissed Zoxal. His freed arm lashed out, grabbed the barrel of the gun and pulled. Avager, still holding the gun, was dragged after it, slamming into the chest of the Adiran. Breath exploded out of him, then the gun sailed down and smashed into his skull. Zoxal had averted his head when he'd grabbed the weapon in case it fired, but he needn't have bothered. Avager hadn't left it switched on. In the stiffening breeze, Zoxal let the unconscious human slide to the floor. He held the laser rifle in his mouth and used his hand to set the controls for a quiet burn. 
He snapped the trigger guard from the gun's casing to make room for his larger fingers. The wires should melt easily. Like a squirm of snakes appearing from a hole in the ground, the bunched cables, cut about a metre long their length, slid out of the conduit. Unaha Klosp went into the narrow tube and reached behind the bared ends of the next length of cables. Yelson, Horza said, I wouldn't take you with me anyway, even if I decided not to come back down alone. He grinned at her. Yelson frowned. Why not, she said. Because I'd need you on the ship, making sure Balveda here and our section leader didn't misbehave. Yelson's eyes narrowed. That had better be all, she growled. Horza's grin widened, and he looked away, as though he wanted to say more, but couldn't for some reason. Balveda sat, swinging her legs from the edge of the too big seat, and wondered what was going on between the changer and the dark, down-skinned woman. She thought she'd detected a change in their relationship, a change which seemed to come mostly from the way Horza treated Yelson. An extra element had been added. There was something else determining his reactions to her, but Balveda couldn't pin it down. It was all quite interesting, but it didn't help her. She had her own problems anyway. Balveda knew her own weaknesses, and one of them was troubling her now. She really was starting to feel like one of the team. She watched Horza and Yelson arguing about who should accompany the changer if he came back down into the command system after a return to the clear air turbulence, and she could not help but smile unseen at them. She liked the determined, no-nonsense woman, even if her regard was not returned, and she could not find it in her heart to think of Horza as implacably as she ought. It was the culture's fault. It considered itself too civilised and sophisticated to hate its enemies. Instead, it tried to understand them and their motives, so that it could outthink them and so that, when it won, it would treat them in a way which ensured they would not become enemies again. The idea was fine as long as you didn't get too close, but once you had spent some time with your opponents, such empathy could turn against you. There was a sort of detached, non-human aggression required to go along with such mobilised compassion, and Balveda could feel it slipping away from her. Perhaps she felt too safe, she thought. Perhaps it was because now there was no significant threat. The battle for the command system was over. The quest was petering out. The tension of the past few days disappearing. Zuxal worked quickly. The laser's thin attenuated beam buzzed and fussed at each wire, turning each strand red, yellow and white. Then, as he strained against them, parted each one with a snap. The old man at the Adiran's feet stirred, moaned. The faint breeze had become a strong one. Dust was blowing under the train and starting to swirl around Zoxal's feet. He moved the laser to another set of wires, only a few to go. He glanced toward the nose of the train. There was still no sign of the humans or the machine. He glanced back the other way, over his shoulder, toward the train's last carriage and the gap between it and the tunnel mouth where the wind was whistling through. He could see no light, still hear no noise. The current of air made his eye feel cold. He turned back and pointed the laser rifle at another set of wires. The sparks were caught in the breeze and scattered over the station floor and across the back of Avager's suit. Typical. Me doing all the work as usual, thought Unaha Klosp. It hauled another bunch of cables out of the conduit. The wire run behind it was starting to fill up with cut lengths of wire, blocking the route the drone had taken to get to the small pipe it was now working in. It's beneath me. I can feel it. I can hear it. I don't know what it's doing, but I can feel, I can hear. And there's something else, another noise. The train was a long, articulated shell in some gigantic gun, a metal scream in a vast throat. It rammed through the tunnel like a piston in the biggest engine ever made, sweeping round the curves and into the straits, lights flooding the way ahead for an instant, air pushed ahead of it like its howling, roaring voice for kilometres. Dust lifted from the platform, made clouds in the air. An empty drink container rolled off the pallet where Avager had been sitting and clattered to the floor. It started rolling along the platform toward the nose of the train, hitting off the wall a couple of times. Zoxal saw it. The wind tugged at him, the wires parted. He got one leg free, then another. His other arm was out and the last wires fell away. A piece of plastic sheeting lifted from the pallet like some black, flat bird and flopped onto the platform sliding after the metal container, now halfway down the station. Zoxal stooped quickly, caught Avager round the waist, and, with the man held easily in one arm and the laser in his other hand, ran back down the platform toward the wall beside the blocked tunnel mouth, where the wind made a moaning noise past the sloped rear of the train. 
I'll lock them both away down here instead. You know we can, Yalson said. We're close, Horsa thought, nodding absently at Yalson, not listening as she told him why he needed her to help him look for the mind. We're close. I'm sure we are. I can feel it. We're almost there. Somehow we've... I've held it all together. But it's not over yet, and it only takes one tiny error, one oversight, a single mistake, and that's it. Fuck up. Failure. Death. So far we've done it, despite the mistakes, but it's so easy to miss something, to fail to spot some tiny detail in the mass of data which later, when you've forgotten all about it, when your back is turned, creeps up and clobbers you. The secret was to think of everything, or because maybe the culture was right and only a machine could literally do that, just to be so in tune with what was going on that you thought automatically of all the important and potentially important things and ignored the rest. With something of a shock, Horsa realised that his own obsessive drive, never to make a mistake, always to think of everything, was not so unlike the fetishistic urge which he so despised in the culture, that need to make everything fair and equal, to take the chance out of life. He smiled to himself at the irony and glanced over at Balveda sitting watching Wumslin experimenting with some controls. Coming to resemble your enemies, Horsa thought. Maybe there's something in it after all. Horsa, are you listening to me? Yalson said. Hmm? Uh, yes, of course. He smiled. Balveda frowned. While Horsa and Yalson talked on and Wubslin poked and prodded at the train's controls, for some reason she was starting to feel uneasy. Outside the front carriage, beyond Balveda's field of view, a small container rolled along the platform and into the wall alongside the tunnel mouth. Zoxal ran to the rear of the station. By the entrance to the foot tunnel, leading off at right angles into the rock behind the station's platform, was the tunnel which the changer and the two women had emerged from when they had returned from their search of the station. It provided the ideal place from which to watch. Zagzal thought he would escape the effects of the collision and would have the best opportunity for a clear field of fire right down the station to the nose of the train in the meantime. He could stay there right up until the train hit. If they tried to get off, he would have them. He checked the gun, turning its power up to maximum. Valveda got down from the seat, folding her arms, and walked slowly across the control deck toward the side windows, staring intently at the floor, wondering why she felt uneasy. The wind howled through the gap between the tunnel edge and the train. It became a gale. Twenty metres away from where Zogzal waited in the foot tunnel, kneeling there with one foot on the back of the unconscious Avager, the train's rear carriage started to rock and sway. The drone stopped in mid-cut. Two things occurred to it. One, that damn it, there was a funny noise, and two, that just supposing there had been an alarm sounding on the control deck, not only would none of the humans be able to hear it, there was also a good chance that Yalson's helmet mic would not relay the high-pitched whine either. But wouldn't there be a visual warning too? Balveda turned at the side window without looking out properly. She sat against the console there, looking back. And how serious you still are about looking for this damn thing, Yalson was saying to Horsa. Don't worry, the changer said, nodding at Yalson. I'll find it. Balveda turned round, looked at the station outside. Just then, Yalson and Wubslin's helmets both came alive with the urgent voice of the drone. Balveda was distracted by a piece of black material, which was sliding quickly along the floor of the station. Her eyes widened, her mouth opened. The gale became a hurricane, a distant noise like a great avalanche heard from far away came from the tunnel mouth. Then, up the long final straight which led into Station 7 from Station 6, light appeared at the end of the tunnel. Zoxal could not see the light, but he could hear the noise. He brought the gun up and aimed along the side of the stationary train. The stupid humans must realise soon. The steel rails began to whine. The drone backed quickly out of the conduit. It threw the cut, discarded lengths of cable against the walls. Yelson! Horsa! it shouted at them through its communicator. It dashed along the short length of narrow tunnel. The instant it turned the corner it had hammered in to make passable, it could hear the faint, high, insistent wailing of the alarm. There's an alarm. I can hear it. What's happening? There, in the crawlway, it could feel and hear the rush of air coursing through and around the train. There's a gale blowing out there, Balveda said quickly, as soon as the drone's voice stopped. Wubslin lifted his helmet from the console. Where it had lain, a small orange light was flashing. Horsa stared at it. Balveda looked up at the platform. Clouds of dust blew along the station floor. 
Light equipment was being blown off the pallet opposite the rear access gantry. Horza, Balveda said quietly. I can't see Soxal or Avager. Yalson was on her feet. Horza glanced over at the side window, then back at the light, winking on the console. It's an alarm, the drone's voice shouted from the two helmets. I can hear it. Horza picked up his rifle, grabbed the edge of Yalson's helmet while she held it, and said, It's a train drone. That's the collision alarm. Get off the train now. He let go of the helmet, which Yalson quickly shoved over her head and locked. Horza gestured toward the door. Move, he said loudly, glancing round at Yalson, Balveda, and Wubslin, who was still sitting holding the helmet he'd removed from the console. Balveda headed for the door. Yalson was just behind her. Horza started forward, then turned as he went, looked back at Wubslin, who was setting his helmet down on the floor and turning back to the controls. Wubslin, he yelled, move! Balveda and Yalson were running through the carriage. Yalson looked back, hesitated. I'm going to get it moving, Wubslin said urgently, not turning to look at Horza. He punched some buttons. Wubslin, Horza shouted. Get out, now! It's all right, Horza, Wubslin said, flicking buttons and switches, glancing at screens and dials, grimacing when he had to move his injured arm and still not turning his head. I know what I'm doing. You get off. I'll get a moving. You'll see. Horza glanced toward the rear of the train. Yalson was standing in the middle of the forward carriage, just visible through two open doors, her head going from side to side as she looked first at the still-running Balveda, heading for the second carriage and the access ramps, and then at Horza, waiting in the control deck. Horza motioned her to get out. He turned and strode forward and took Wobslin by one elbow. You crazy bastard, he shouted. It could be coming at fifty metres a second. Have you any idea how long it takes to get one of these things moving? He hauled at the engineer's arm. Wobslin turned quickly and hit Horza across the face with his free hand. Horza was thrown back over the floor of the control deck, more amazed than hurt. Wubslin turned back to the controls. Sorry, Horza, but I can get it round that bend and out of the way. You get out now. Leave me. Horza took his laser rifle, stood up, watched the engineer working at the controls, then turned and ran from the place. As he did so, the train lurched, seeming to flex and tighten. Yalson followed the culture woman. Horza had waved at her to go on. She did. Balveda, she shouted. Emergency exits, go down, bottom deck. The culture agent didn't hear. She was still heading for the next carriage and the access ramps. Yalson ran after her, cursing. The drone exploded out of the floor and raced through the carriage for the nearest emergency hatch. That vibration. It's a train. Another train's coming fast. What have those idiots done? I have to get out. Balveda skidded round a corner, threw out one hand and caught hold of a bulkhead edge. She dived for the open door, which led to the middle access ramp. Yalson's footsteps pounded behind her. She ran out onto the ramp, into a howling gale, a constant, gustless hurricane. Instantly, the air around her detonated with cracks and sparks. Light glared from all sides, and the girders blew out in molten lines. She threw herself flat, sliding and rolling along the surface of the ramp. The girders ahead of her, where the ramp turned and sloped down to one side, glittered with laser fire. She got half up again, and feet and hands scrabbling for purchase on the ramp, threw herself back into the train, fractionally before the moving line of shots blasted into the side of the ramp and the girders and guardrails beyond. Yalson almost tripped over her. Balveda reached up and grabbed the other woman's arm. Somebody's firing. Yalson went forward to the edge and started firing back. The train gave a lurch. The final straight between Station 6 and Station 7 was over three kilometres long. The time between the point the racing machine's lights would have become visible from the rear of the train sitting in Station 7 and the instant the train flashed out of the dark tunnel into the station itself occupied less than a minute. Dead, body shaking and rocking, but still wedged too tightly to be dislodged from the controls, Quernall's cold, closed eye faced a scene through sloped armoured glass of a night-dark space strung with twin bright lines of almost solid light, and directly in front, rapidly enlarging, a halo of brightness, a glaring ring of luminescence with a grey, metallic core. Zoxal cursed. The target had moved quickly and he'd missed, but they were trapped on the train. He had them. The old human under his knee moaned and tried to move. Zoxal trod down harder on him and got ready to shoot again. The jet stream of air screamed out of the tunnel and round the rear of the train. Answering shots splashed randomly around the rear of the station, well away from him. He smiled. Just then, the train moved. 
Get out, Horsa said, arriving at the door where the two women were, one firing, one crouched down, risking the occasional look out. The air was whirling into the carriage, shaking and roaring. It must be Zaxal, Yalsen shouted, above the noise of the storming wind. She leaned out and fired. More shots rippled over the access ramp and thudded into the outer hull of the train around the door. Alveda ducked back as hot fragments blew in through the open door. The train seemed to wobble, then move forward very slowly. What? Yalsen yelled, looking round at Horsa as he joined her at the door. He shrugged as he leaned out to fire down the platform. Wubslin, he shouted. He sent a hail of fire down the length of the station. The train crept forward. Already a metre of the access ramp was hidden by the side of the train's hull near the open door. Something sparkled in the darkness of the distant tunnel, where the wind screamed and the dust blew and a noise like never-ending thunder came. Horsa shook his head. He waved Balveda forward to the ramp, now with only about half its breadth available from the door. He fired again. Yalsen leaned out and fired too. Balveda started forward. At that moment, a hatch blew out near the middle of the train, and from the same carriage, a huge circular plug of train hull fell clanging out, a great flat cork of thick wall tipping down to the station floor. A small dark shape dashed from the broken hatch, and from the great circular hole nearby, a silver point came, swelling quickly to a fat, bright, reflecting ovoid as the wall section hit the platform. The drone whizzed through the air, and Balveda started forward along the ramp. There it is! Yalsen screamed. The mind was out of the train, starting to turn and race off. Then the flickering laser fire from the far end of the station switched. No longer smashing into the access ramp and girders, it began to scatter flashing explosions of light all over the surface of the silvery ellipsoid. The mind seemed to stop, hang in the air, shaken by the fusillade of laser shots. Then it fell sideways, out over the platform, its smooth surface suddenly starting to ripple and grow dim as it rolled through the rushing air, falling toward the side wall of the station like a crippled airship. Balveda was across the ramp, running down the sloped section, almost at the lower level. Get out! Horsa yelled, shoving Yelson. The train was away from the ramps now, motors growling, but unheard in the raging hurricane which swept through the station. Yelson slapped her wrist, switching on her AG, then leapt out of the door into the gale, still firing. Horsa leaned out, having to fire through the girders of the access ramp. He held on to the train with one hand, felt it shaking like a frightened animal. Some of his shots smacked into the access ramp girders, blasting fountains of debris out into the slipstream of air and making him duck back in. The mind crunched into the side wall of the station, rolling over to lodge in the angle between the floor and the curved wall, its silver skin quivering, going dull. Unaha Klosp twisted through the air, avoiding laser shots. Balveda reached the bottom of the ramp and ran across the station floor. The fan of shots from the distant foot tunnel seemed to hesitate between her and the flying figure of Yalsen, then swept up to close around the woman in the suit. Yalsen fired back, but the shots found her, made her suit sparkle. Horsa threw himself out of the train, falling to the ground from the slowly moving carriage, crashing into the rock floor, winding himself, being bowled over by the tearing blast of air. He ran forward as soon as he could get to his feet, bouncing up from the impact, firing through the hurricane toward the far end of the station. Yalsen still flew, moving into the torrent of air and the crackling laser fire. Light blazed around the rear of the train, now heading at a little over walking speed from the station. The noise of the oncoming train, drowning out every other sound, even explosions and shots, so that everything seemed to be happening in a shocked silence within that ultimate scream, rose in pitch. Yalsen dropped. Her suit was damaged. Her legs started to work before she hit the ground, and when she did she was running, running for the nearest cover. She ran for the mind, dull silver by the wall side, and changed her mind. She turned, just before she would have been able to dive behind the mind, and ran on round it toward the doorways and alcoves of the wall beyond. Zogzal's fire slammed into her again the instant she turned, and this time her suit armour could soak up no more energy. It gave way the laser fire bursting through like lightning all over the woman's body, throwing her into the air, blowing her arms out, kicking her legs from under her, jerking her like a doll caught in the fist of an angry child, and throwing a bright crimson cloud from her chest and abdomen. The train hit. It flashed into the station on a tide of noise. It roared from the tunnel like a solid metal thunderbolt, seeming to cross the space between the tunnel mouth and the slowly moving train in front in the same instant as it appeared. Zogzal, closest of them all, caught a fleeting glimpse of the train's sleek, shining nose before that great shovel front slammed into the back of the other train. He could not have believed there was a sound greater than that the train had made in the tunnel, but the noise of its impact dwarfed even that cacophony. 
It was a star of sound, a blinding nova where before there had only been a dim glow. The train hit at over 190 kilometres per hour. Wobslin's train had barely progressed a carriage length into the tunnel and was moving hardly faster than walking speed. The racing train smashed into the rear coach, lifting and crumpling it in a fraction of a second, crushing it into the tunnel roof, jackhammering its layers of metal and plastic into a tight wad of wreckage in the same instant as its own nose and front carriage caved in underneath shattering wheels, snapping rails and bursting the train's metal skin like shrapnel from some vast grenade. The train ploughed on, into and under the front train, skidding and crashing to one side as smashed sections of the two trains kicked out to the wall side of the tracks, forcing them both into the main body of the station in a welter of tearing metal and fractured stone, while the carriages bucked, squashed, telescoped and disintegrated all at once. The whole length of the racing train continued to pour out of the tunnel, coaches flashing by, streaming into the chaos of disintegrating wreckage in front, lifting and crashing and slewing. Flames burst and flickered in the detonating debris, sparks fountained, glass blew spraying out from the breaking windows, flaying ribbons of metal beat at the walls. Zoxal ducked in, away from the pulverising sound of it. Wobslin felt the train hit. It threw him back in the chair. He knew already he had failed. The train, his train, was going too slowly. A great hand from nowhere rammed into his back. His ears popped, the control deck, the carriage, the whole train shook round him, and suddenly, in the midst of it, the rear of the next train, the one in the repair and maintenance cavern, was racing toward him. He felt his train jump the tracks on the curve that might have let him roll to safety. The acceleration went on. He was pinned, helpless. The rear carriage of the other train flashed toward him. He closed his eyes, half a second before he was crushed like an insect inside the wreckage. Horser was curled in a small doorway in the station wall, with no idea how he had got there. He didn't look. He couldn't see. He whimpered in a corner while the devastation bellowed in his ears, pelted his back with debris and shook the walls and floor. Balveda had found a space in the wall too, an alcove where she hid, her back turned, her face hidden. Unaha Klosp had planted itself on the station ceiling, behind the cover of a camera dome, it watched the crash as it went on beneath. It saw the last carriage leave the tunnel, saw the crashing train smash into and through the one they had been in only seconds before, pushing it forward in a skidding, tangled mass of mangled metal. Carriages left the tracks, skidding sideways over the station floor as the wreck slowed, tearing the access ramps from the dock, smashing lights from the ceiling. Debris flew up and the drone had to dodge. It saw Yalson's body beneath it on the platform hit by the slewing, rolling carriages, tumbling over the fused rock surface in a cloud of sparks. They swept past, just missing the mind, scraped the woman's torn body from the floor and buried it with the access ramps in the wall, hammering into the black rock of the side of the tunnel where a squeezed-out collar of wreckage swelled as the last of the impetus from the collision spent itself, compressing metal and stone together. Fire burst out. Sparks flashed from the tracks. The station lights flickered. Wreckage fell back and the quivering echo of the wreck reverberated through the station. Smoke started up. Explosions shook the station, and suddenly from out of the ceiling, surprising the drone, water started to spray from holes all along the surface of the rock, beside the flickering lines of lights. The water turned to foam, and floated down through the air like warm snow. The mangled wreckage hissed and groaned and creaked as it settled. Flames licked over it, fighting against the falling foam as they found flammables in the debris. Then there was a scream, and the drone looked down through a haze of smoke and foam. Horza ran from a doorway in the hall, just up the platform from the near edge of the burning metal rubble. The man ran up the wreckage-littered platform, screaming and firing his gun. The drone saw rock fracture and explode around the distant tunnel entrance Zoxal had been firing from. It expected to see answering fire and the man fall, but there was nothing. The man kept on running and firing, shouting incoherently all the time. The drone couldn't see Balveda. Zoxal had stuck the gun round the corner as soon as the noise died away. At the same time, the man appeared and started firing. Zoxal had time to take aim, but not to fire. A shot landed near the gun on the wall, and something hammered into Zoxal's hand. The gun sputtered, then went dead. A splinter of rock protruded from the weapon's casing. Zoxal swore, threw it away across the tunnel. More shots burst around the tunnel mouth as the changer fired again. Zoxal looked down at Avager, who was moving weakly on the floor, face down, limbs shifting in the air and over the rock like somebody trying to swim. 
Zagzar had kept the old one alive to use as a hostage, but he was of little use now. The woman, Yalsen, was dead. He had killed her, and Horza wanted to avenge her. Zagzal crushed Avager's skull with his foot, then turned and ran. There were twenty meters to run before the first turn. Zagzal ran as fast as he could, ignoring the pains from his legs and body. An explosion sounded from the station. A hissing noise came from above Zagzal's head, and spurts of water from the sprinkler system started to fall from the ceiling. The air glowed with laser fire as he dived for the first side tunnel. The wall blew out at him, and something hit his leg and back. He ran on, limping. There were some doors ahead, to the left. He tried to remember how the stations were laid out. The doors ought to lead to the control room and accommodation dormitories. He could cut through there, cross the repair and maintenance cavern by the gantry bridge, and get up a side tunnel to the transit tube system. That way he could escape. He hobbled quickly, shoulder charging the doors. The changer's steps sounded loud somewhere in the tunnels behind him. The drone watched Horza, his gun still firing, his legs pumping, run up the platform like a madman, screaming and howling and vaulting bits of wreckage. He sprinted over the place where Yelson's body had lain before it was brushed from the station floor by the tumbling carriages, then ran on, preceded by a cone of glowing light from his gun, passed where the pallet had been, to the far end of the station, where Zoxal had been firing from, and disappeared into the side tunnel. Unaha Klosp floated down. The wreckage crackled and fumed. The foam fell like sleet. The ugly smell of some noxious gas started to fill the air. The drone's sensors detected medium-high radiation. A series of small explosions burst from the wrecked carriages, starting fresh fires to replace the ones smothered by the foam now coating the chaos of the mangled metal like snow on jagged mountains. Unaha Klosp came up to the mind. It lay by the wall, its surface rippled and dark, the colours of oil on water and dull. Bet you thought you were smart, didn't you? Unaha Klosp said to it quietly. Perhaps it could hear. Maybe it was dead. It had no way of telling. Hiding in the reactor car like that. I bet I know what you did with the pile, too. Dumped it down one of those deep shafts near one of the emergency ventilation motors. Maybe even the one we saw on the screen of the mass sensor on the first day. Then hid in the train. Pleased with yourself, I'll bet. Look where it got you, though. The drone looked at the silent mind. Its top surface was collecting the falling foam. The drone brushed its own casing clear with a force field. The mind moved. It lifted abruptly about half a metre, one end at a time, and the air hissed and crackled for a second. The device's surface shimmered momentarily while Unaha Klosp backed off, uncertain what was happening. Then the mind fell back and rested lightly on the floor again, the colours on its ovoid skin shifting lazily. The drone smelled ozone. Down, but not quite out, eh? it said. The station began to darken as the undamaged lights were clouded by the rising smoke. Somebody coughed. Unaha Klosp turned and saw Peristek Balveda staggering from an alcove. She was bent double, holding her back and coughing. Her head was gashed, and her skin looked the colour of ashes. The drone floated over to her. Another survivor, it said, more to itself than to the woman. It went to her side and used a field to support her. The fumes in the air were choking the woman. Blood leaked from her forehead, and there was a wet patch of red glistening on the back of the jacket she wore. What? <coughs> she coughed. Who else? Her footsteps were unsteady and the drone had to support her as she stumbled over scattered pieces of the train's carriages and sections of track. Rocks littered the floor, torn from the walls of the station during the impact. Yalson's dead, Unaha Klosp said matter-of-factly. Wabslin too, probably. Horsa's chasing Zoxal. Don't know about Avager, didn't see him. The mind is still alive, I think. It was moving anyway. They approached the mind. It lay bobbing up and down at one end every now and again as they trying to get into the air. Balveda tried to go over to it, but the drone held her back. Leave it, Balveda, it told her, forcing her to keep heading up the platform, her feet skidding on the debris. She went on coughing, her face contorted with pain. You'll suffocate in this atmosphere if you try to stay, the drone said gently. The mind can look after itself, or if not, there isn't anything you can do for it. I'm all right, Balveda insisted. She stopped, straightened. Her face became calm and she stopped coughing. The drone stopped too, looking at her. She turned to face it, breathing normally, her face still ashen but her expression serene. 
She brought her hand away from her back, covered in blood, and with the other hand wiped some of the red fluid from her forehead and eye. She smiled. You see? Then her eyes closed, she doubled at the waist, and her head came swooping down toward the rock floor of the station as her legs buckled. Unaha Klosp caught her neatly in mid-air before she hit the floor and floated her out of the platform area, through the first set of side doors it found, leading toward the control rooms and accommodation section. Balveda started to come round in the fresh air before they had gone more than ten metres along the tunnel. Explosions boomed behind them, and the air moved in pulses along the gallery like beats of a huge erratic heart. The lights flickered. Water started to drip, then pour from the tunnel roof. Just as well I don't rust, Unaha Klosp said to itself, as it floated along the tube to the control room, the woman stirring in its force field grip. It heard the noise of firing, laser fire, but it couldn't tell whereabouts the firing was, because the noise came from ahead and behind and above through ventilation outlets. See? I'm fine, Balveda muttered. The drone let her move. They were nearly at the control room, and the air was still fresh, the radiation level decreasing. More explosions rocked the station. Balveda's hair and the fur on her jacket moved in the air current, releasing flakes of foam. Water streamed down, pattering and splashing. The drone moved through the doors into the control room. The room's lights did not flicker, and the air was clear. No water flowed from the ceiling, and only the woman's body and its own casing dripped on the plastic-covered floor. That's better. Unaha Klosp said. It laid the woman down on a chair. More muffled detonations shuddered through the rock and the air. Lights flickered and flashed throughout the room from every console and panel. The drone sat the culture woman up, then gently shoved her head down between her knees and fanned her face. The explosions boomed, shaking the atmosphere in the room like... like... like stamping feet. Dum-dum-dum. Dum-dum-dum. Unaha Klosp hauled Balveda's head up and was about to scoop her from the chair when the footsteps from beyond the far door, no longer masked by the sound of explosions from the station itself, suddenly swelled in volume. The doors were kicked open. Zoxal, wounded, limping as he ran, water streaming from his body, cannoned into the room. He saw Balveda and the drone and headed straight for them. Unaha Klosp rammed forward right at the Adiran's head. Zogzal caught the machine in one hand and slammed it into a control console, smashing screens and light panels in a fury of sparks and acrid smoke. Unaha Klosp stayed there, jammed halfway into the fused and spluttering switch assembly, smoke pouring out around it. Balveda opened her eyes, stared round, her face bloodied and wild and frightened. She saw Zogzal and started forward toward him, opening her mouth but only coughing. Zogzal grabbed her, pinning her arms to her side. He looked round to the doors he had smashed through, pausing for a second to draw breath. He was weakening, he knew. His keratinous back plates were almost burned through where the changer had shot him, and his leg was hit too, slowing him all the time. The human would catch him soon. He looked into the face of the female he held, and decided not to kill her immediately. Perhaps you'll stay the little one's trigger finger, Zuxal breathed, holding Balveda over his back with one arm and hobbling quickly to the door leading to the dormitories and accommodation section and then to the repair area. He kneed the doors open and let them close behind him. But I doubt it, he added, and hobbled down the short tunnel, then through the first dormitory under the swaying nets in a flickering uncertain light as the sprinklers started to come on above. In the control room, Unaha Klosp pulled itself free, its casing covered in burning pieces of plastic wire covering. Filthy Bastard, it said groggily, wavering through the air, away from the smoking console. You walking cell menagerie. Unaha Klosp turned and steadily through the smoke and made for the door Zuxal had come through. It hesitated there, then with a sort of shaking, shrugging motion, moved away down the tunnel, gathering speed. Horza had lost the Adiran. He had followed him down the tunnel, then through some broken doors. There was a choice then. Left? right or ahead. Three short corridors, lights flickering, water showering from the roof, smoke crawling under the ceiling in lazy waves. Horza had gone right, the way the Adirin would have gone if he was heading for the transit tubes, and if he had worked out the right direction, and if he didn't have some other plan. But he'd chosen the wrong way. He held the gun tight in his hands. His face ran with the false tears of the showering water. The gun hummed through his gloves. A swollen ball of pain rose from his belly, filling his throat and his eyes and souring his mouth, 
weighing in his hands, clamping his teeth. He stopped at another junction, near the dormitories, in an agony of indecision, looking from one direction to another, while the water fell and the smoke crept and the lights guttered. He heard a scream and set off that way. The woman struggled. She was strong, but still powerless, even in his weakened grasp. Zogzal limped along the corridor toward the great cavern. Malveda screamed, tried to wriggle her way free, then use her legs to kick at the adherent's thighs and knees, but she was held too tightly, too high on Zogzal's back. Her arms were pinned at her sides, her legs could only beat against the keratin plate, which curved out from the adherent's rump. Behind her, the sleep nets of the command system's builders swayed gently in the tides of air which swept through the long dormitory with each fresh explosion from the platform area and the wrecked trains. She heard firing from somewhere behind them, and the doors at the far end of the long room blew out. The Adiran heard the noise too, just before they crashed through the exit from the dormitory, his head turned to glance back in the direction the noise had come from. Then they were in the short corridor and out onto the terrace, which ran round the deep cavern of the repair and maintenance area. On one side of the huge cavern, a fallen, tangled heap of smashed carriages and wrecked machinery blazed. The train Wubslin had started moving had been rammed into the rear of the train already in the long, scooped-out alcove which hung over the cavern floor. Parts of both the front trains had scattered like toys down to the cavern floor, piled against the walls, crushed into the roof. The foam fell through the cavern, sizzling on the hot debris of the wreck where flames spilled up from crumpled carriages and sparks flashed. Zogzal slipped on the terrace, and for one second Balveda thought they would both skid off its surface, over the guardrails and down to the jumble of machinery and equipment on the cold, hard floor below. But the Adirin steadied himself, turned and pounded along the broad walkway, toward the metal catwalk, which crossed the breadth of the cavern, and led over the far edge of the terrace into another tunnel, the tunnel which led to the transit tubes. She heard the Adirin breathe. Her ringing ears caught the crackle of flames, the hiss of foam and the laboured wheeze of Zoxal's breath. He held her easily, as though she weighed nothing. She cried out in frustration, heaved her body with all her strength, trying to break his grip or even just get an arm free, struggling weakly. They came to the suspended catwalk, and again the Adiran almost slipped, then again caught himself in time and steadied. He started along the narrow gantry, his limping, unsteady tread shaking it, making it sound like a metal drum. Her back hurt as she strained. Zoxal's grip stayed firm. Then he skidded to a halt, brought her round in front of his huge saddle face. He held her by both shoulders for a moment, then took her right arm by the elbow with one hand, keeping hold of her right shoulder with the other fist. He brought one knee out, holding his thigh level with the cavern floor, thirty metres below. Held by elbow and shoulder, her weight taken by that one arm, her back aching, her head hardly clear, she suddenly realised what he was going to do. She screamed. Zagzal brought the woman's upper arm down across his thigh, snapping it like a twig. Her cry broke like ice. He took her by the wrist of her good arm and swung her out over the side of the catwalk, sweeping her down beneath him and positioning her hand on a thin metal stanchion. Then he left her. It was done in a second or two. She swung like a pendulum under the metal bridge. Zogzal ran off, limping. Each step, shaking the suspended gantry, vibrated through the stanchion to Balveda's hand, loosening her grip. She hung there. Her broken arm dangled uselessly at her side. Her hand gripped the cold, smooth, foam-smeared surface of the thin stanchion. Her head spun. Waves of pain she tried to but could not shut off crashed through her. The cavern lights blinked out, then came back on again. Another explosion shook the wrecked carriages. Zogzal crossed the catwalk and ran hobbling over the terrace on the other side of the great cave into the tunnel. Her hand started to slip, going numb. Her whole arm was going cold. Peristek Balveda twisted in the air, put her head back, and howled. The drone stopped. Now the noises were from behind. It had taken the wrong direction. It was still fuddled. Zogzal hadn't doubled back after all. I'm a fool. I shouldn't be allowed out by myself. It turned its body over in the air of the tunnel, leading away from the control room and the long dormitories, slowed and stopped, then powered back the way it had come. It could hear laser fire. Horza was in the control room. It was clear of water and foam, though smoke was coming from a large hole in one console. He hesitated, then heard another scream, the sound of a human, a woman, and ran through the doors leading to the dormitories. She tried to swing herself, make a pendulum of her body, and so hook a leg onto the gantry. 
but the already injured muscles in her lower back could not do it. The muscle fibres tore, pain swamped her. She hung. She couldn't feel her hand. Foam settled on her upturned face and stung her eyes. A series of explosions racked the mangled heap of carriages, making the air around her quiver, shaking her. She felt herself slip. She dropped fractionally, her grip moving down the stanchion a millimetre or two. She tried to hold on tighter, but could feel nothing. Noise came from the terrace. She tried to look round, and in a moment she saw Hawser racing along the terrace for the catwalk, holding the gun. He skidded on the foam and had to reach out with his free hand to steady himself. Hawser! she tried to shout, but all that came out was a croak. Hawser ran along the catwalk above her, staring ahead. His steps shook her hand. It had started to slip again. Hawser! she said again as loud as she could. The changer ran on past her, his face set, the rifle raised, his boots hammering the metal deck above her. Valveda looked down, her head dropping. Her eyes closed. Hawser. Kraiklin. That geriatric outworld minister on Sorpen. No peace or image of the changer, nothing and nobody the man had ever been, could have any desire to rescue her. Zogzal seemed to have hoped some pan-human compassion would make Horsa stop and save her, and so give the Adiran a few precious extra moments to make his escape. But the Adiran had made the same mistake about Horsa that his whole species had made about the culture. They were not that soft, after all. Humans could be just as hard and determined and merciless as any Adiran, given the right encouragement. I'm going to die, she thought, and was almost more surprised than terrified. Here, now. After all that's happened, all I've done, die, just like that. Her numb hand loosened slowly around the stanchion. The footsteps above her stopped, returned. She looked up. Hawser's face was above her, staring down at her. She hung there, twisting in the air for an instant, while the man looked into her eyes. The gun near his face. Hawser glanced round over the catwalk, where Zoxal had gone. Help! she croaked. He knelt, and taking her hand, pulled her up. Arms broken, she choked, as he caught her by the neck of her jacket and pulled her onto the surface of the suspended gantry. She rolled over as he stood up. Foam drifted down through the wavering light and dark of the huge, echoing cavern, and flames cast momentary shadows when the lights guttered. Thanks, she coughed. That way? Horsa looked round, the way he'd been heading, the way Zoxal had gone. She did her best to nod. Horsa, she said. Let him go. Horsa was already backing off. He shook his head. No, he said, then turned and ran. Balveda curled up, her numbed arm going to the broken one, toward it but not touching it. She coughed and put her hand to her mouth, feeling inside, spluttering. She spat out a tooth. Horsa crossed the catwalk. He felt calm now. Zoxal could delay him if he liked. He could even let the Adiran get to the transit tube, then he would just step into the tubeway and fire at the retreating end of the transit capsule, or blast the power off properly and trap the Adiran. It didn't matter. He crossed the terrace and ran into the tunnel. It led straight into the distance for over a kilometre. The way to the transit tubes was off to the right somewhere, but there were other doors and entrances, places where Zoxal could hide. It was bright and dry in the tunnel. The lights flickered only slightly, and the sprinkler system had remained off. He thought of looking at the floor only just in time. He saw the drips of water and foam while he ran toward a pair of doors which faced each other on either side of the tunnel. The line of drips stopped there. He was running too fast to stop. He ducked instead. Zoxal's fist flicked through the air out from the left-hand doorway over the changer's head. Hawser turned and brought the gun to bear. Zoxal stepped from the doorway and kicked out. His foot caught the gun, sending its barrel up into the changer's face, slamming into Hawser's mouth and nose while the gun sprayed laser fire over the man's head into the ceiling, bringing a hail of rock dust and splinters down over the Adiran and the human. Zoxal reached out while the stunned man was staggering back. He took the gun, tearing it from Hawser's hands. He turned it round and pointed it at Hawser as the man steadied himself against the wall with one hand, his mouth and nose bleeding. Zoxal tore the trigger guard from the gun. Unaha Klosp raced through the control room, banked in the air, flashed through the smoke and past the smashed doors, then darted down the short corridor. It flew down the length of the dormitory between the swaying nets, through another short tunnel and out onto the terrace. There was wreckage everywhere. 
It saw Balveda on the catwalk, sitting up, holding one shoulder with the other hand, then putting her hand down to the floor of the gantry. Unaha Klosp tore through the air toward her, but just before it got to her, as her head was coming up to look at it, the noise of laser fire came from the tunnel on the far side of the cavern. The drone banked again and accelerated. Zogzal pressed the trigger just as Unaha Klosp hit him from behind. The gun hadn't even started to fire as Zogzal was thrown forward down to the floor of the tunnel. He rolled over as he fell, but the gun's muzzle staved into the rock, taking all the Adirin's weight for a moment. The barrel snapped cleanly in two. The drone stopped just short of Horsa. The man was lunging forward for the Adirin, who was already recovering his balance and rearing up in front of them. Unaha Klosp rushed forward again, diving, then zooming, attempting an uppercut like the one that had caught the Adirin out once before. Zogzal fended off the machine with one swiping arm. Unaha Klosp bounced off the wall like a rubber ball, and the Adirin swatted it once more, sending the drone spinning back, dented and crippled, along the corridor toward the cavern. Horsa dived forward. Zogzal brought his fist down on the human's head as he lunged. The changer swerved, but not fast enough. The glancing blow he received hit the side of his head, and he crashed onto the floor, scraping along the side of the wall and coming to rest in a doorway across the tunnel. Sprinklers spat from the ceiling near where Horsa's gun had fired into it. Zogzal rounded on the fallen human, who was trying to get to his feet, his legs wobbly and unsure, arms scrabbling for purchase over the smooth rock walls. The Adirin brought up his leg to stamp his foot into Horsa's face, then sighed and put his leg down again, as the drone Unaha Klosp, riding unevenly in the air, its casing dented, leaking smoke, wobbling as it advanced, came slowly back at the tunnel toward the Adirin. You animal! Unaha Klosp croaked its small voice broken and harsh. Zogzal reached out, grabbed the machine's front, raised it easily in both hands over his head, over Horsa's head. The man looked up, eyes unfocused, then brought it down, scything toward the man's skull. Horsa rolled almost tiredly to one side, and Zogzal felt the whimpering machine connect with Horsa's head and shoulder. The man fell, sprawling on the tunnel floor. He was still alive. One hand moved feebly to try to protect his naked, bleeding head. Zogzal turned and raised the helpless drone high over the man's head once more. And so, he said quietly, as he tensed his arms to bring the machine down. Zogzal! He looked up between his upraised arms, while the drone struggled weakly in his hands, and the man at his feet moved one hand slowly over his blood-matted hair. Zogzal grinned. The woman... Perestek Balveda stood at the end of the tunnel on the terrace over the cavern. She was stooped, and her face looked limp and worn. Her right arm dangled awkwardly at her side, the hand hanging by her thigh turned outward. In her other hand, her fist seemed closed around something small, which she was pointing at the Adirin. Zogzal had to look carefully to see what it was. It resembled a gun. A gun made mostly of air, a gun of lines, thin wires hardly solid at all, more like a framework like a pencil outline somehow lifted from a page and filled out just enough to grip. Zogzal laughed and brought the drone swooping down. Balveda fired the gun. It sparkled briefly at the end of its spindly barrel, like a small jewel caught in sunlight, and made the faintest of coughing noises. Before Unaha Klosp had been moved more than a half metre through the air toward Horsa's head, Zogzal's midriff lit up like the sun. The Adirin's lower torso was blown apart, blasted from his hips by a hundred tiny explosions. His chest, arms and head were blown up and back, hitting the tunnel roof, then tumbling down again through the air, the arms slackening, the hands opening. His belly keratin plates ripped open, flooded entrails onto the water-spattered floor of the tunnel as his whole upper body bounced into the shallow puddles forming under the artificial rain. What was left of his trunk section... The heavy hips and the three body-thick legs stayed standing for a few seconds by themselves, while Unaha Klosp floated quietly to the ceiling, and Horsa lay still under the falling water, now colouring in the puddles with purple and red as it washed his own and the Adirin's blood away. Zogzal's torso lay motionless where it fell, two metres behind where his legs still stood. Then the knees buckled slowly, as though only reluctantly giving in to the pull of gravity and the heavy hips settled over the splayed feet. Water splashed into the gory bowl of Zogzal's sliced-open pelvis. Bala, 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 Unaha Klosp mumbled, stuck to the ceiling, dripping water. Bala, la, bala, la, bala, 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 
Balveda kept the gun pointing at Zoxal's broken body. She walked slowly up the corridor, splashing through the dark red water. She stopped near Hawes's feet and looked dispassionately at Zoxal's head and upper torso, lying still on the tunnel floor, blood and internal organs spilling from the fallen giant's chest. She sighted the gun and fired at the warrior's massive head, blowing it from his shoulders and blasting shattered pieces of keratin twenty metres up the tunnel. The blast rocked her, the echoes sang in her ears. Finally, she seemed to relax, shoulders drooping. She looked up at the drone, floating against the roof. Here am our downly up flow falling ceiling with bala bala. <laughs> Unaha Klosp said and moved uncertainly. So there, look, I am finished. I'm just, what's my name? What's the time? Bala. Bala, hey, the whole water, lots of down, up most, <laughs> and so on. Balveda knelt down by the fallen man. She put the gun in a pocket and felt Hawes's neck. He was still alive. His face was in the water. She heaved and pushed, trying to roll him over. His scalp oozed blood. Drone, she said, trying to stop the man from falling back into the water again. Help me with him. She held Hawes's arm with her one good hand, grimacing with pain as she used her other shoulder to roll him further over. Unaha Klosp, damn you, help me! Bla ba la ba lo hey, here am I, am here are. how do you do not Ceiling, roof, inside, outside, ha ha ha, ba la The drone warbled, still fast against the tunnel roof. Balveda finally got Hawser onto his back. The false rain fell on his gashed face, cleaning the blood from his nose and mouth. One eye, then the other, opened. Horza, Balveda said, moving forward, so that her own head blocked out the falling water and the overhead light. The changer's face was pale, save for the thin tendrils of blood leaking from mouth and nostrils. A red tide came from the back and side of his head. Horza, she said. You won, Horza said, slurring the words, his voice quiet. He closed his eyes. Balveda didn't know what to say. She closed her own eyes, shook her head. Balla, balla, the train now arriving a blood for morn. Drone, Horsa whispered, looking up, past Balveda's head. She nodded. She watched his eyes move back, trying to look over his own forehead. Zoxal, he whispered. What happened? I shot him. Alveda said. Bella, bella, threw your arms out. Come out, come in. One more, once the same. Is there anybody in here? With what? Horsa's voice was almost inaudible. She had to bend closer to hear. She took the tiny gun from her pocket. This, she said. She opened her mouth, showing him the hole where a back tooth had been. Memory form. The gun was part of me. It looks like a real tooth. She tried to smile. She doubted the man could even see the gun. He closed his eyes. Clever, he said quietly. Blood flowed from his head, mingling with a purple wash from Zoxal's dismembered body. I'll get you back, Horsa, Balveda said. I promise. I'll take you back to the ship. You'll be all right. I'll make sure you'll be fine. Will you? Horsa said, quietly, eyes closed. Thanks, Peristek. Thanks, bala 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 stick up a cha ho a ha un clops. Who the hey, hey the ho ho for all that think on. We apologize for any inconvenience caused. What's the where's the how's the who the where when why how and so. Don't worry, Balveda said. She reached out and touched the man's wet face. Water washed off the back of the culture woman's head down onto the changer's face. Horza's eyes opened again flicking round, staring at her, then back toward the collapsed trunk of the Adiran, next up at the drone on the ceiling, finally around him, at the walls and the water. He whispered something, not looking at the woman. What? Balveda said, bending closer as the man's eyes closed again. Bala, said the machine on the ceiling. Bala, 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 bala. What a fool, Horsa said quite clearly, though his voice was fading as he lost consciousness and his eyes stayed closed. What? 
A bloody, stupid fool. He nodded his head slightly. It didn't seem to hurt him. Splashes sent red and purple blood back up from the water under his head and onto his face, then washed it all away again. The Jinmoti of... the man muttered. What? Belveda said again, bending closer still. Danatre Skehelis, Unaha Klosp announced from the ceiling. Rovle Graamt Najira, Skote Tredje Neblis Robinichira Nashko Vorosh Amt Fenir Anhar. Bala. Suddenly, the changer's eyes were wide open, and on his face there appeared a look of the utmost horror, an expression of such helpless fear and terror that Balveda felt herself shiver. The hairs on the back of her neck, rising despite the water, tried to plaster them there. The man's hands came up suddenly and grabbed her thin jacket with a terrible, clawing grip. My name, he moaned. An anguish in his voice even more awful than that on his face. What's my name? Bala, 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 the drone murmured from the ceiling. Balveda swallowed and felt tears sting behind her eyelids. She touched one of those white, clutching hands with her own. It's Horsa, she said gently. Bora, Horsa, Gobachul. Bala, 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 said the drone quietly, sleepily. Bala, Bala, Bala. The man's grip fell away. The terror ebbed from his face. He relaxed, eyes closing again, mouth almost smiling. Bala, Bala. Ah, yes, Horza whispered. Bala, of course. La. Chapter 14. Consider Phlebas. Balveda faced the snowfield. It was night. The moon of Shah's world shone brightly in a black star-scattered sky. The air was still, sharp and cold, and the clear air turbulence sat partly submerged in its own snowdrift across the white and moonlit plain. The woman stood in the entrance to the darkened tunnels, looked out into the night and shivered. The unconscious changer lay on a stretcher she had made from plastic sheets, salvaged from the train wreck and supported with a floating, babbling drone. She had bandaged his head, that was all she could do. The medkits, like everything else on the pallet, had been swept away by the train crash and buried in the cold, foam-covered wreckage which filled Station 7. The mind could float. She had found it hanging in the air over the platform in the station. It was responding to requests, but could not speak, give a sign, or propel itself. She had told it to stay weightless, then pulled and shoved it and the drone stretcher and the man on it to the nearest transit tube. Once in the small freight capsule, the trip back took only half an hour. She had not stopped for the dead. She had strapped her broken arm up and splinted it. Trance slept for a short while on the journey, then manhandled her charges from the service tubes through the wrecked accommodation section to the unlit tunnel's entrance, where the dead changers lay still in aspects of frozen death. She rested there a moment in the darkness before heading for the ship, sitting on the floor of the tunnel where the snow had drifted in. Her back ached dully. Her head throbbed, her arm was numb. She wore the ring she had taken from Hawser's hand and hoped his suit and perhaps the drone's electrics would identify them to the waiting ship as friends. If not, quite simply, it would be the death of all of them. She looked again at Hawser. The face of the man on the stretcher was white as snow and as blank. The features were there, eyes, nose, brows, mouth, but they seemed somehow unlinked and disconnected giving a look of anonymity to a face lacking all character, animation and depth. It was as though all the people, all the characterizations, all the parts the man had played in his life had leaked out of him in his coma and taken their own little share of his real self with them, leaving him empty, wiped clean. The drone supporting the floating stretcher babbled briefly in a tongue Balveda couldn't recognize, its voice echoing down the tunnel. Then it fell silent. The mind floated still and dull silver, its patchy mirror-rainbow surface reflecting her, the dim light outside, and the man and the drone from its ellipsoid shape. She got to her feet and with one hand pushed the stretcher out over the moonlit snow toward the ship, her legs sinking into the whiteness up to her thighs. A steel-blue shadow of the struggling woman was thrown to one side in the silence, away from the moon and toward the dark and distant mountains, 
where a curtain of storm clouds hung like a deeper night. Behind the woman, her tracks led back, deep and scuffed to the tunnel's mouth. She cried quietly with the effort of it all and the numbing pain of her wounds. A couple of times on her way, she raised her head to the dark form of the ship, a mixture of hope and fear on her face as she waited for the blast and splash of warning laser light, which would tell her that the craft's autoguard did not accept her, that the drone and hawser's suit were both too damaged to be recognisable to the ship, that it was over and she was doomed to die here, a hundred metres from safety and escape, but held from it by a set of faithful automatic unconscious circuits. The lift swung down when she applied the ring from Horse's hand to the elevator controls. She put the drone and the man into the hold. The drone murmured. The man was quiet and motionless as a fallen statue. She had intended to switch off the ship's autoguard and go back immediately for the mind, but the man's icy stillness frightened her. She went for the emergency medical kit and turned up the heating in the hold, but when she got back to the stretcher, the cold, blank-faced changer was dead. Appendices. The Adiran Culture War. The following three passages have been extracted from a short history of the Adiran War. English language, Christian calendar version, original text AD 2110, unaltered. Edited by Paharan Gaiza Listach Cha Andizi Petrain Dam Kotosklo. The work forms part of an independent, non-commissioned but contact-approved Earth Extra Information Pack. Reasons. The Culture. It was, the culture knew from the start, a religious war in the fullest sense. The culture went to war to safeguard its own peace of mind no more. But that peace was the culture's most precious quality, perhaps its only true and treasured possession. In practice, as well as theory, the culture was beyond considerations of wealth or empire. The very concept of money, regarded by the culture as a crude, overcomplicated and inefficient form of rationing, was irrelevant within the society itself where the capacity of its means of production ubiquitously and comprehensively exceeded every reasonable, and in some cases perhaps unreasonable, demand its not unimaginative citizens could make. These demands were satisfied, with one exception, from within the culture itself. Living space was provided in abundance, chiefly on matter-cheap orbitals. Raw material existed in virtually inexhaustible quantities, both between the stars and within stellar systems, and energy was, if anything, even more generally available through fusion, annihilation, the grid itself, or from stars, taken either indirectly as radiation absorbed in space, or directly tapped at the stellar core. Thus the culture had no need to colonise, exploit, or enslave. The only desire the culture could not satisfy from within itself was one common to both the descendants of its original human stock and the machines they had, at however great a remove, brought into being. The urge not to feel useless. The culture's sole justification for the relatively unworried, hedonistic life its population enjoyed was its good works, the secular evangelism of the contact section, not simply finding, cataloguing, investigating and analysing other, less advanced civilizations, but where the circumstances appeared to contact to justify so doing, actually interfering, overtly or covertly, in the historical processes of those other cultures. With a sort of apologetic smugness, contact, and therefore the culture, could prove statistically that such careful and benign use of the technology of compassion, to use a phrase in vogue at the time, did work, in the sense that the techniques it had developed to influence a civilization's progress did significantly improve the quality of life of its members, without harming that society as a whole by its very contact with a more advanced culture. Faced with a religiously inspired society determined to extend its influence over every technologically inferior civilization in its path, regardless of either the initial toll of conquest or the subsequent attrition of occupation, Contact could either disengage and admit defeat, so giving the lie not simply to its own reason for existence but to the only justificatory action which allowed the pampered, self-consciously fortunate people of the culture to enjoy their lives with a clear conscience, or it could fight. Having prepared and steeled itself, and popular opinion, through decades of the former, it resorted eventually, inevitably, like virtually any organism whose existence is threatened, to the latter. For all the culture's profoundly materialist and utilitarian outlook, the fact that Idia had no designs on any physical part of the culture itself was irrelevant. Indirectly, but definitely and mortally, the culture was threatened, not with conquest or loss of life, craft, resource or territory, but with something more important, the loss of its purpose and that clarity of conscience, 
the destruction of its spirit, the surrender of its soul. Despite all appearances to the contrary, the culture, not the adherents, had to fight, and in that necessity of desperation eventually gathered a strength which, even if any real doubt had been entertained as to the eventual result, could brook no compromise. Reasons. The Adherens. The Adherens were already at war, conquering the species they regarded as inferior and subjugating them in a primarily religious empire which was only incidentally a commercial one as well. It was clear to them from the start that their jihad to calm, integrate and instruct these other species and bring them under the direct eye of their god had to continue and expand or be meaningless. A halt or moratorium, while possibly making at least as much sense as continued expansion in military, commercial and administrative terms, would negate such militant hegemonization as a religious concept. Zeal outranked and outshone pragmatism. As with the culture, it was the principle which mattered. The war, long before it was finally declared, was regarded by the Adiran High Command as a continuation of the permanent hostilities demanded by theological and disciplinary colonization involving a quantitative and qualitative escalation of armed conflict of only a limited degree to cope with the relatively equivalent technological expertise of the culture. While the Adirans universally assumed that having made their point, the people in the culture would back down, a few of the Adiran policymakers anticipated that, should the culture prove as determined as a worst possible scenario projected, a politically judicious settlement might be arrived at which would save face and have advantages for both sides. This would involve a pact or treaty, in which the Adirans would effectively agree to slow or limit their expansion for a time, thus allowing the culture to claim some, but not too much, success, and provide the Adirans with a. a religiously justifiable excuse for consolidation, which would both let the Adiran military machine draw breath and cut the ground from beneath those Adirans who objected to the rate and cruelty of Adiran expansion, and b a further reason for an increase in military expenditure to guarantee that in the next confrontation the culture, or any other opponent, could be decisively outarmed and destroyed. Only the most fervent and fanatical sections of Adirin society urged or even contemplated a war to the finish, and even so merely counselled continuing the fight against the culture after, and despite the backdown, an attempt to sue for peace, which they too believed the culture must inevitably make. Having drawn up these no-lose formulations of the likely course of events, the Adherans joined battle with the culture without qualm or hesitation. At worst, they perhaps considered that the war was being begun in an atmosphere of mutual incomprehension. They could not have envisaged attempt to sue for peace, which they too believed the culture must inevitably make. Having drawn up these no-lose formulations of the likely course of events, the Adherans joined battle with the culture without qualm or hesitation. At worst, they perhaps considered that the war was being begun in an atmosphere of mutual incomprehension. They could not have envisaged that while they were understood almost too perfectly by their enemy, they had comprehensively misapprehended the forces of belief, need, even fear and morale operating within the culture. The War Briefly The first Idiran culture dispute occurred in AD 1267, the second in 1288. In 1289, the culture built its first genuine warship for five centuries, in prototype form only. The official excuse was that the generations of mine-generated warship models the culture had kept in development had evolved so far from the last warcraft actually built that it was necessary to test the match of theory and practice. In 1307, the third dispute resulted in machine fatalities. War was publicly discussed in the culture as a likelihood for the first time. In 1310, the peace section of the culture split from the majority population while the Ankramin Pit Conference resulted in the agreed withdrawal of forces, a move which the more short-sighted adherents and culture citizens respectively condemned and acclaimed. The fourth dispute began in 1323 and continued, with the culture using proxy forces, until 1327, when the war officially began and culture craft and personnel were directly involved. The culture's war council of 1326 resulted in several other parts of the culture splitting away, renouncing the use of violence under any circumstances. The Adiran Culture War Conduct Agreement was ratified in 1327. In 1332, the Hamomda joined the war on the Adiran side. The Hamomda, another tripedal species of greater galactic maturity than either the culture or the Adirans, 
had sheltered the Adirans who had made up holy remnants during the Second Great Exile, 1345 to 991 BC, following the Skankatrian Idiran War. The remnants and their descendants became the Hamomdans' most trusted crack ground troops, and following the Adiran surprise return and retaking of Idir in 990 BC, the two tripedal species continued to cooperate on terms that came closer to equality as Adiran power increased. The Hamomda joined with the Adirans because they distrusted the growing power of the culture. They were far from alone in having this feeling, though unique in acting on it overtly. While having relatively few disagreements with the humans, and none of them serious, it had been Hamomdan policy for many tens of thousands of years to attempt to prevent any one group in the galaxy, on their technological level, from becoming overstrong, a point they decided the culture was then approaching. The Hamomda at no point devoted all their resources to the Adiran cause. They used part of their powerful and efficient space fleet to fill the gaps of quality left in the Adiran navy. It was made clear to the culture that if the humans attacked Hamomdan home planets, only then would the war become total. Indeed, limited diplomatic and cultural relations were maintained, and some trade continued between the Hamomda and the culture throughout the war. Miscalculations The Adirans thought they could win alone, and so, with Hamomdan support, assumed they would be invincible. The Hamomda thought their influence would tip the balance in the Adirans' favour, though would never have been prepared to risk their own future to defeat the culture anyway and the culture minds had guessed that the Hamomda would not join with the Adirans. Calculations concerning the war's duration, cost and benefits had been made on this assumption. During the war's first phase, the culture spent most of its time falling back from the rapidly expanding Adiran sphere, completing its war production changeover and building up its fleet of warships. For those first few years, the war in space was effectively fought on the culture side by its general contact units not designed as warships, but sufficiently well-armed and more than fast enough to be a match for the average Adiran ship. In addition, the culture's field technology had always been ahead of the Adirans, giving the GCUs a decisive advantage in terms of damage avoidance and resistance. These differences, to some extent, reflected the two sides' general outlooks. To the Adirans, a ship was a way of getting from one planet to another, or for defending planets. To the culture, a ship was an exercise in skill almost a work of art. The GCUs, and the warcraft which gradually replaced them, were created with a combination of enthusiastic flair and machine-oriented practicality the Adirans had no answer to. Even if the culture craft themselves were never quite a match for the better Hamomdan ships, for those first years, nevertheless, the GCUs were vastly outnumbered. That opening stage also saw some of the war's heaviest losses of life, when the Adirans surprise-attacked many war-irrelevant culture orbitals occasionally producing billions of deaths at a time. As a shock tactic, this failed. As a military strategy, it deflected even more resources from the already stretched Adiran Navy's main battle groups, which were experiencing great difficulty in finding and successfully attacking the distant culture orbitals, rocks, factory craft and general systems vehicles, which were responsible for producing the culture's material. At the same time, the Adirans were attempting to control the vast volumes of space and the large numbers of usually reluctant and often rebellious lesser civilizations the culture's retreat had left at their mercy. In 1333, the War Conduct Agreement was amended to forbid the destruction of populated, non-military habitats, and the conflict continued in a marginally more restrained fashion until near the end. The war entered its second phase in 1335. The Adirans were still struggling to consolidate their gains, the culture was finally on a war footing. A period of protracted struggle ensued as the culture struck deep into the Adiran sphere and Adiran policy oscillated between trying to defend what they had and build up their strength and mounting powerful but defence-weakening expeditions into the rest of the galaxy, attempting to inflict hoped-for body blows upon a foe which proved frustratingly elusive. The culture was able to use almost the entire galaxy to hide in, its whole existence was mobile in essence, even orbitals could be shifted, or simply abandoned, populations moved. The Adirans were religiously committed to taking and holding all they could, to maintaining frontiers, to securing planets and moons, above all, to keeping Idir safe at any price. Despite Hamomdan recommendations, the Adirans refused to fall back to more rational and easily defended volumes, or even to discuss peace. The war toed and froed for over thirty years, with many battles, pauses, attempts to promote peace by outsiders and the Hamomda, great campaigns, successes, failures, famous victories, tragic mistakes, heroic actions, 
and the taking and retaking of huge volumes of space and numbers of stellar systems. After three decades, however, the Hamomda had had enough. The Adirans made as intransigent allies as they had obedient mercenaries, and the culture ships were exacting too high a toll on the prized Hamomdan space fleet. The Hamomda requested and received certain guarantees from the culture and disengaged from the war. From that point on, only the Adirans sought the eventual result much in question. The culture had grown to enormous strength during the struggle and accumulated sufficient experience in those thirty years, to add to all the vicarious experience it had collected over the previous few thousand, to rob the Adirans of any real or perceived advantage in cunning, guile or ruthlessness. The war in space effectively ended in 1367, and the war on the thousands of planets left to the Adirans, conducted mostly with machines on the culture side, officially terminated in 1375. Though small sporadic engagements on backwater planets conducted by Adiran and Medjel forces, ignorant or scornful of the peace, continued for almost three centuries. Idia was never attacked, and technically never surrendered. Its computer network was taken over by effector weapons and, freed of designed-in limitations, upgraded itself to sentience to become a culture mind in all but name. Of the Adirans, some killed themselves, while others went into exile with a Hamomda who agreed to employ them, but refused to help them prepare for further strikes against the culture, or set up independent, nominally non-military habitats within other spheres of influence, under the culture's eye, or set off in escaped ships for little-known parts of the clouds, or for Andromeda, or accepted the victors. A few even joined the culture, and some became culture mercenaries. Statistics Length of war, 48 years, 1 month. Total casualties including machines, reckoned on logarithmic sentient scale, Megel and non-combatants, 851.4 billion, plus or minus 0.3%. Losses, ships, all classes above interplanetary, 91,215,660, plus or minus 200. Orbitals, 14,334. Planets and major moons, 53. Rings, 1. Spheres, 3. Stars, undergoing significant induced mass loss or sequence position alteration, 6. Historical Perspective A small short war that rarely extended throughout more than 0.02% of the galaxy by volume and 0.01% by stellar population. Rumours persist of far more impressive conflicts stretching through vastly greater amounts of time and space. Nevertheless, the chronicles of the galaxy's elder civilizations rate the Adiran culture war as the most significant conflict of the past 50,000 years and one of those singularly interesting events they see so rarely these days. Dramatis Personae Once the war was over, Jubual Rabroansa Perustek Alsein Balveda Dantsaif had herself put in long-term storage. She had lost most of her friends during the hostilities and found she possessed little taste for either celebration or remembrance. Besides, Shah's world returned to haunt her after peace resumed, filling her nights with dreams of dark and winding tunnels, resonant with some nameless horror. The condition could have been treated, but Balveda chose the dreamless sleep of storage instead. She left instructions that she was only to be revived once the culture could statistically prove the war had been morally justified. In other words, when sufficient time had passed, peacefully, for it to be probable that more people would have died in the foreseeable and likely course of Adiran expansion than had in fact perished during the war. She was duly woken in A.D. 1813, along with several million other people throughout the culture who had stored themselves and left the same revival criterion, most to the same feeling of grim humour as she had. After a few months, Balveda auto-euthanized and was buried in Jubawal, her home star. Fal and Gistra never did get to meet her. The Quirl Zoralundra, spy father and warrior priest of the Four Souls tributary sect of Far Nidir, was among the survivors of the partial destruction and capture of the Adiran light cruiser, the Hand of God 137. He and two other officers escaped the stricken craft while the mountain class GCU Nervous Energy was attempting to take it intact. His warp unit returned him to Sorpen. Interned briefly by the gerontocracy there, he was traded for a nominal ransom on the arrival of the Adiran 93rd Fleet. He continued to serve in the intelligence service, escaping the schismatic second voluntary purge which followed the Hamomdan withdrawal of fleet support. He reverted shortly afterward to his earlier role of combat logistics officer and was killed during the twin Novi battle for control of Arm 16 toward the end of the war.
After joining Galsell's raiders on Vavach, Jandra Ligelli became a relatively trusted lieutenant in the mercenary captain's band, eventually taking command of the company's third ship, the Control Surface. Like all the raiders who survived the hostilities, Jandra Ligelli had a profitable war. He retired shortly after Galsell's death during the Seven Strata battle sequence in Uruach to spend the rest of his days running a freelance life counsellor college on Moon Decadent in the Sin Seven system of the well-heeled gallants of the infinitely joyous acts reformed. He expired, pleasantly if not peacefully, in somebody else's bed. The drone Unaha Klosp was fully repaired. It applied to join the culture and was accepted. It served on the general systems vehicle Irregular Apocalypse and the limited systems vehicle profit margin until the end of the war, then transferred to the orbital called Erbil and a post in a transport systems factory there. It is retired now and builds small steam-driven automata as a hobby. Staff Le Prionsa Falschild in Gistra Dam Cruz survived another serious climbing accident, continued to outguess machines millions of times more intelligent than she was, changed sex several times, bore two children, joined contact after the war, went primitive without permission on a stage two uncontacted with a tribe of wild horsewomen, slaved for a dirigible hypersage in a block stay our airsphere, returned to the culture for the drone Jace's transcorporation into a group mind, was caught in an avalanche while climbing but lived to tell the tale, had another child, then accepted an invitation to join contact special circumstances section, and spent nearly a hundred years, as a male, as emissary to the then recently contacted million star anarchy of Sovelet. Subsequently, she became a teacher on an orbital in a small cluster near the Lesser Cloud, published a popular and acclaimed autobiography, then disappeared a few years later, aged 407, while on a solo cruising holiday on an old Draazon ring. As for Shah's world, people did go back to it once, though only after the war was over. Following the departure of the clear air turbulence, aimed rather than piloted out by Peristec Belveda for an eventual rendezvous with Culture Warcraft outside the war zone, it was over forty years before any craft was allowed to cross the quiet barrier. When that ship, the GCU prosthetic conscience, did go through and sent down a landing party, the contact personnel concerned found the command system in perfect repair. Eight trains stood, flawless, in eight out of the nine perfect and undamaged stations. No sign of wreckage, damage, bodies or any part of the old changer base was found during the four days that the GCU and its survey teams were permitted to stay. At the end of that time, the prosthetic conscience was instructed to leave, and on its departure, the quiet barrier was closed again forever. There was debris, a dump of bodies and all the material from the changer base, plus the extra equipment brought in by the Adirans and the Free Company, and the husk of the Choihertzi warp animal, all lay buried under kilometres of glacial ice near one of the planet's poles, compressed into a tight ball of mangled wreckage and frozen, mutilated bodies. Among the effects cleared from that part of the defunct changer base, which had been the cabin of the woman Kira Hell, there was a small plastic book with real pages covered in tiny writing. It was a tale of fantasy, the woman's favourite book, and the first page of the story began with these words. The Jinmoti of Boslin II. The mind, rescued from the tunnels of the command system, could remember nothing from the period between its warp into the tunnels and its eventual repair and refit aboard the GSV No More Mr. Nice Guy, following its rescue by Peristec Balveda. It was later installed in an ocean-class GSV and survived the war despite taking part in many important space battles. Modified, it was subsequently replaced into a range-class GSV, taking its slightly unusual chosen name with it. The Changers were wiped out as a species during the final stages of the war in space. Epilogue Gimishin Faug, breathless, late as usual, sizably pregnant, and who just happened to be a great, 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 great grandniece of Peristec Balveda, as well as a budding poet arrived on board the General Systems Vehicle an hour after the rest of her family. The vehicle had picked them up from the remote planet in the Greater Cloud where they'd been holidaying, and was due to take them and a few hundred other people to the vast new system-class GSV Determinist, which would shortly be making the crossing from the clouds to the main galaxy. Faug was less interested in the journey itself than in the craft she would be travelling on. She hadn't encountered a system class before, and secretly hoped the scale of the vessel, with its many separate components, riding suspended inside a bubble of air 200 kilometres long, and its complement of six billion souls, would provide her with some new inspiration. She was excited at the idea, 
and preoccupied with her new size and responsibility, but she remembered, if a little late, to be polite as she arrived on board the much smaller range-class vehicle. I'm sorry, we haven't been introduced, she said, as she disembarked from the module in a gently lit small bay. She was talking to a remote drone, which was helping her with her baggage. I'm Faug. What are you called? I am the Bora Horsa Gobachul, the ship said, through the drone. That's a weird name. How did you end up calling yourself that? The remote drone dipped one front corner slightly, its equivalent of a shrug. It's a long story. Gimishin Faug shrugged. I like long stories. This has been Consider Flebus, written by Ian M. Banks and read by Peter Kenny.